Hello and welcome to Let's Read The House of the Dead by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This is an audio presentation of the book with occasional clarifying commentary from me, the reader. Now, if you want to jump straight to the action, check out the video description below and you'll see how to navigate directly to the text itself. Otherwise, stick around, and I'll explain the nature of this project a bit further while providing some background material on the book. The basic purpose of this Let's Read is to make the literature as accessible as it can be in an audio format. Typically, when you read classical literature in print, you have a number of advantages at your disposal. An introduction from a literary scholar, notes containing background information that might be lost on a modern audience, time to absorb complications in the plot or the cast of characters, and so on. In a conventional audiobook, by contrast, you get simply the spoken text rolling on. But not here. With this project, I will read through the entirety of the book with you, but I will retain the license to add comments where I think it may be helpful to a general audience. In just a moment, I will be providing some introductory background information on the work. When completed, this Let's Read will also contain some concluding thoughts on the book, but it will also have some notes sprinkled throughout the reading simply to clarify points that the average listener could easily miss. I will do my best to keep a light hand and to allow the text to stand on its own. But there will be cases where it will be useful to sum up events or to identify references, and so you will be hearing my comments every so often just to make sure you don't get lost. I will reserve my own analysis and reactions to the text for the final section of this project. When I do have embedded comments in the text, they will virtually always appear at the end of a chapter, in order to avoid breaking up the flow of the narrative. Sometimes, when the text has some detail that invites comment, I will indicate the fact that I have a note on that feature with the following sound. You can pursue that comment at the end of the chapter, or not, as you like. There will be other occasions where I will provide clarifying comments visually on the screen. For instance, where a particular expression in either Russian or French requires a translation, or where one character is quoting the words of another in a way that is difficult to parse in audio format. In these cases, I will keep the text flowing, but clarification will be available to you if needed. Now, this project comes in two formats. In one format, it is packaged as a playlist with 25 separate videos. In the other, it is presented as a pair of very lengthy videos, the one you are currently viewing with my introduction in part one of the book, and the second with part two, a brief additional story, and then my concluding comments. However you would like to consume the product, the video description below will help you to navigate to your desired destination. Assuming you want to keep it here, the next item on the agenda is a brief introduction to the work itself. First off, The House of the Dead is in the public domain. The version we will be reading has been translated by Constance Garnett which differs from the one LibriVox recording of which I am aware and sticks closer to the original. With some searching, you can find this translation online, but it also appears in a Barnes & Noble Classics volume, along with Poor Folk, Dostoevsky's first novel, and a much later short story entitled The Peasant Mary. This project will not cover Poor Folk, However, because of its direct thematic relevance to the House of the Dead, I will present The Peasant Mary toward the end of this Let's Read. In this version, The House of the Dead is about 300 pages long, while The Peasant Mary is a very brief six pages. 
I do commend the Barnes & Noble edition to you, as it comes with a very lucid introduction from Joseph Frank. That introduction is not in the public domain, and so I can't share it with you. However, many of my own comments in this project are indebted to his work, both in this volume and elsewhere. The title of the book is our author's label for the prison camp in Siberia, where he was held for four years as a political prisoner. And the House of the Dead is an account of his experiences there. Arguably, it may be regarded as one of Dostoevsky's great works. Certainly, a list of his great works must include two full-length novels, The Brothers Karamazov and Crime and Punishment, as well as his novella Notes from Underground. These books are frequently cited even by colleagues of my own discipline. If we extend our list a bit further, we would have to include his novels The Idiot and the Possessed. But if we are extending the list this far, space probably also should be made for The House of the Dead. Indeed, some, including Leo Tolstoy, have suggested that this work is the best thing that Dostoevsky ever wrote. Nevertheless, it is also a very unusual work, and hard to classify. Dostoevsky never wrote anything quite like it in any other time in his career. It is not a novel. The people it describes are real people, not imagined, and it contains no sustained plot to speak of. We can more accurately describe it as the author's autobiographical memoirs, but even that is not quite right. Dostoevsky fictionalizes the identity of the narrator and also rearranges events to produce a more coherent and impactful presentation of the world he is describing. The result is a semi-autobiographical tapestry of vignettes and character sketches, compiled by a remarkably observant and insightful chronicler, keen on opening up the world of the mid-19th century Siberian prison camp to the public eye. Further, he exposes features of human nature to the public eye, and human nature is very much on trial in these pages. As a work of Russian semi-autobiography, the House of the Dead is perhaps anticipated by Turgenev's A Sportsman sketches and Tolstoy's Sevastopol stories, both of which had appeared shortly earlier. But The House of the Dead is sometimes thought to be the first in a long history of Russian prison literature, which perhaps reaches its zenith in Solzhenitsyn's Soviet-era three-volume classic, The Gulag Archipelago. In the context of Dostoevsky's own career, however, the significance of The House of the Dead is that it serves as a sort of milestone that signifies the kind of author he would become. The youthful Dostoevsky of the 1840s was a clever man with surprising psychological intuition. But he also suffered from a touch of naivete, and he could never have written the great literary works I enumerated a moment ago. But by the 1860s and 70s, he was doing exactly that. What happened during those critical years in Siberia to increase the range and depth of his vision to such an extent? The House of the Dead goes a long way toward providing an answer. Part of its great success in reviving Dostoevsky's literary reputation lay in its immaculate timing. The first few chapters were published serially from late 1860 through early 1861 in an obscure journal called The Russian Word. When Dostoevsky's own journal, Time, got off the ground, it ran the entirety of The House of the Dead from 1861 through 1862. Meanwhile, the liberation of the serfs occurred in the February of 1861, and with it came a wave of liberal political energy. 
Dostoevsky, a political prisoner at the hands of an oppressive czar, had returned to Petersburg after a decade of suffering in imprisonment and then exile, with an aura of martyrdom surrounding him. His message of what he had experienced, and of the peasant convicts who suffered with him, found a very sympathetic audience, and it quickly vaulted him to an exalted status among the Russian intelligentsia. In 1861 he was also publishing The Insulted and Injured, which was read with enthusiasm by the Russian public, if not the literary critics. But The House of the Dead earned him a lasting fame in all literate circles. Here is one anecdote concerning its popularity. In early 1862, with political unrest fomenting over the fate of the newly liberated peasant class, the Tsarist government instituted new regulations on universities, which sparked student protest, which in turn led to student arrests. The indignant intelligentsia organized several events in response, and Dostoevsky was frequently asked to read from his works at them. During one fateful evening, he opened events with a carefully chosen chapter from The House of the Dead, working up a crowd of three thousand in the process. By the end of the evening there was a near riot, although it eventually calmed down. Dostoevsky wasn't the only player in the proceedings that night, but he was a significant one. Today, removed as we are from the political circumstances of its composition, we are more interested in this book for the timeless lessons it gives us about human nature. But this in turn is best understood when we consider the effect prison had on the ideas of the author, how it moved him from one perspective to another. To get the full picture, then, we need to know who Dostoevsky was before going to Siberia, why he was arrested in the first place, and what his character and ideas had been like before encountering the dead house. Dostoevsky was arrested in 1849 because of his participation in the Petrushevsky Circle, a group of progressive-minded intellectuals who would meet at the home of one Petrushevsky and discuss the affairs of the day. To all appearances, they would look like a harmless debate group, capable of a great deal of talk and no action. Underneath the surface, there was more going on. A secret inner circle within the larger group was planning on stirring up a peasant revolt. Dostoevsky was a member of that conspiracy. It is hard to imagine that the effort would have had any success, even if left unimpeded, yet it never had the opportunity. The secret police had infiltrated the Petrushevsky circle in 1848 due to the Tsar's increased anxiety about revolutions all over Europe, and they pulled the plug on the group with a round of arrests in April of the following year. Before its demise, the circle had represented a variety of perspectives, but virtually all of the figures attending would subscribe to some form of socialism. Petrushevsky himself had attempted to form a commune on his estate in the mold of Charles Fourier, although the peasants, the presumed beneficiaries of the arrangement, burned it to the ground within twenty-four hours. As is typical with socialists, Petrushevsky was undeterred by recalcitrant empirical evidence. For his own part, Dostoevsky might have passively identified as a socialist, but he did not express much enthusiasm for political affairs per se, and he strongly disliked the militant atheism that was frequently on display. His presence in the circle was largely due to his hatred of the institution of serfdom and to his concern over the plight of the poor. It was his hatred of serfdom that motivated his participation in the revolutionary conspiracy, and it was his concern for the poor and downtrodden that emerges as a defining theme of his earliest published writings. 
Certainly, that is the overwhelming impression of his debut novel, Poor Folk, and it continues in short stories such as An Honest Thief, or A Faint Heart, or A Christmas Tree in a Wedding, and perhaps also in the first few chapters of Natochka Nezvanova. In these early writings, he turns a sympathetic eye toward the poorer classes of Petersburg society, often low-level bureaucrats struggling to make ends meet, and he attempts to get into their minds and portray their motivations in a way that commends them to the sentiments of the Russian literati. His intuition is often penetrating. Nevertheless, on an honest appraisal, some of these works suggest that the author had limited experience with the kinds of characters he is describing. One notable example is An Honest Thief, in which a destitute drunkard robs a friend to fund his alcoholism, is tortured by the pangs of conscience, and ultimately confesses to his theft moments before his death. This is a pleasant little romanticizing of the desperately poor, but is it an accurate portrayal of what thieves or drunkards are like? An assumption that runs through many of these early works is that the poor are forever the victims of forces external to themselves. The social pressures on the lower classes are intolerable. The terrified clerks and government bureaucracies do what they can to make ends meet or to ease their pain occasionally resorting to drink, such as Devushkin in Poor Folk, or to hoarding, such as Mr. Proharchin from an early story, or to blackmail, such as Polzunkov from another. A rearranging of society, we are invited to infer, may be the best way of preventing these lapses of character. But is that the whole picture of the origins of human vice? For that matter, the revolutionary Dostoevsky was apparently willing to assume that the peasant class would actually respond to the call to revolt from upper-class leadership and would submit themselves to their direction. Was that a reasonable assumption? Dostoevsky was about to get clarity on these and other issues in the dead house in Siberia. He would later say that the experience led to, quote, the regeneration of my convictions, unquote. He would never lose his concern for the plight of the poor or his interest in the social pressures that they face. But he would later see things in a much clearer light, revising some of his ideas and embracing them with an even stronger fervor. But before he could get to Siberia, he would already encounter a life-altering moment. After his arrest, he spent about a year in the Peter and Paul Fortress in Petersburg and was submitted to several rounds of interrogation. He appears to have acquitted himself admirably under duress, and as far as we know, the authorities never did find out about the inner revolutionary conspiracy of which he was a part. Yet in December of 1849, Moments after being suddenly transported to Semenovsky Square, he discovered his apparent sentence. Execution by firing squad. The sentence was a sham, and an elaborate show was made of a breathless messenger arriving from the Tsar with a commuted sentence a moment before the first of the Petrushevtsi, tied to stakes on the scaffold, were to be shot. Nevertheless, for that moment, Dostoevsky stared into the abyss of death. If we wonder about the occasionally apocalyptic flavor of his mature works, this episode may offer a partial explanation of its origin. The Tsar's actual sentence was to years of imprisonment in Siberia. The members of the Petrushevsky circle would be mostly dispersed and sent to different camps, Naturally, the journey from Petersburg to Siberia is a long one. Before he could reach his prison camp, he stopped in Tobolsk, the capital of western Siberia, and a sort of way station for these prison convoys. 
our author will occasionally refer to his time there in the pages ahead. While in Tobolsk, he received consolation from three widows of political prisoners of an earlier age, receiving from them a New Testament with ten rubles in the binding, as well as a warning about the sadistic major who ran the prison to which he was assigned. From Tobolsk, Dostoevsky set off for Omsk, the location of his prison camp. With him was only one companion from Petersburg, a poet named Sergei Durov, who is obliquely mentioned in the text, although never by name. They arrived several days later, and the House of the Dead tells us what he experienced while there. There is one last detail about the youthful Dostoevsky that deserves to be mentioned. The Dostoevsky of the 1840s was an extremely sensitive, thin-skinned man. That sensitivity was part of what made him good at his work. He could understand the sentiments of others. But it also made him a nervous wreck, with an excessive vanity and a strong self-conscious desire for acceptance. Further, his involvement with the conspiracy presented an intolerable strain on his nerves. He would confess later that, had he not been arrested, he would have gone mad. Also, it appears that his psychological frailty had some physiological effects, although our sources from the period are a bit murky. A friend of his, one Dr. Yanovsky, reports that he attended to the author's fainting fits during this time, which may have followed hallucinations. By the time he returned from Siberia, we know that he was suffering from severe epileptic fits. In general, his was a particularly delicate constitution to be subjected to the hardships, both moral and physical, of the prison camp. And those hardships were in fact greater than may be gleaned from a reading of the House of the Dead. That is because Dostoevsky had to deal with the threat of censorship. In order to save face for the authorities, and thus to get past the censor, he had to pull his punches, papering over the conditions he had to face during those years. The irony is that the censor still complained about the work, but for the opposite reason. He worried that the conditions looked too attractive to the reader, so that some of the desperately poor would be tempted to commit crimes in order to go to Siberia. To get a sense of the reality of what Dostoevsky faced, rather than the more sanitized version deemed fit for public consumption, it is worth looking at an excerpt from a letter he wrote to his brother immediately after his release, where he describes prison life with more candor. Here is what he says. Quote, Things were very bad for us. A military prison is much worse than a civilian one. I spent the whole four years in the prison behind walls and never went out except to work. The work they found for us was heavy, not always, of course, and I was sometimes completely exhausted in foul weather, in damp and rain and sleet, and in the unendurable cold of winter. Once I spent four hours on urgent work when the mercury froze and there was perhaps about forty degrees of frost. My foot became frostbitten. We lived on top of each other, all together in one barrack. Imagine an old, dilapidated, wooden construction, which was supposed to have been pulled down long ago, and which was no longer fit for use. In summer, intolerable closeness. In winter, unendurable cold. All the floors were rotten. Filth on the floors, an inch thick, one could slip and fall. The little windows were so covered with frost that it was almost impossible to read at any time of the day. An inch of ice on the panes, drips from the ceiling, draughts everywhere. We were packed like herrings in a barrel. 
The stove took six logs at once, but there was no warmth. The ice in the room barely thawed. Only unendurable fumes. And this all winter long. There in the barracks the convicts washed their clothes, and the whole space was splashed with water. There was no room to turn around. From dusk to dawn it was impossible not to behave like pigs, for, after all, we're live human beings. We slept on bare boards and were allowed only a pillow. We spread our sheepskin coats over us, and our feet were always uncovered all night. We shivered all night. Fleas, lice, and black beetles by the bushel. In winter we wore short sheepskin coats, often of the most wretched quality, which hardly gave any warmth, and on our feet half-boots. Just try to walk around with them in the freezing cold. I often lay ill in the hospital. Disordered nerves have given me epilepsy, but the fits occur only rarely. I have rheumatism in the legs besides. Apart from this, I feel fairly well. And to all these amenities, the almost complete impossibility of possessing a book, and if you get one, you read it on the sly, the eternal hostility and quarreling around one, the wrangling, shouting, uproar, din, always under escort, never alone, and all this for four years without change. Really, one must be pardoned for saying that things were bad. Besides all this, the eternal threat of punishment hanging over one, shackles, the total stifling of the soul, there you have an image of my existence. Unquote. The public account contained in The House of the Dead is consistent with the passage in this letter, but it omits many of these alarming details, and so the effect is not quite as stark. This muting of the details for the purpose of passing censorship will come up frequently in the book, as I will occasionally note in my comments. The threat of censorship may also have been a cause for one of the fictitious narrative devices that Dostoevsky employs in the book. The work is mostly autobiographical, and it was certainly read that way by his audience. But Dostoevsky never officially appears in the book. Instead, his figure is obscured by the presence of two different narrators. The first is a nameless inhabitant of a Siberian town, who, in the introduction to Part One, finds himself in the possession of a collection of notes from one Alexander Petrovich Goryanchikov, an ex-convict who, after his release from prison, remained in Siberia until his recent death. This nameless narrator then assumes the role of editor of these notes, and promptly drops out of the picture almost entirely, except for a brief cameo at the beginning of Part 2, Chapter 7. The rest of the book is ostensibly from the perspective of this Goryanchikov. The nameless editor informs us that Goryanchikov had been a landowner who was imprisoned for ten years on the charge of murdering his wife in a jealous rage. How seriously we should take this fictional figure is a point of some debate. Some scholars will interpret the book in a way that gives Goryanchikov a great deal of significance. But most will dismiss Goryanchikov as a mere facade, perfunctorily propped up in order to keep the censor at bay. Certainly that is the way Dostoevsky's immediate readers in the 1860s understood him, and the book itself encourages this reading, as our principal narrator will frequently refer to himself as a political prisoner, not the land-owning murderer described in the introduction. For all intents and purposes, Goryanchikov's voice is really the voice of Dostoevsky himself. There is one other way in which Dostoevsky fictionalizes his account. He rearranges the sequence of events in order to fit his narrative purposes. 
His narrator, Goryanchikov, was in the prison camp for ten years. But he himself was only imprisoned for four. For his remaining time in Siberia, he was forced to serve in the military. Dostoevsky arrived at the camp in January of 1850. In his presentation of events, however, his narrator arrives a month or so before Christmas, and he describes Christmas theatricals as taking place at that time, when in fact he did not observe them until much later. This sort of thing is a rule and not the exception. He will repackage his experiences in order to open up the prison world to his reader in a coherent and vivid way. To the best of my knowledge, everything he describes really did occur, although not in the order he presents. The book divides into two parts. In part one, after our frame narrator's introduction, we walk through Goryanchikov's first encounter with the prison, up through the first couple of months, ending with the Christmas holiday, although Dostoevsky will sometimes jump around chronologically as he pursues various ideas. Part two is arranged topically, as we zoom through the remainder of Goryanchikov's sentence, and finishes with his release from the prison. The character who enters the prison in the first chapter of Part I is a rather different person in the last chapter of Part II, and much of the movement of the book involves how that transformation takes place. More light is shed on that transformation in The Peasant Mary, the short story appended at the end of this Let's Read. Finally, we should say a bit about the other characters populating these pages. The list of figures in this book is incredibly vast. Much of the narrative involves brief character descriptions, and many of them appear only once. Providing a complete cast of characters here would thus be hopelessly inefficient and would spoil much of what Dostoevsky has to say. However, several figures appear more than once, and with a list of characters this large, it may be hard to remember who they are when they are referred to a second or a third time. So I have included a selected dramatis personae for your reference. These are not all the characters who appear in the text, and not always the most important. Some omissions from this list may be more significant than some who are on it. But these characters pop up more than once, and so this list may be of some use to you going forward. Of course, as noted earlier, we have our two narrators, the unnamed frame narrator and the prisoner Goryanchikov, who is speaking with Dostoevsky's voice. The officer in charge of the prison is an unnamed major, although he is nicknamed Eight Eyes by the convicts. His orderly is named Fedka. There are three Russian upper-class convicts who get some attention throughout. The most significant is Akim Akimich, who will play a role as Goryanchikov's companion. There is an unnamed gentleman who was accused of killing his father, and there is a character known only as A, who serves as a spy for the major and for whom Goryanchikov holds a strong revulsion. M, B, T, and Z are also gentlemen convicts, but they are Polish, not Russian. All are political prisoners. M plays the biggest role among them. Most of the other characters of note are lower-class convicts. We hear early on of one Petrov, who at one point came close to attacking the Major when he was unjustly punished. He pops up relatively frequently and has a fair amount of contact with Goryanchikov. Another frequently appearing convict is Baklushin, sometimes called the Pioneer, 
due to his past participation in a certain military unit. His most distinctive physical feature is a wart on his cheek. He, too, appears somewhat frequently in the text, and, like many figures in the text, he has a striking backstory. Isai Fomich Bumstein is a Jewish convict who swiftly sets up shop as the prison pawnbroker. Gazin is the name of the biggest vodka smuggler in the camp, who becomes especially dangerous when drunk. Sushilov, by contrast, is a remarkably servile character who attaches himself to Goryanchikov and is our narrator's example of a natural-born beggar. Fairly early, we learn of a convict who became sick by drinking vodka laced with snuff. This man's name is Ustyantsev, and we hear a bit more about his story later on. Late in the book, we become familiar with one Kulikov, an older, former veterinarian who develops a sort of rivalry for position as best animal doctor among the prison population. He plays a role in a little adventure down the stretch. There are also a number of minor figures who pop up more than once. There is a stocky man named Skuratov, who frequently takes on the role of buffoon. Osip is the name of a very large but very meek cook, who can't help but stay involved in the role of vodka smuggler. There is an elderly man, sometimes referred to as Grandfather, who has a religious affiliation as an old believer, and who is trusted to keep money for other convicts. Sirotkin is a name of a gentle young convict who later pops up in the prison theatricals. At the end of Part 1, Chapter 2, we encounter a jocular, muscular, middle-aged man who begs some extra food off his companions. This man's name is Varlamov, and we see more of him during the Christmas activities. And there are more, although I think they may be safely passed over on this selective list. I may choose to list off convicts again at another stopping point, matching the criminals to their purported crimes. But to do so now would spoil things, and it is high time to let Dostoevsky take center stage. So, sit back and enjoy The House of the Dead. The House of the Dead by Fyodor Dostoevsky Part 1 Introduction In the remote parts of Siberia, in the midst of steppes, mountains, or impassable forests, there are scattered here and there wretched little wooden towns of one or at the most two thousand inhabitants, with two churches, one in the town and one in the cemetery, more like fair-sized villages in the neighborhood of Moscow than towns. They are usually well provided with police officers, superintendents, and minor officials of all sorts. A post in Siberia is usually a snug berth in spite of the cold. The inhabitants are simple folk and not of liberal views. Everything goes on according to the old-fashioned, solid, time-honored traditions— the officials, who may fairly be said to be the aristocracy of Siberia, are either born and bred in Siberia, or men who have come from Russia, usually from Petersburg or Moscow, attracted by the extra pay, the double traveling expenses, and alluring hopes for the future. Those of them who are clever at solving the problem of existence almost always remain in Siberia and eagerly take root there. Later on, they bring forth sweet and abundant fruit. But others of more levity and no capacity for solving the problems of existence soon weary of Siberia and wonder regretfully why they came. They wait with impatience for the end of their three years' term of office, and instantly, on the expiration of it, 
petitioned to be transferred and return home, abusing Siberia and sneering at it. They are wrong, not only from the official standpoint, but from many others one may find a blissful existence in Siberia. The climate is excellent. There are many extremely wealthy and hospitable merchants, many exceedingly well-to-do natives. Young ladies bloom like roses and are moral to the last extreme. The wild game birds fly about the streets and positively thrust themselves upon the sportsmen. The amount of champagne consumed is supernatural. The caviar is marvelous. In some parts the crops often yield fifteenfold. In fact, it is a blessed land. One need only know how to reap the benefits of it. In Siberia, people do know. In one of these lively, self-satisfied little towns with most charming inhabitants, the memory of whom is imprinted forever on my heart, I met Alexander Petrovich Goryanchikov, a man who had been a gentleman and landowner born in Russia, had afterwards become a convict in the second division for the murder of his wife, and on the expiration of his ten years' sentence was spending the rest of his life humbly and quietly as a settler in the town. Although he was officially described as an inhabitant of a neighboring village, he did actually live in the town, as he was able to earn some sort of a living there by giving lessons to children. In Siberian towns, one often meets teachers who have been convicts. They are not looked down upon. They are principally employed in teaching French, of which, in the remote parts of Siberia, the inhabitants could have no notion but for them, though the language is so indispensable for success in life. The first time I met Alexander Petrovich was in the house of Ivan Ivanich Gvozdikov, an old-fashioned and hospitable official who had gained honors in the service and had five very promising daughters of various ages. Alexander Petrovich gave them lessons four times a week for thirty kopecks a lesson. His appearance interested me. He was an exceedingly pale, thin man, small and frail-looking, who could hardly be called old, about five and thirty. He was always very neatly dressed in European style. If one talked to him, he looked at one very fixedly and intently, listened with strict courtesy to every word one uttered, as though reflecting upon it, as though one had asked him a riddle or were trying to worm out a secret, and in the end answered clearly and briefly, but so weighing every word that it made one feel ill at ease and one was relieved at last when the conversation dropped. I questioned Ivan Ivanich about him at the time, and learnt that Goryanchikov was a man of irreproachably moral life, and that otherwise Ivan Ivanich would not have engaged him for his daughters, but that he was dreadfully unsociable and avoided everyone, that he was extremely learned, read a great deal, but spoke very little, and in fact it was rather difficult to talk to him. That some people declared that he was positively mad, though they considered that this was not a failing of much importance. That many of the most respected persons in the town were ready to be kind to Alexander Petrovich in all sorts of ways. That he might be of use, indeed, writing petitions and so forth. It was supposed that he must have decent relations in Russia, possibly people of good position, but it was known that from the time of his conviction he has resolutely cut off all communication with them. In fact, he was his own enemy. Moreover, everyone in the town knew his story, knew that he had killed his wife in the first year of his marriage, had killed her from jealousy, had surrendered himself to justice, which had done much to mitigate his sentence. Such crimes are always looked upon as misfortunes and pitied accordingly. But in spite of all this, the queer fellow persisted in holding himself aloof from everyone, and only came among people to give his lessons. I paid no particular attention to him at first, but 
I can't tell why, he gradually began to interest me. There was something enigmatic about him. It was utterly impossible to talk freely with him. He always answered my questions, of course, and with an air, indeed, of considering it a sacred obligation to do so. But after his answers I somehow felt it awkward to ask him anything more, and there was a look of suffering and exhaustion on his face afterwards. I remember one fine summer evening as I was walking home with him from Ivan Ivanitch's. It occurred to me suddenly to invite him in for a minute to smoke a cigarette. I can't describe the look of horror that came into his face. He was utterly disconcerted, began muttering incoherent words, and suddenly, looking angrily at me, rushed away in the opposite direction. I was positively astounded. From that time he looked at me with a sort of alarm whenever we met. But I did not give in. Something attracted me to him, and a month later, for no particular reason, I went to Goryantikov's myself. No doubt I acted stupidly and tactlessly. He lodged in the very outskirts of the town in the house of an old woman of the working class, who had a daughter in consumption, and this daughter had an illegitimate child, a pretty, merry little girl of ten. Alexander Petrovitch was sitting beside this child, teaching her to read at the moment I went in. Seeing me, he was as confused as though he had been caught in a crime. He was utterly disconcerted, jumped up from his chair, and gazed open-eyed at me. At last we sat down. He watched every look in my face intently, as though he suspected in each one of them some peculiar, mysterious significance. I guessed that he was suspicious to the point of insanity. He looked at me with hatred, almost as though asking me, "'How soon are you going?' I began talking about our town and the news of the day. It appeared that he did not know the most ordinary news of the town known to everyone, and what is more, did not care to. Then I began talking of the country and its needs. He heard me in silence and looked me in the face so strangely that at last I felt ashamed of what I was saying. I almost succeeded in tempting him, however, with new books and reviews. They had just come by post. They were in my hands, and I offered to lend them, uncut. He glanced eagerly at them, but at once changed his mind and declined my offer, alleging that he had no time for reading. At last I took leave of him, and as I went out I felt as though an insufferable weight were taken off my heart. I felt ashamed, and it seemed horribly stupid to pester a man who made it his great aim to shrink as far as possible out of sight of everyone. But the thing was done. I remember that I noticed scarcely a single book in his room, and so it was not true that he read a great deal, as people said. Yet, passing by his windows once or twice, very late at night, I noticed a light in them. What was he doing, sitting up till daybreak? Could he have been writing? And if so, what? Owing to circumstances, I left the town for three months. Returning home in the winter, I learnt that Alexander Petrovitch had died in the autumn, in solitude, without even sending for the doctor. He was already almost forgotten in the town. His lodgings were empty. I immediately made the acquaintance of his landlady, intending to find out from her what had occupied her lodger, and whether he had written anything. For twenty kopecks she brought me quite a hamper of manuscript left by her late lodger. The old woman confessed that she had already torn up two exercise books. She was a grim and taciturn old woman from whom it was difficult to extract anything much. She could tell me nothing very new of her lodger. According to her, he scarcely ever did anything, and for months together did not open a book or take up a pen. But he would walk up and down the room all night, brooding, 
and would sometimes talk to himself, that he was very fond of her little grandchild, Katya, and was very kind to her, especially since he had heard that her name was Katya, and that on St. Catherine's Day he always had a requiem service sung for someone. He could not endure visitors. He never went out except to give his lessons. He looked askance even at an old woman like her when she went in once a week to tidy up his room a bit, and scarcely ever said a word to her all those three years. I asked Katya whether she remembered her teacher. She looked at me without speaking, turned to the wall, and began to cry. So this man was able to make someone at least love him. I carried off his papers and spent a whole day looking through them. Three-fourths of these papers were trifling, insignificant scraps, or exercises written by his pupils. But among them was one rather thick volume of finely written manuscript unfinished, perhaps thrown aside and forgotten by the writer. It was a disconnected description of the ten years spent by Alexander Petrovitch in penal servitude. In parts this account broke off and was interspersed by passages from another story, some strange and terrible reminiscences jotted down irregularly, spasmatically, as though by some overpowering impulse. I read these fragments over several times, and was almost convinced that they were written in a state of insanity. But his reminiscences of penal servitude, scenes from the House of the Dead, as he calls them himself somewhere in his manuscript, seemed to me not devoid of interest. I was carried away by this absolutely new, till then unknown, world, by the strangeness of some facts, and by some special observations on these lost creatures, and I read some of it with curiosity. I may, of course, be mistaken. To begin with, I am picking out two or three chapters as an experiment. The public may judge of them. Breaking in. As noted in my introductory comments, this somewhat sarcastic frame narrator is now going to drop out of the picture almost entirely, with the exception of a brief note at the beginning of a much later chapter. The rest of the book will be from the perspective of this Goryanchikov, who will be speaking with Dostoevsky's own voice. As I also noted in my earlier comments, there is debate about how seriously to take this fictional Goryanchikov, although most critics do not take him very seriously at all. In the future I will note one or two passages where the details of Goryanchikov's backstory may be relevant to one's interpretation of the work. You may be surprised by our narrator's announcement that he is picking out two or three chapters of Goryanchikov's notes as an experiment. What follows this introduction is a sequence of twenty-one chapters, collected into two parts. I suspect this announcement really refers to the first few chapters of the work initially published in the journal The Russian Word as an experiment, before the whole book was published in Dostoevsky's own journal, Time. End of comments. Chapter 1 The House of the Dead Our prison stood at the edge of the fortress grounds, close to the fortress wall. One would sometimes, through a chink in the fence, take a peep into God's world to try and see something, but one could see only a strip of the sky and the high earthen wall overgrown with coarse weeds, and on the wall sentries pacing up and down day and night. And then one would think that there are long years before one, and that one will go on coming to peep through the chink in the same way, and will see the same wall, the same sentries in the same little strip of sky. Not the sky that stood over the prison, but a free, far-away sky. 
Imagine a large courtyard, 200 paces long and 150 wide, in the form of an irregular hexagon, all shut in by a paling, that is, a fence of high posts stuck deeply into the earth, touching one another, strengthened by crossway planks and pointed at the top. This was the outer fence of the prison. On one side of the fence there is a strong gate, always closed, always, day and night, guarded by sentries. It is opened on occasion to let us out to work. Outside that gate is the world of light and freedom, where men live like the rest of mankind. But those living on this side of the fence picture that world as some unattainable fairyland. Here there is a world apart, unlike everything else, with laws of its own, its own dress, its own manners and customs. And here is the house of the living dead, life as nowhere else and a people apart. It is this corner apart that I am going to describe. When you come into this enclosure, you see several buildings within it. On both sides of the large inner court run two long log houses of one story. These are the prison barracks. Here the convicts live, distributed in divisions. Then at the further end of the enclosure, another similar log house. This is the kitchen, divided in two for the use of two messes. Beyond it, another building, where are the cellars, the storehouses, and stables, all under one roof. The middle of the courtyard is empty and forms a fairly large level square. Here the convicts fall in. Here they are mustered, and their names are called over in the morning, at midday, and in the evening, and on occasion several times a day as well, if the sentries are suspicious and not very clever at counting. A fairly wide space is left all round between the buildings and the fence. Here, behind the buildings, prisoners of an unsociable and gloomy disposition like to walk in their spare time, to think their own thoughts, hidden from all eyes. Meeting them as they walked there, I used to like looking into their grim, branded faces and guessing what they were thinking about. There was a prisoner whose favorite occupation in his spare time was counting the posts in the fence. There were fifteen hundred of them, and he had counted and noted them all. Every post stood for a day with him. He marked off one post every day, and in that way could see at a glance from the number of posts uncounted how many days he had left in prison before his term was out. He was genuinely glad every time one side of the hexagon was finished. He had many years yet to wait, but one had time in prison to learn patience. I once saw a convict who had been twenty years in prison and was being released take leave of his fellow prisoners. There were men who remembered his first coming into the prison when he was young, careless, heedless of his crime and his punishment. He went out a grey-headed elderly man with a sad, sullen face. He walked in silence through our six barrack rooms. As he entered each room he prayed to the icons, and then bowing low to his fellow prisoners he asked them not to remember evil against him. I remember too how a prisoner who had been a well-to-do peasant in Siberia was one evening summoned to the gate. Six months before he had heard that his former wife had married again, and he was terribly downcast about it. Now she herself had come to the prison, asked for him, and given him alms. They talked for a couple of minutes, both shed tears and parted forever. I saw his face when he returned to the barracks. Yes, in that place one might learn to be patient. When it got dark, we used all to be taken to the barracks and to be locked up for the night. I always felt depressed at coming into our barrack room from outside. It was a long, low-pitched, stuffy room, dimly lighted by tallow candles, full of a heavy, stifling smell. I don't understand now how I lived through ten years in it. 
I had three planks on the wooden platform. That was all I had to myself. On this wooden platform, thirty men slept side by side in our room alone. In the winter we were locked up early. It was fully four hours before everyone was asleep. And before that? Noise, uproar, laughter, swearing, the clank of chains, smoke and grime, shaven heads, branded faces, ragged clothes, everything defiled and degraded. What cannot man live through? Man is a creature that can get accustomed to anything, and I think that is the best definition of him. There were two hundred and fifty of us in the prison, and the numbers scarcely varied. Some came, others completed their sentence and went away, others died. And there were some of all sorts. I imagine every province, every region of Russia had some representative there. There were some aliens, and there were some prisoners even from the mountains of Caucasus. They were all divided according to the degree of their criminality, and consequently according to the number of years they had to serve. I believe there was no sort of crime that had not sent some prisoner there. The bulk of the prison population were exiled convicts, or silno katorzhny of the civilian division. The silna katorzhny, or heavily punished convicts, as the prisoners naively mispronounced it. These were criminals entirely deprived of all rights and property, fragments cut off from society, with branded faces to bear witness forever that they were outcasts. They were sentenced to hard labor for terms varying from eight to twelve years, and afterwards they were sent to live as settlers in some Siberian village. There were prisoners of the military division, too, who were not deprived of rights, as is usual in Russian disciplinary battalions. They were sentenced for brief terms. At the expiration of their sentence they were sent back once they had come to serve in the Siberian line regiments. Many of them returned almost at once to the prison for some second serious offense, this time not for a short term but for twenty years. This division was called the Lifers. But even these lifers were not deprived of all rights. Finally, there was one more fairly numerous special division of the most terrible criminals, principally soldiers. It was called the Special Section. Criminals were sent to it from all parts of Russia. They considered themselves in for life and did not know the length of their sentence. According to law, they had to perform double or treble tasks. They were kept in the prison until some works involving very severe hard labor were opened in Siberia. You are in for a term, but we go onwards into servitude, they used to say to other prisoners. I have heard that this class has since been abolished. The civilian division, too, has been removed from our prison also, and a single disciplinary battalion of convicts has been formed. Of course, the officials in control of the prison were all changed at the same time. So I am describing the past, things long bygone. It was long ago. It all seems like a dream to me now. I remember how I entered the prison. It was in the evening in January. It was already dark. The men were returning from their work, and they were getting ready for the roll call. A non-commissioned officer with mustaches at last opened for me the door of this strange house in which I was to spend so many years, and to endure sensations of which I could never have formed the faintest idea if I had not experienced them. I could never have imagined, for instance, how terrible and agonizing it would be never once for a single minute to be alone for the ten years of my imprisonment. At work to be always with a guard, at home with two hundred fellow prisoners, not once, not once alone. Yet this was not the worst I had to get used to. There were here men who were murderers by mischance, and men who were murderers by trade, brigands and brigand chiefs. 
There were simple thieves and tramps who were pickpockets or burglars. There were people about whom it was difficult to guess why they had come. Yet each had his own story, confused and oppressive as the heaviness that follows a day's drinking. As a rule, they spoke little of their past. They did not like talking about it and evidently tried not to think of bygone days. I knew some among them, even murderers, so gay, so heedless of everything, that one might bet with certainty that their consciences never reproached them. But there were gloomy faces, too, men who were almost always silent. As a rule, it was rare for anyone to talk of his life, and curiosity was not the fashion. It was somehow not the custom and not correct. Only on rare occasions, from want of something better to do, some prisoner would grow talkative, and another would listen coldly and gloomily. No one could astonish anyone here. "'We are men who can read,' they would often say with strange satisfaction. I remember how a robber began once when he was drunk. It was sometimes possible to get drunk in prison. Telling how he had murdered a boy of five. How he had enticed him at first with a toy, led him away to an empty shed, and there had murdered him. The whole roomful of men, who had till then been laughing at his jokes, cried out like one man, and the brigand was forced to be silent. It was not from indignation they cried out, but simply because there is no need to talk about that. Because talking about that is not the correct thing. I may mention in parenthesis that they were men who could read, and not in the slang, but in the literal sense. Probably more than half of them actually could read and write. In what other place in which Russian peasants are gathered together in numbers can you find 250 men, half of whom can read and write? I have heard since that someone deduces from such facts that education is detrimental to the people. That is a mistake. There are quite other causes at work here though it must be admitted that education develops self-reliance in the people. But this is far from being a defect. The divisions were distinguished from one another by their dress. Some had half their jackets brown and half gray, and the same with their trousers, one leg dark brown and one gray. One day, when we were at work, a girl who was selling rolls looked at me intently for some time, and then suddenly burst out laughing. "'Ugh, how horrid!' she cried. "'They had not enough grey cloth, and they had not enough black!' There were others whose jackets were all grey, and only the sleeves were blackish-brown. Our heads were shaved in different ways, too. Some had half the head shaved lengthwise, and others transversely. At the first glance, one could discover one conspicuous trait common to all this strange family. Even the most prominent and original personalities, who unconsciously dominated the others, tried to adopt the common tone of the prison. Speaking generally, I may say that, with the exception of a few indefatigably cheerful fellows, who were consequently regarded with contempt by everyone, they were all sullen envious, dreadfully vain, boastful people, prone to take offense and great sticklers for good form. Not to be surprised at anything was regarded as the greatest merit. They were all mad on keeping up to their standard of good form. But often the most aggressive conceit was followed in a flash by the most cringing feebleness. There were some genuinely strong characters, they were simple and unaffected. But strange to say, even among these really strong people, there were some who were vain to the most exaggerated degree, to a morbid point. As a rule, vanity and regard for appearances were most conspicuous. The majority of them were corrupt and horribly depraved. Slander and backbiting went on incessantly. It was hell, outer darkness. 
but no one dared to rebel against the self-imposed rules and the accepted customs of the prison. All submitted to them. There were exceptional characters who found it hard and difficult to submit, but still they did submit. Some who came to the prison were men who had lost their heads, had become too reckless when at liberty, so that at last they committed their crimes as it were irresponsibly, as it were without an object, as it were in delirium, in intoxication, often from vanity excited to the highest pitch. But they were quickly suppressed, though some had been the terror of whole villages and towns before they came to prison. Looking about him, the newcomer soon realized that he had come to the wrong place, that there was no one he could impress here, and he gradually submitted and fell in with the general tone. This general tone was apparent externally in a certain peculiar personal dignity of which almost every inmate of the prison was acutely conscious. It was as though the status of a convict, of a condemned prisoner, was a sort of rank and an honorable one too. There was no sign of shame or repentance. Yet there was an external, as it were official, resignation, a sort of philosophic calm. We are a lost lot, they used to say. Since we didn't know how to get on in freedom, now we must walk the green street and count the rinks. Since we disobeyed our fathers and mothers, now we must obey the drum tap. We wouldn't embroider with gold, so now we break stones on the road. Such things were often said by way of moral reflections and proverbial sayings, but never seriously. They were all words. I doubt whether one of the convicts ever inwardly admitted his lawlessness. If anyone, not a prisoner, were to try reproaching the criminal for his crime, upbraiding him, though it is not the Russian way to reproach a criminal, an endless stream of oaths would follow. And what masters of abuse they were! They swore elaborately, artistically. Abuse was carried to a science with them. They tried to score not so much by insulting words as by insulting meaning, spirit, ideas, and that is subtler and more malignant. This science was developed to a higher point by their incessant quarrels. All these people were kept at work by force, Consequently, they were idle. Consequently, they were demoralized. If they had not been depraved beforehand, they became so in prison. They had all been brought together here apart from their own will. They were all strangers to one another. The devil must have worn out three pairs of shoes before he brought us all here, they used to say of themselves. And so backbiting, intrigues, womanish slander, envy, quarreling, hatred were always conspicuous in this hellish life. No old woman could be such old woman as some of these cutthroats. I repeat, there were strong characters even among them, men who had been accustomed all their lives to go ahead and to dominate, hardy and fearless. These men were instinctively respected, Yet though they, for their part, were often very jealous over their prestige, as a rule they tried not to oppress the others, did not pick quarrels over trifles, behaved with exceptional dignity, were reasonable and almost always obeyed the authorities, not from any principle of obedience nor from a sense of duty, but as though it were a sort of contract with the authorities for the mutual advantage of both. On the other hand, they were treated with consideration. I remember how one of these convicts, a fearless and determined man, well known to the authorities for his brutal propensities, was once summoned to be punished for some offense. It was a summer day and not in working hours. The officer who was immediately responsible for the management of the prison came himself to the guardhouse, which was close to our gate, to be present at the punishment. This major was, so to speak, a fateful being for the prisoners. He had reduced them to trembling before him. He was insanely severe, flew at people, as the convicts said. 
What they feared most in him was his penetrating lynx-like eyes, from which nothing could be concealed. He seemed to see without looking. As soon as he came into the prison, he knew what was being done at the furthest end of it. The prisoners used to call him Eight Eyes. His system was a mistaken one. By his ferocious, spiteful actions, he only exasperated people who were already exasperated. And if he had not been under the governor of the prison, a generous and sensible man who sometimes moderated his savage outbursts, his rule might have led to great trouble. I can't understand how it was he did not come to a bad end. He retired and is alive and well, though he was brought to trial for his misdeeds. The convict turned pale when his name was called. As a rule, he lay down to be flogged resolutely and without a word, endured his punishment in silence, and got up again quite lively, looking calmly and philosophically at the mishap that had befallen him. He was always, however, handled with caution. But this time he thought himself for some reason in the right. He turned pale and managed, unseen by the guard, to slip into his sleeve a sharp English knife. Knives and all sharp instruments were sternly forbidden in prison. Searches were made frequently and unexpectedly, and they were no joking matter, for the penalties were severe. But as it is difficult to find what a thief particularly means to hide, and as knives and instruments were always indispensable in the prison, in spite of searches they were always there. And if they were taken away, new ones were immediately obtained. All the convicts rushed to the fence and looked through the crevices with beating hearts. They all knew that this time Petrov did not mean to lie down to be flogged, and that it would be the end of the major. But at the critical moment our major got into his droshki and drove away, leaving the execution of the punishment to another officer. God himself delivered him, the convict said afterwards. As for Petrov, he bore his punishment quite calmly. His wrath passed off with the departure of the major. The convict is obedient and submissive up to a certain point, but there is a limit which must not be overstepped. By the way, nothing can be more curious than these strange outbreaks of impatience and revolt. Often a man is patient for several years, is resigned, endures most cruel punishment, and suddenly breaks out over some little thing, some trifle, a mere nothing. From a certain point of view he might be called mad, and people do call him so, in fact. I have said already that in the course of several years I never saw one sign of repentance among these people, not a trace of despondent brooding over their crime, and that the majority of them inwardly consider themselves absolutely in the right. This is a fact. No doubt vanity, bad example, brag, false shame are responsible for a great deal of this. On the other side, who can say that he has sounded the depths of these lost hearts, and has read what is hidden from all the world in them? Yet surely it would have been possible during all those years to have noticed, to have detected something, to have caught some glimpse which would have borne witness to some inner anguish and suffering in those hearts. But it was not there. It certainly was not there. No, it seems crime cannot be interpreted from preconceived conventional points of view, and the philosophy of it is a little more difficult than is supposed. Of course, prisons and penal servitude do not reform the criminal. They only punish him and protect society from further attacks on its security. In the criminal, prison and the severest hard labor only develop hatred, lust for forbidden pleasures, and a fearful levity. But I am firmly convinced that the lauded system of solitary confinement attains only false, deceptive, external results. It drains the man's vital sap, enervates his soul, cows and enfeebles it, 
and then holds up the morally withered mummy, half imbecile, as a model of penitence and reformation. Of course, the criminal who revolts against society hates it, and almost always considers himself in the right and society in the wrong. Moreover, he has already endured punishment at its hands, and for that reason almost considers himself purged and quits with society. There are points of view, in fact, from which one is almost brought to justify the criminal. But in spite of all possible points of view, everyone will admit that there are crimes which always and everywhere from the beginning of the world, under all legal systems, have unhesitatingly been considered crimes, and will be considered so as long as man remains human. Only in prison have I heard stories of the most terrible, the most unnatural actions, of the most monstrous murders, told with the most spontaneous, childishly merry laughter. I am particularly unable to forget one parricide. He was of the upper class and in the service, and had been something like a prodigal son. He was thoroughly dissipated in his behavior, and made debts everywhere. His father, an old man of sixty, tried to influence and restrain him. But the father had a house, a small estate, and, it was suspected, money. And the son killed the father through greed for his inheritance. The crime was only discovered a month later. The murderer himself gave information to the police that his father had disappeared, he knew not where. He spent all that month in the most profligate way. At last, in his absence, the police found the body. There was running right across the yard a ditch covered with planks for carrying off refuse water. The body was lying in this ditch. It was dressed and tidy. The gray head, which had been cut off, had been put on the body, and under the head the murderer laid a pillow. He did not confess, was deprived of his rank and rights, and sent to penal servitude for twenty years. All the time I spent with him he was in the liveliest, merriest spirits. He was an unaccountable, feather-brained fellow, irresponsible in the highest degree, though by no means stupid. I never noticed any special cruelty in him. The convicts despised him not on account of his crime, which was never mentioned, but for his foolishness, for his not knowing how to behave. In conversation he sometimes referred to his father. Once, talking to me about the healthy constitution hereditary in their family, he added, My parent, for instance, never complained of any illness right up to the end. Such savage insensibility seems impossible. It is phenomenal. It is not a case of simple crime, but of some constitutional defect, some mental and bodily monstrosity not yet understood by science. Of course I did not believe this criminal story. But people who came from the same town and must have known every detail of his history told me about the whole case. The facts were so clear that it was impossible not to believe in them. The convicts heard him cry out one night in his sleep, Hold him! Hold him! Chop off his head! His head! His head! Almost all the convicts raved and talked in their sleep. Oaths, thieves slang, Knives, axes, were what came most frequently to their tongues in their sleep. We are a beaten lot, they used to say. Our guts have been knocked out. That's why we shout at night. Forced and penal labor was not an occupation, but a compulsory task. The convict completed his task, or worked the allotted hours, and returned to the prison. The work was looked upon with hatred. If it were not for his own private work to which he was devoted with his whole mind, his whole interest, 
a man could not live in prison. And indeed, how else could all that mass of men who had had experiences, lived keenly and desired to live, who had been forcibly brought together here, forcibly torn away from society and normal existence, be expected to live a normal and regular life here of their own free will? Idleness alone would have developed in the convict here criminal propensities of which he had no idea before. Without labor, without lawful, normal property, man cannot live. He becomes depraved and is transformed into a beast. And so, in obedience to a natural craving and a sort of sense of self-preservation, everyone in the prison had his special craft and pursuit. The long summer day was almost filled up with the compulsory work. There was hardly time in the brief night for sleep. But in the winter, the convict had by regulation to be locked up in prison as soon as it got dark. What could he do in the long, dull hours of the winter evenings? And so, in spite of prohibition, almost every prison ward was transformed into a huge workshop. Work, occupation, were not formally forbidden, but it was strictly forbidden to have in one's possession in prison any tools, and without these work was impossible. But they worked by stealth, and I fancy that in some cases the authorities shut their eyes to it. Many convicts came to the prison knowing nothing, but they learnt from others, and afterwards went back into the world skilled workmen. There were cobblers there, shoemakers, tailors, cabinet makers, locksmiths, wood carvers, and gilders. There was one Jew, Isai Bomstein, a jeweler and pawnbroker. They all worked and earned something. They got orders for work from the town. Money is coined liberty, and so it is ten times dearer to the man who is deprived of freedom. If money is jingling in his pocket, he is half consoled, even though he cannot spend it. But money can always and everywhere be spent, and, moreover, forbidden fruit is sweetest of all. Even vodka could be got in prison. Pipes were strictly forbidden, but everyone smoked them. Money and tobacco saved them from scurvy and other diseases. Work saved them from crime. Without work, the convicts would have devoured one another like spiders in a glass jar. In spite of this, both work and money were forbidden. From time to time, a sudden search was made at night, and all forbidden articles were carried off. And however carefully money was hidden, it was sometimes found by the searchers. This was partly why it was not saved, but was quickly spent on drink. That was how vodka came to be brought into prison. After every search the guilty, in addition to losing their property, were severely punished. But after every search all they had lost was immediately replaced, new articles were promptly procured, and everything went on as before. The authorities knew this, and the convicts did not grumble at the punishments, though such a life was like living on Vesuvius. Those who did not know a craft carried on some other sort of trade. Some ways of doing so were rather original. Some, for instance, were only occupied in buying and retailing, though they sometimes sold things which it would never occur to anyone outside the walls of the prison to buy or sell, or indeed to consider as things at all. But the prisoners were very poor and had great commercial ability. The poorest rag had its price and was turned to account. They were so poor that money had quite a different value in prison. A great and complicated piece of work was paid for in farthings. Some practiced money-lending with success. Convicts who had been extravagant or unlucky carried their last possessions to the money-lender and got from him a few copper coins at a fearful rate of interest. If the articles were not redeemed at the time fixed, 
they were sold without delay or remorse. The money-lending flourished to such an extent that even prison property liable to inspection was accepted as a pledge. For instance, the prison clothes, boots, and so on, things which were essential for every convict at every moment. But such transactions sometimes took a different, though not altogether unexpected, turn. The pawner, after receiving the money, would sometimes, without further talk, go straight to the senior sergeant in command and inform him of the pawning of prison property, and it would be immediately taken back from the pawnbroker without even a report on the subject to the higher authorities. It is a curious fact that sometimes this was not followed by a quarrel. The moneylender returned what was required in sullen silence, and seemed even to expect what had happened. Perhaps he could not help admitting that in the pawner's place he would have done the same. And so even if he sometimes swore afterwards, it would be without malice, simply to appease his conscience. Generally speaking, they stole from one another dreadfully. Almost everyone had a box of his own, with a lock on it to keep his prison belongings in. This was allowed, but boxes were no security. One may imagine that there were skillful thieves among them. A convict who was sincerely attached to me, this is no exaggeration, stole from me a Bible the only book which one was allowed to have in the prison. He confessed it to me himself the same day, not from repentance, but feeling sorry for me because I spent such a long time looking for it. There were convicts who traded in vodka and soon grew rich. Of this trade I will speak more in detail later. It was rather remarkable. There were many convicts who were in prison for smuggling, and so it was scarcely to be wondered at that vodka was brought into the prison in spite of guards and supervision. Smuggling, by the way, is a crime of a peculiar character. Would it be believed, for instance, that gain is only a secondary consideration with some smugglers, and is never in the foreground of their minds? Yet there are cases of this kind. A smuggler works from inclination, from passion. He is on one side an artist. He risks everything, runs terrible dangers. He is cunning, invents dodges and gets out of scrapes, and sometimes acts with a sort of inspiration. It is a passion as strong as gambling. I knew a convict in the prison of colossal proportions physically, but so quiet, gentle, and meek that it was impossible to imagine how he had got into prison. He was so mild and easy to get on with that all the while he was in prison he never quarreled with anyone. But he was a smuggler who came from the western frontier, and, of course, he could not resist smuggling vodka into the prison. How often he was punished for doing this, and how he dreaded the lash! and for bringing in the vodka he was paid the merest trifle. No one made money out of it but the dealer. The queer fellow loved art for art's sake. He was as lachrymose as a woman, and how often after being punished he swore and vowed not to smuggle. He manfully controlled himself sometimes for a whole month, but yet in the end he broke down. Thanks to men like him, there was no stint of vodka in the prison. Finally, there was another source of income for the convicts, which, though it did not enrich them, was constant and very welcome. This was charity. The higher classes in Russia have no idea how deeply our merchants, tradespeople, and peasants concerned themselves about the unfortunates almsgiving is almost continual, usually in the form of bread, fancy loaves and rolls, far more rarely in money. But for these gifts, in many places prisoners, especially those who are awaiting trial and are much worse treated than convicts, would fare badly. 
The alms are divided with religious exactitude among the convicts. If there is not enough for all, the loaves are cut up equally, sometimes even into six portions, and every prisoner invariably receives his piece. I remember the first time I received money alms. It was soon after my arrival in the prison. I was returning from my morning work alone with the guard. There came to meet me a mother and her child, a little girl of ten, pretty as an angel. I had seen them once already. The mother was the widow of a soldier. Her husband, a young soldier, had died in hospital in the convict ward while awaiting his trial, at the time when I, too, was lying ill there. The mother and daughter came to say good-bye to him. Both cried terribly. Seeing me, the little girl flushed and whispered something to her mother. The latter at once stopped short, found a farthing in her bag, and gave it to the child. The latter flew running after me. There, poor man, take a farthing for Christ's sake, she cried, overtaking me and thrusting the coin into my hand. I took her farthing, and the girl returned to her mother quite satisfied. I treasured that farthing for a long time. Breaking in As noted in my introductory comments, Dostoevsky often takes deliberate steps to forestall any objections from the censor. We see an early indication of this here when he is at pains to emphasize that certain dubious practices of the criminal justice system come from a time long bygone, by which he means under the reign of Nicholas I, who ruled while Dostoevsky was in prison. The so-called special division, where convicts didn't even know the length of their sentence, presumably did not survive the reforms of Alexander II, who was czar at the time of writing. When our narrator expresses incredulity at the fact that half of the peasant prison population could read and write, he is surprised that the number is that high. During this period in Russia, most of the peasants were illiterate. When the convicts list off various proverbs, one of them involves walking the green street. This expression refers to a form of corporal punishment that involves being beaten with sticks. We'll hear more about this practice later in the book. End of comments. Chapter 2 First Impressions The first month in all the early days of my prison life rise vividly before my imagination now. My other prison years flit far more dimly through my memory. Some seem to have sunk completely into the background, to have melted together, leaving only one collective impression. Oppressive, monotonous, suffocating. But all I went through during my first days in Siberia is as vivid to me now as though it had happened yesterday. And this is bound to be so. I remember clearly that from the first step what struck me most in this life was that I found in it nothing striking, nothing exceptional, or rather nothing unexpected. It seemed as though I had had glimpses of it in my imagination when, on my way to Siberia, I tried to conjecture what lay in store for me. But soon I began to find a mass of the strangest surprises, the most monstrous facts awaiting me at every step. And it was only later, after I had been some time in the prison, that I realized fully the exceptional, the surprising nature of such an existence, and I marveled at it more and more. I must confess that this wonder did not leave me throughout the long years of my imprisonment. I never could get used to it. My first impression on entering the prison was most revolting. 
And yet, strange to say, it seemed to me that life in prison was much easier than on the journey I had fancied it would be. Though the prisoners wore fetters, they walked freely about the prison, swore, sang songs, did work on their own account, smoked, even drank vodka, though very few of them, and at night some of them played cards. The labor, for instance, seemed to me by no means so hard, so penal, and only long afterwards I realized that the hardness, the penal character of the work, lay not so much in its being difficult and uninterrupted, as in its being compulsory, obligatory, enforced. The peasant in freedom works, I dare say, incomparably harder, sometimes even all night, especially in the summer. But he is working for himself. He is working with a rational object, and it makes it much easier for him than for the convict working at forced labor, which is completely useless to himself. The idea has occurred to me that if one wanted to crush, to annihilate a man utterly, to inflict on him the most terrible of punishments so that the most ferocious murderer would shudder at it and dread it beforehand, one need only give him work of an absolutely, completely useless and irrational character. Though the hard labor now enforced is uninteresting and wearisome for the prisoner, Yet in itself, as work, it is rational. The convict makes bricks, digs, does plastering, building. There is sense and meaning in such work. The convict worker sometimes even grows keen over it, tries to work more skillfully, faster, better. But if he had to pour water from one vessel into another and back, over and over again, to pound sand, to move a heap of earth from one place to another and back again. I believe the convict would hang himself in a few days, or would commit a thousand crimes, preferring rather to die than endure such humiliation, shame, and torture. Of course such a punishment would become a torture, a form of vengeance, and would be senseless as it would achieve no rational object. But as something of such torture, senselessness, humiliation, and shame is an inevitable element in all forced labor, penal labor is incomparably more painful than any free labor, just because it is forced. I entered the prison in winter, however, in December, and had as yet no conception of the summer work, which was five times as hard. In winter, compulsory work was generally scarce in our prison. The convicts used to go to the river Ertish to break up old government barges, to work in the workshops, to shovel away snowdrifts from government buildings, to bake and pound alabaster, and so on. The winter day was short, the work was soon over, and all of us returned early to the prison, where there was scarcely anything for us to do, if one did not happen to have work of one's own. But only a third of the prisoners, perhaps, were occupied in work of their own. The others were simply idle, wandered aimlessly all over the prison, swore at one another, got up intrigues and rows, got drunk if they could scrape up a little money, at night staked their last shirt at cards, and all this from boredom, from idleness, from having nothing to do. Later on I realized that besides the loss of freedom, besides the forced labor, there is another torture in prison life almost more terrible than any other. That is, compulsory life in common. Life in common is to be found, of course, in other places, but there are men in prison whom not everyone would care to associate with, and I am certain that every convict felt this torture, though, of course, in most cases unconsciously. The food, too, seemed to me fairly sufficient. The convicts used to declare that it was not so good in disciplinary battalions in European Russia. That I cannot undertake to pronounce upon. I have not been in them. Moreover, many of the convicts were able to have food of their own, 
Beef cost a halfpenny a pound, in summer three farthings. But only those who always had money used to buy food for themselves. The majority of the convicts ate only what was provided. But when the convicts praised the prison fare, they referred only to the bread, and they blessed the fact that it was given us all together and was not served out in rations. The latter system horrified them. Had the bread been served out by weight, a third of the people would have been hungry. But served in common, there was plenty for everyone. Our bread was particularly nice and was celebrated throughout the town. It was ascribed to the successful construction of the prison oven. But the cabbage soup was very unattractive. It was cooked in a common cauldron, was slightly thickened with grain, and, particularly on working days, was thin and watery. I was horrified at the immense number of cockroaches in it. The convicts took absolutely no notice of them. The first three days I did not go to work. It was the custom, with every prisoner on arrival, to give him a rest after the journey. But I had to go out next day to have my fetters changed. My fetters were not the right pattern. They were made of rings, tinklers, as the convicts called them. They were worn outside the clothes. The regulation prison fetters that did not prevent the prisoner from working were not made of rings, but of four iron rods almost as thick as a finger, joined together by three rings. They had to be put on under the trousers. A strap was fastened to the middle ring, and this strap was fastened to the prisoner's belt, which he wore next to his shirt. I remember my first morning in the prison. In the guardhouse at the prison gates, the drum beat for daybreak, and ten minutes later the sergeant on duty began unlocking the prison wards. We began to wake up. By the dim light of a tallow candle, the prisoners got up from their sleeping platform, shivering with cold. Most of them were silent and sleepily sullen. They yawned, stretched, and wrinkled up their branded foreheads. Some were crossing themselves. Others had already begun to quarrel. The stuffiness was awful. The fresh winter air rushed in at the door as soon as it was opened and floated in clouds of steam through the barracks. The prisoners crowded round the buckets of water. In turns they took the dipper, filled their mouths with water, and washed their hands and faces from their mouths. Water was brought in overnight by the prashnik, or slop-pail man. In every room there was by regulation a prisoner elected by the others to do the work of the room. He was called the prashnik and did not go out to work. His duty was to keep the room clean, to wash and scrub the platform beds and the floor, to bring in and remove the night pail and to bring in two buckets of fresh water, in the morning for washing and in the daytime for drinking. They began quarreling at once over the dipper. There was only one for all of us. "'Where are you shoving, you roachhead?' grumbled a tall, surly convict, lean and swarthy with strange protuberances on his shaven head, as he pushed another, a stout, squat fellow with a merry, ruddy face. "'Stay there!' "'What are you shouting for? "'Folks pay for their stay, you know. "'You get along yourself. "'There he stands like a monument. "'There isn't any forticultiopnost about him, brothers.' "'This invented word produced a certain sensation. "'Many of them laughed. "'That was all the cheery fat man wanted. "'He evidently played the part of a gratuitous jester in the room.' The tall convict looked at him with the deepest contempt. "'You great sow!' he said as though to himself. "'He's grown fat on the prison bread. Glad he'll give us a litter of twelve sucking pigs by Christmas.' The fat man got angry at last. 
but what sort of queer bird are you? He cried, suddenly turning crimson. Just so, a bird. What sort? That sort. What sort's that sort? Why, that sort, that's all. But what sort? They fixed their eyes on each other. The fat man waited for an answer and clenched his fists as though he meant to fall to fighting at once. I really thought there would be a fight. All this was new to me, and I looked on with curiosity. But afterwards I found out that such scenes were extremely harmless, that they were played by way of a farce for the general entertainment, and hardly ever ended in fights. It was all a fairly typical specimen of prison manners. The tall convict stood calm and majestic. He felt that they were looking at him and waiting to see whether he would discredit himself by his answer or not, that he must keep up his reputation and show that he really was a bird and what sort of bird he was. He looked with inexpressible contempt at his opponent, trying to insult him to the utmost by looking down upon him, as it were over his shoulder, as though he were examining him like an insect, and slowly and distinctly he brought out, Cocky Locky, meaning that that was the bird he was. A loud roar of laughter greeted the convict's readiness. You are a rascal, not a cocky locky, roared the fat man, feeling he had been done at every point and flying into a violent rage. But as soon as the quarrel became serious, the combatants were at once pulled up. What are you shouting about? The whole room roared at them. You'd better fight than split your throats, someone called from a corner. Likely they'd fight, sounded in reply. We are a bold saucy lot. When we are seven against one, we are not frightened. They are both fine fellows. One was sent here for a pound of bread, and the other's a plate-licking jade. He guzzled a countrywoman's junket. That's what he got the knout for. Come, 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 shut up, cried the veteran soldier, who had to be in the room to keep order, and so slept on a special bedstead in the corner. What a lads! Old Petrovitch has waked up. Good morning, old veteran Petrovitch, dear brother. Brother, brother indeed! I never drink a ruble with you, and I am a brother, am I? grumbled the old soldier, putting his arms into the sleeves of his overcoat. They were making ready for inspection. It began to get light. A dense, closely packed crowd had gathered in the kitchen. The convicts in their sheepskins and party-colored caps were crowding round the bread which one of the cooks was cutting up for them. The cooks were chosen by the prisoners, two for each kitchen. They kept the knife, one only for each kitchen, to cut up the bread and meat. In every corner and all about the tables there were convicts with their caps and sheepskins on, their belts fastened, ready to go out to work at once. Before some of them stood wooden cups of kvass. They crumbled the bread into the kvass and sipped that. The noise and uproar were insufferable. There were some talking quietly and sensibly in the corners. "'A good breakfast to old man Antonich. Good morning,' said a young convict, sitting down by a frowning and toothless prisoner. "'Well, good morning, if you mean it,' said the other, not raising his eyes and trying to munch the bread with his toothless gums. "'I thought you were dead, Antonich. I really did.' No, you may die first. I'll come later. I sat down beside them. Two steady-looking convicts were talking on my right, evidently trying to keep up their dignity with one another. They won't steal from me, no fear, said one. There's more chance my stealing something from them. I am a prickly customer, too. Are you, though? You're a jailbird like everyone else. There's no other name for us. 
She'll strip you and not say thank you. That's where my money went, brother. She came herself the other day. Where could I go with her? I began asking to go to Fedka Hangman's. He's got a house at the end of the town. He bought it from the Jew, Scabby Solomon, the fellow who hanged himself afterwards. I know. He used to sell vodka here three years ago and was nicknamed Grishka Black Pothouse. I know. No, you don't know. That was another fellow, Black Pothouse. Another? You know a fat lot. I'll bring you ever so many witnesses. You'll bring witnesses? Where do you come from and who am I? Who are you? Why, I used to beat you and I don't boast of it. And you ask who are you? You used to beat me. Why, the man's not born who will beat me and the man who did is underground. You bender pest. Siberian plague take you. And I hope a Turkish saber will have something to say to you. A storm of abuse followed. Come, come, they are at it again, people shouted round them. They couldn't live in freedom. They may be glad they've bread to eat here. They quieted them down at once. Swearing, wagging your tongue, is allowed. It is to some extent an entertainment for all. But they don't always let it come to a fight, and it is only rarely, in exceptional cases, that enemies fight. Fights are reported to the Major. Investigations follow. The Major himself comes. In short, everyone has to suffer for it, and so fights are not allowed. And indeed, the combatants swear at one another rather for entertainment, for the exercise of their linguistic powers. Often they deceive themselves. They begin very hot and exasperated. One fancies they will fall on one another in a minute. Not a bit of it. They go on to a certain point and then separate at once. All this surprised me immensely at first. I have intentionally quoted here a typical specimen of convict conversation. I could not imagine at first how they could abuse one another for pleasure, find in it amusement, pleasant exercise, enjoyment. But one must not forget their vanity. A connoisseur in abuse was respected. He was almost applauded like an actor. The evening before, I had noticed that they looked askance at me. I had caught several dark looks already. On the other hand, some of the convicts hung about me, suspecting I had brought money with me. They began making up to me at once, began showing me how to wear my new fetters, got me, for money of course, a box with a lock on it, for me to put away the prison belongings already served out to me as well as some underclothes I brought with me into the prison. Next day they stole it from me and sold it for drink. One of them became most devoted to me later on, though he never gave up robbing me at every convenient opportunity. He did this without the slightest embarrassment, almost unconsciously, as though fulfilling a duty, and it was impossible to be angry with him. Among other things, they told me that I ought to have tea of my own, that it would be a good thing for me to have a teapot too, and meanwhile they got me one on hire, and recommended a cook, saying that for thirty kopecks a month he would cook me anything I liked if I cared to eat apart and buy my own provisions. They borrowed money from me, of course, and every one of them came to borrow from me three times the first day. As a rule, convicts who have been gentlemen are looked at with hostility and dislike. In spite of the fact that they are deprived of all the rights of their rank and are put on exactly the same level as the other prisoners, the convicts never consider them their comrades. This is not the result of conscious prejudice, but comes about of itself, quite sincerely and unconsciously. They genuinely looked upon us as gentlemen, though they liked to taunt us with our downfall. No, now it's time to pull up. In Moscow, Pyotr drove like a lord, but now Pyotr sits and twists a cord. 
and similar pleasantries were frequent. They looked with enjoyment at our sufferings, which we tried to conceal from them. We used to have a particularly bad time at work because we had not as much strength as they had and could not do our full share in helping them. Nothing is harder than to win people's confidence, especially such people's, and to gain their love. There were several men belonging to the upper classes in the prison. To begin with, there were five or six Poles. I will speak of them separately later on. The convicts particularly disliked the Poles, even more than those who had been Russian gentlemen. The Poles, I am speaking only of the political prisoners, were elaborately, offensively polite and exceedingly uncommunicative with them. They never could conceal from the convicts their aversion for them, and the latter saw it very clearly and paid the Poles back in the same coin. I spent nearly two years in the prison before I could succeed in gaining the good will of some of the convicts. But in the end, most of them grew fond of me and recognized me as a good man. There were four other Russians of the upper class besides me. One was a mean, abject little creature, terribly depraved, a spy and informer by vocation. I had heard about him before I came to the prison and broke off all relations with him after the first few days. Another was the parasite of whom I have spoken already. The third was Akim Akimich. I have rarely met such a queer fellow as this Akim Akimich. I have still a vivid recollection of him. He was tall, lean, dull-witted, awfully illiterate, very prosy, and as precise as a German. The convicts used to laugh at him, but some of them were positively afraid to have anything to do with him, owing to his fault-finding, his exactingness, and his readiness to take offense. He got on to familiar terms with them from the first. He quarreled and even fought with them. He was phenomenally honest. If he noticed any injustice, he always interfered, though it might have nothing to do with him. He was naive in the extreme. When he quarreled with the convicts, he sometimes reproached them with being thieves and seriously exhorted them not to steal. He had been a lieutenant in the Caucasus. We were friendly from the first day, and he immediately told me about his case. He began as a cadet in an infantry regiment in the Caucasus, plodded on steadily for a long time, was promoted to be an officer at last, and was sent as senior in command to a fortress. One of the allied chieftains burnt his fortress and made a night assault upon it. This was unsuccessful. Akim Akimich was wily and gave no sign of knowing who had done it. The attack was attributed to the hostile tribes, and a month later Akim Akimich invited the chieftain to visit him in a friendly way. The latter came, suspecting nothing. Akim Akimich drew up his company, proved the chieftain's guilt, and upbraided him before them all, pointing out to him that it was shameful to burn fortresses. He discoursed to him in great detail on the way allied chiefs should behave in the future, and, in conclusion, shot him, and at once sent in a full report of the proceedings to the authorities. For all this he was court-martialed and condemned to death, but the sentence was commuted and he was sent to Siberia to penal servitude in the second division for twelve years. He fully recognized that he had acted irregularly. He told me he knew it even before he shot the chieftain. He knew that an ally ought to be legally tried. But although he knew this, he seemed unable to see his guilt in its true light. Why, upon my word, hadn't he burnt my fortress? Was I to say thank you to him for it? He said to me in reply to my objections. But although the convicts laughed at Akim Akimich's foolishness, 
they respected him for his preciseness and practical ability. There was no handicraft which Akim Akimish did not understand. He was a cabinet maker, a cobbler, a shoemaker, a painter, a gilder, a locksmith, and he had learnt all this in the prison. He was self-taught in everything. He would take one look at a thing and do it. He used to make all sorts of little boxes, baskets, lanterns, children's toys, and sold them in the town. In that way he made a little money, and he immediately spent it on extra underclothes, on a softer pillow or a folding mattress. He was in the same room as I was, and was very helpful to me during my first days in prison. When they went out from prison to work, the convicts used to be drawn up in two rows before the guardhouse. In front of them and behind them the soldiers were drawn up with loaded muskets. An officer of the engineers, the foreman and several engineers of the lower rank who used to superintend our work, came out. The foreman grouped the convicts and sent them to work in parties where they were needed. I went with the others to the engineer's workshop. It was a low-pitched stone building standing in a large courtyard which was heaped up with all sorts of materials. There was a smithy, a locksmith's shop, a carpenter's, a painter's, and so on. Akim Akimich used to come here and work at painting. He boiled the oil, mixed the colors, and stained tables and other furniture to look like walnut. While I was waiting for my fetters to be changed, I was talking to Akim Akimich about my first impressions in prison. "'Yes, they are not fond of gentlemen,' he observed. "'Especially politicals. They are ready to devour them. No wonder. To begin with, you are a different sort of people, unlike them. Besides, they've all been serfs or soldiers. Judge for yourself whether they would be likely to be fond of you.' It's a hard life here, I can tell you. And in the Russian disciplinary battalions, it's worse still. Some of these fellows come from them, and they are never tired of praising our prison. They say it's like coming from hell to paradise. It's not the work that's the trouble. There in the first division, they say the authorities are not all military. Anyhow, they behave very differently from here. There, they say the convicts can have little homes of their own. I haven't been there, but that's what they say. They don't have their heads shaved, they don't wear a uniform, though it's a good thing they do wear a uniform and have their heads shaved here. It's more orderly anyway, and it's pleasanter to the eye. Only they don't like it. And look what a mixed rabble they are. One will be a Cantonist, another will be a Circassian, a third an old believer, a fourth will be an orthodox peasant who has left a wife and dear little children behind in Russia. The fifth will be a Jew, the sixth a gypsy, and the seventh God knows who. And they've all got to live together. They've all got to get on together somehow, eat out of the same bowl, sleep on the same bed. And no sort of freedom. If you want an extra crust, you must eat it on the sly. Every farthing you've to hide in your boots and nothing before you but prison and more prison. You can't help all sorts of nonsense coming into your head. But I knew that already. I particularly wanted to question him about our major. Akim Akimich made no secret of things, and I remember my impression was not altogether agreeable. But I had to live for two years under his rule. All that Akim Akimich told me about him turned out to be perfectly true, with the only difference that the impression made by the reality is always stronger than that made by description. The man was terrible, just because being such a man he had almost unlimited power over two hundred souls. In himself he was simply a spiteful and ill-regulated man, nothing more. He looked on the convicts as his natural enemies, and that was his first and great mistake. He really had some ability, but everything, even what was good in him, came out in a distorted form. 
Unrestrained and ill-tempered, he would sometimes burst into the prison, even at night, and if he noticed that a convict was sleeping on his left side or on his back, he would have him punished next day. You've to sleep on your right side, as I've ordered you. In the prison he was hated and feared like the plague. His face was purplish crimson and ferocious. Everyone knew that he was completely in the hands of his orderly, Fedka. What he loved most in the world was his poodle, Trezorka, and he almost went mad with grief when Trezorka fell ill. They say he sobbed over him as though it had been his own son. He drove away one veterinary surgeon and, after his usual fashion, almost beat him. Hearing from Fedka that one of the convicts in the prison was a self-taught vet who was very successful in curing animals, he called him in at once. Help me! I'll load you with gold! Cure Trezorka! He shouted to the convict. The man was a Siberian peasant, crafty, clever, really a very skillful vet, though a peasant in every sense of the word. I looked at Trezorka, he told the convicts afterwards, long after his visit to the Major, however, when the whole story was forgotten. I looked. The dog was lying on a white cushion on the sofa, and I saw it was inflammation, that it ought to be bled, and the dog would get well, yes, indeed. And I thinks to myself, what if I don't cure it? What if it dies? No, Your Honor, said I. You called me in too late. If it had been yesterday or the day before, I could have cured the dog, but now I can't. So Trezorka died. I was told in detail of an attempt to kill the Major. There was a convict in the prison who had been there several years and was distinguished for his mild behavior. It was observed, too, that he hardly ever spoke to anyone. He was looked upon as a bit queer in the religious way. He could read and write, and during the last year he was continually reading the Bible. He read it day and night. When everyone was asleep, he would get up at midnight, light a church wax candle, climb onto the stove, open the book, and read till morning. One day he went up and told the sergeant that he would not go to work. It was reported to the major. He flew into a rage and rushed into the prison at once himself. The convict threw himself upon him with a brick he had got ready beforehand, but missed his aim. He was seized, tried, and punished. It all happened very quickly. Three days later, he died in the hospital. As he lay dying, he said that he meant no harm to anyone, but was only seeking suffering. He did not, however, belong to any dissenting sect. In the prison he was remembered with respect. At last my fetters were changed. Meanwhile, several girls selling rolls had come into the workshop. Some of them were quite little girls. They used to come with the rolls till they were grown up. Their mothers baked them, and they brought them for sale. When they were grown up, they still came, but not to sell bread. This was almost always the case. There were some who were not little girls. The rolls cost a halfpenny, and almost all the convicts bought them. I noticed one of the convicts, a grey-headed but ruddy cabinet-maker, smiling and flirting with the baker girls. Just before they came in, he had tied a red handkerchief round his neck. A fat peasant woman, whose face was covered with pockmarks, put her tray on his bench. Conversation began between them. "'Why didn't you turn up yesterday?' said the convict with a self-satisfied smile. "'Upon my word I did, but not a sign to be seen of you,' answered the lively woman. "'I was wanted, or you may be sure I'd have been there. 
The day before yesterday, all your lot came to see me. Who did? Maryashka came, Havroshka came, Chakunda came, Two Penny Half Penny came. What does it mean? I asked Akim Akimich. Is it possible? It does happen, he answered, dropping his eyes discreetly, for he was an extremely chaste man. It certainly did happen, but very rarely, and in spite of immense difficulties. On the whole, men were much more keen on drinking, for instance, than on that sort of thing, in spite of its being naturally difficult for them to live in the way they were forced to do. Women were difficult to get hold of. The time and place had to be found, arrangements had to be made, meetings had to be fixed, seclusion had to be sought, which was particularly difficult, the guards had to be won over, which was still more difficult, and altogether a sum of money, immense relatively speaking, had to be spent. Yet I happened sometimes later on to be a witness of amatory scenes. I remember one day in the summer we were three of us in a shed on the bank of the Irtish, heating some sort of kiln. The guards were good-natured fellows. At last two frillies, as the convicts called them, made their appearance. "'Well, where have you been so long? I bet you've been at the Zvirkovs.' was how they were greeted by the convict whom they had come to see, and who had been expecting them a long time. "'I've been so long. Why, I haven't been there longer than a magpie on a pole,' the girl answered gaily. She was the dirtiest girl imaginable. She was the one called Chikunda. With her came two penny half penny. The latter was beyond all description." I've not seen you for a long time either, the gallant went on, addressing two penny half penny. How is it you seem to be thinner? Maybe. I used to be ever so fat, but now one would think I'd swallowed a needle. Always being with the soldiers, eh? No, that's a lie that spiteful tongues have told you. Though what of it? Though I'm thin as any rake, the soldier lads I'll ne'er forsake. You chuck them and love us, we've got cash. To complete the picture, imagine this gallant with a shaven head, in party-colored clothes, guarded and in fetters. I took leave of Akim Akimich, and hearing that I might go back to the prison, I went back escorted by a guard. The convicts were already coming home. The men on piecework are the first to return. The only way of making a convict work hard is to put him on piecework. Sometimes huge tasks are set them, but they always do the work twice as quickly as when they are working by the day. When he finishes his task, the convict goes home without hindrance and no one prevents his doing so. They don't dine all together, but as they come in, just as it happens. Indeed, there would not have been room for them all at once in the kitchen. I tried the soup, but not being used to it, I could not eat it, and I made myself some tea. We sat down at the end of the table. With me was a comrade of the same social class as myself. Convicts kept going and coming. There was plenty of room, however, they were not yet all in. A group of five men sat down together at the big table. The cook poured them out two bowls of soup and put on the table a whole dish of fried fish. They were keeping some sort of fate and eating their own food. They cast unfriendly glances in our direction. One of the poles came in and sat down beside us. I've not been at home, but I know all the news, a tall convict shouted aloud as he walked into the kitchen and looked round at everyone present. He was a thin, muscular man of fifty. There was something sly and at the same time merry about his face. 
What was particularly striking about him was his thick, protruding lower lip. It gave a peculiarly comic look to his face. Well, have you had a good night? Why don't you say good morning? Hello, my Kursk friends, he added, sitting down beside the group who were eating their own food. A good appetite to you. Give a welcome to a friend. We are not Kursk men, brother. Tambov, then? But we are not from Tambov, either. You get nothing from us, brother. You go and ask a rich peasant. I've collywobbles and rumble tumbles in my belly today. And where is he living, your rich peasant? Why, Gazan yonder is a rich peasant. You go to him. Gazan's having a spree today, lads. He is drinking. He is drinking all his money. He's worth a good twenty roubles, observed another. It's a good business, lads, selling vodka. Well, won't you welcome a friend? I must have a sup of regulation fare, then. You go and ask for some tea. The gentlemen there have got some. Gentlemen? There are no gentlemen here. They are the same as we are now. A convict sitting in the corner brought out gloomily. He had not said a word till then. I should like some tea, but I am ashamed to ask. We have our pride, observed the convict with a protruding lip, looking good-naturedly at us. I'll give you some, if you like, I said, inviting the convict to have tea. Would you like some? Like it? To be sure I'd like it. He came up to the table. At home he ate broth out of a shoe, but here he's learnt to like tea, and wants to drink it like the gentry, the gloomy convict pronounced. Why, does no one drink tea here? I asked him. But he did not deign to answer me. Here there are bringing rolls. Mayn't we have a roll, too? Rolls were brought in. A young convict brought in a whole bundle and was selling them in the prison. The baker girl used to give him one roll out of every ten he sold. He was reckoning on that tenth roll. Rolls, rolls, he cried, entering the kitchen. Moscow rolls all hot. I'd eat them myself, but I haven't the money. Come, lads, the last roll is left. Surely someone for his mother's sake. This appeal to filial affection amused everyone, and several rolls were bought. I say, lads, he announced, Gazin will get into trouble the way he's carrying on. Upon my word, he has pitched on a time to drink. Ten to one, eight eyes will be round. They'll hide him. Why, is he very drunk? Rather, he is wild, he is pestering everyone. Oh, it will end in a fight then. Of whom are they talking? I asked the Pole, who had sat down beside me. It's Gazin, a convict. He does a trade in vodka here. When he's saved up enough money, he spends it in drink. He is spiteful and cruel. When he is sober, he is quiet, though. When he is drunk, it all comes out. He flies at people with a knife. Then they have to restrain him. How do they restrain him? A dozen convicts fall upon him and begin beating him horribly until he loses consciousness. They beat him till he is half dead. Then they lay him on the bed and cover him with the sheepskin. But they may kill him. Anyone else would have been killed by now, but not he. He is awfully strong, stronger than anyone in the prison and of the healthiest constitution. Next day he is perfectly well. Tell me, please, I went on, questioning the pole. Here they are eating their own food while I drink my tea, and yet they look as though they were envious of the tea. What does it mean? It's not because of the tea, 
answered the Pole. They are ill-disposed to you because you are a gentleman and not like them. Many of them would like to pick a quarrel with you. They would dearly like to insult you, to humiliate you. You will meet with a lot of unpleasantness here. We have an awfully hard time. It's harder for us than for any of them. One needs to be philosophical to get used to it. You will meet unpleasantness and abuse again and again for having your own food and tea, though very many of them here frequently have their own food, and some have tea every day. They may, but you mustn't. He got up and went away from the table. A few minutes later his words came true. Breaking In in Chapter 1, our narrator tells us that he entered the camp in January. In Chapter 2, he says he entered in December. So, which is it? The historical answer is that Dostoevsky entered the camp in January of 1850. By the time he is writing Chapter 2 of the book, however, it suits his narrative purposes better to have Goryanchikov enter the camp in December. This will help to provide the organizational structure for Part 1, which ends at the Christmas holiday. Probably some of the criminal's verbal sparring when getting up in the morning is inscrutable to you as it is to me. For instance, I can take a guess as to what a bender pest is, but I'm not confident here. Naturally, the tenor more than the details is what matters in this passage. You may have noted that Dostoevsky tells us that there were four other Russian gentlemen in the camp, but only describes three in the chapter. The fourth was his companion from Petersburg, Sergei Durov. Durov did not fare well in the camp, and Dostoevsky treats him very delicately in the text, and never by name. He does appear obliquely on occasion, as indeed in this chapter he is the silent gentleman sitting with our narrator drinking tea, before they are joined by the pole and then the loud jocular convict. We hear that Akim Akimich had been stationed in the Caucasus. During this period of time, and just before the outbreak of the Crimean War, the Russian Empire was embroiled in a long conflict against Islamic tribes in the Caucasus. Their primary antagonists were the Circassians, whom Akim Akimich mentions as one of the groups represented in the prison camp. Some of the native groups were allied with the Russians, however, as was the chief Akim Akimich killed. We will meet other participants in the Caucasian War, including some Circassians, in the later chapters. Akim Akimich also mentions Cantonists and Old Believers. Cantonists were the sons of soldiers who were raised in military camps and forced to serve in the army when grown. I'll address the Old Believers at the end of the next chapter. Hopefully it is clear by now that when our narrator speaks of punishment, he is referring to corporal punishment in particular. Thus it comes as no surprise that the prisoner who attempted to kill the major should have died three days after his punishment in the hospital. This fact should also put into context just how sadistic the major is when he punishes convicts for failing to sleep on their right side. In case it wasn't absolutely obvious, yes, there is prostitution in the camp. In fact, part of the early morning banter between prisoners concerns where one can go with a prostitute and how to avoid being robbed by her. Although Dostoevsky never explicitly mentions it in the text, not all of the prostitutes were female. We won't encounter many more details about prostitution as we go forward, but we will hear more about vodka smuggling including the most successful smuggler in the camp, Gazin.
whom we will be meeting shortly. End of comments. Chapter 3 First Impressions M, the Pole who had been talking to me, had scarcely gone out when Gazin rolled into the kitchen, hopelessly drunk. This convict, drunk in broad daylight, on a working day when all were bound to be out at work, under the rule of a stern officer who might come into the prison at any moment, under the control of the sergeant who never left the prison, with guards and sentries about, in short, in the midst of severity and discipline, threw into confusion all the ideas I had begun to form of prison life. And it was a long time before I could explain to myself all the facts which were so puzzling to me during my early days in prison. I have mentioned already that the convicts always had private work of their own, and that such work was a natural craving in prison life. That, apart from this craving, the prisoner is passionately fond of money, and prizes it above everything, almost as much as freedom, and that he is comforted if he has it jingling in his pocket. On the other hand, he becomes dejected, sad, uneasy, and out of spirits when he has none, and then he is ready to steal or do anything to get it. But though money was so precious in prison, it never stayed long with the lucky man who had it. To begin with, it was difficult to keep it from being stolen or taken away. If the major discovered it in the course of a sudden search, he promptly confiscated it. Possibly he spent it on improving the prison fare. Anyway, it was taken to him. But much more frequently it was stolen. There was no one who could be relied upon. Later on, we discovered a way of keeping money quite securely. It was put into the keeping of an old believer who came to us from the Starodubovsky settlements. He was a little gray-headed man of sixty. He made a vivid impression on me from the first minute. He was so unlike the other convicts. There was something so calm and gentle in his expression that I remember I looked with a peculiar pleasure at his serene, candid eyes, which were surrounded with tiny wrinkles like rays. I often talked to him, and I have rarely met a more kindly, warm-hearted creature in my life. He had been sent there for a very serious offense. Among the Starodubovsky old believers, some converts to the Orthodox Church were made, the government gave them great encouragement and began to make great efforts for the conversion of the others. The old man resolved with other fanatics to stand up for the faith, as he expressed it. An orthodox church was being built, and they burnt it down. As one of the instigators, the old man was sent to penal servitude. He had been a well-to-do tradesman and left a wife and children behind him, but he went with a brave heart into exile, for in his blindness he considered it martyrdom for the faith. After spending some time with him, one could not help asking oneself how this meek old man, as gentle as a child, could have been a rebel. Several times I talked to him of the faith. He would never yield an inch in his convictions, but there was no trace of anger or of hatred in his replies and yet he had destroyed a church and did not deny doing it. It seemed that from his convictions he must have considered his action and his suffering for it a glorious achievement. But however closely I watched him and studied him, I never detected the faintest sign of pride or vanity in him. There were other old believers in the prison, mostly Siberians. They were very well-educated people, shrewd peasants, great students of the Bible who quibbled over every letter, and great dialecticians in their own way. They were a crafty, conceited, aggressive, and extremely intolerant set. The old man was absolutely different. Though perhaps better read than they, he avoided argument. He was of a very communicative disposition. He was merry, often laughing, 
not with the coarse, cynical laugh of the other convicts, but with a gentle, candid laugh, in which there was a great deal of childlike simplicity that seemed peculiarly in keeping with his grey hair. I may be mistaken, but I fancy that one can know a man from his laugh, and if you like a man's laugh before you know anything of him, you may confidently say that he is a good man. Though the old man had gained the respect of all throughout the prison, he was not in the least conceited about it. The convicts used to call him Grandfather, and they never insulted him. I could partly imagine the sort of influence he must have had on his fellow believers. But in spite of the unmistakable courage with which he endured his punishment, there was also a deep inconsolable melancholy in his heart, which he tried to conceal from all. I lived in the same room with him. One night I woke up at three o'clock and heard the sound of quiet, restrained weeping. The old man was sitting on the stove, the same stove on which the Bible reader who threw the brick at the major used to pray at night. He was saying his prayers over his manuscript book. He was weeping, and I could hear him saying from time to time, Lord, do not forsake me. Lord, give me strength. My little ones, my darling little ones, I shall never see you again. I can't describe how sad it made me. It was to this old man that almost all the convicts began by degrees to give their money for him to take care of it. Almost all the prisoners were thieves, but suddenly for some reason the belief gained ground that the old man could not steal. They knew that he hid the money given into his keeping in some place so secret that no one could find it. In the end he explained his secret to me in some of the poles. On one of the posts of the fence there was a twig apparently adhering firmly on the trunk. But it could be taken out, and there was a deep hollow in the wood. Here Grandfather used to hide the money, and then insert the twig again so that no one could ever find anything. But I am wandering from my story. I was just saying why money never stayed long in a convict's pocket. Apart from the difficulty of keeping it, life in prison was so dreary, a convict is a creature by nature so eager for freedom, and from his social position so careless and reckless, that to have his fling for all he is worth, to spend all his fortune carousing with noise and music, and so to forget his depression, if only for the moment, naturally attracts him. It was strange to see how some of them would work unceasingly, sometimes for several months, simply to spend all their earnings in one day, leaving nothing, and then to drudge away for months again till the next outbreak. Many of them were very fond of getting new clothes, which were never of the regulation pattern. Black trousers unlike the uniform, tunics, coats. Cotton shirts and belts studded with metal discs were also in great demand. They dressed up on holidays, and then always paraded through all the prison wards to show themselves to all the world. Their pleasure in fine clothes was quite childish, and in many things the convicts were perfect children. It is true that all these fine things soon vanished from the owner's possession. Sometimes they pawned or sold them for next to nothing the same evening. The outbreak of drinking developed gradually, however. It was put off as a rule till a holiday or till a name day. On his name day, the convict set a candle before the icon and said his prayers as soon as he got up. Then he dressed in his best and ordered a dinner. He bought beef and fish. Siberian patties were made. He would eat like an ox, almost always alone, rarely inviting his comrades to share his meal. Then vodka was brought out. The hero of the day would get drunk as a lord and always walked all over the prison, reeling and staggering, trying to show to everyone that he was drunk, that he was jolly and so deserving of general respect. 
Everywhere among the Russian people a certain sympathy is felt for a drunken man. In prison he was positively treated with respect. There were certain aristocratic customs connected with prison revelry. The carousing convict always hired music. There was a little pole in prison, a runaway soldier, a nasty little fellow who played the fiddle and had an instrument, his one possession in the world. He had no sort of trade, and his only way of earning money was by playing lively dances for convicts who were having a spree. His duty was to follow his drunken employer from room to room and to play the fiddle with all his might. Often his face betrayed boredom and dejection. But the shout of, Play on, you're paid to do it, made him go on scraping away. The convict can always feel confident when he begins drinking that, if he gets too drunk, he will certainly be looked after. He will be put in bed in time and hidden away if the authorities turn up, and all this will be quite disinterested. The sergeant and the veteran guards who lived in the prison to keep discipline could have their minds at rest, too. The drunken convict could not create any disorder. All the prisoners in the room looked after him, and if he were noisy or unmanageable, they would quickly restrain him and even tie him up. And so the inferior prison officials winked at drunkenness and were unwilling to notice it. They knew very well that if vodka were not allowed, it would make things worse. But how was vodka obtained? It was bought in the prison itself from the so-called publicans. There were several of them, and they carried on their trade successfully and unintermittently, though the number of those who drank and made merry was small, for merrymaking costs money, and the convict's money is hardly earned. The publican's operations were begun, managed, and carried on in a very original way. Suppose the convict knows no trade and is not willing to exert himself. There were men like this, but is keen on getting money and of an impatient disposition, in a hurry to make his pile. If he has a little money to start with, he makes up his mind to trade in vodka. It's a bold and risky enterprise involving considerable danger. He may have to pay for it with a flogging, and lose his stock and his capital all at once. But the publican takes the risk. He begins with a small sum, and so at first he smuggles the vodka into the prison himself, and, of course, disposes of it to great advantage. He repeats the experiment a second and a third time, and if he does not get caught, he quickly sells his stock and only then builds up a real trade on a large scale. He becomes an entrepreneur, a capitalist, employs agents and assistants, runs far less risk and makes more and more money. His subordinates risk themselves for him. There are always in the prison lots of men who have wasted all they have on cards or drink, wretched, ragged creatures who have no trade but have a certain pluck and daring. The only asset such a man has left is his back. It may still be of some use to him, and so the spendthrift profligate decides to turn it to profit. He goes to the publican and offers his services for smuggling vodka. A well-to-do publican has several such working for him. Somewhere outside the prison there is some person, a soldier, a workman, sometimes even a woman, who, for a comparatively large commission, buys vodka at a tavern with the publican's money and conceals it in some out-of-the-way place where the convicts go to work. Almost always the intermediary tests the quality of the vodka to begin with, and ruthlessly fills up the measure with water. The publican may take it or leave it. A convict is not in a position to make his own terms. He must be thankful that he has got the vodka, however poor the quality, and has not lost his money altogether. The publican introduces his agents to the intermediary beforehand, and then they go to the latter carrying with them the guts of a bullock, which have been washed and then filled with water to keep them supple and fit to hold vodka. 
When he has filled the guts with vodka, the convict winds them round himself where they will be least conspicuous. I need not say that this calls forth all the ingenuity, all the thievish cunning of the smuggler. His honor is to some extent involved. He has to deceive both the guards and the sentries. He does deceive them. The guard, often a raw recruit, is never a match for a clever thief. Of course, the guard is the subject of special study beforehand. Besides, the time and place where he is working is all carefully considered, too, by the smuggler. The convict may be building a stove. He climbs onto the stove. Who can tell what he is doing there? A guard cannot be expected to climb after him. On his way to the prison, he takes some money in his hand, fifteen or twenty silver kopecks in case of need, and waits for the corporal at the gate. The corporal examines every convict returning from work and feels him over before opening the prison door to him. The man smuggling in vodka usually reckons on the corporal's scrupling to handle him too minutely in some parts. But sometimes the wily corporal does not stand on ceremony and discovers the vodka. Then there is only one thing left to do. The smuggler, unseen by the guard, silently slips into the corporal's hand the coin he has been keeping concealed in his own. It sometimes happens that, thanks to this maneuver, he gets successfully into the prison with the vodka. But sometimes this method does not answer and then he has to pay with his last asset, his back. It is reported to the major, the asset is flogged, and cruelly flogged. The vodka is confiscated, and the agent takes it all on himself without giving away his employer. And, be it noted, not because he scorns to tell tales, but simply because it does not pay him to do so. He would be flogged anyway, his only consolation would be that the other man would be flogged too. But he will need his employer again, though in accordance with custom and previous agreement, the smuggler gets nothing from his employer to compensate him for the flogging. As for telling tales in general, it is very common. In prison, the man who turns traitor is not exposed to humiliation. Indignation against him is unthinkable. He is not shunned. The others make friends with him. In fact, if you were to try and point out the loathsomeness of treachery, you would not be understood. The convict with whom I had broken off all relations, a mean and depraved creature who had been a gentleman, was friendly with the major's orderly, Fedka, and served him as a spy, while the latter reported all he heard about the convicts to the major. Every one of us knew this, Yet no one ever dreamed of punishing the scoundrel or even reproaching him for it. But I am wandering from my subject. It happens, of course, that vodka is smuggled in successfully. Then the publican takes the guts, pays for them, and begins to count the cost. It turns out when he reckons it that the stuff has cost him a great deal, and so to increase his profit, he dilutes the vodka once more, adding an almost equal bulk of water. Then he is ready for his customers. On the first holiday, sometimes even on a working day, the customer turns up. This is a convict who has been working like an ox for some months and has saved up his money in order to spend it all on drink on some day fixed beforehand. Long before it arrives, this day has been the object of the poor toiler's dreams at night, and happy daydreams over his work, and its fascination has kept up his spirits through the weary routine of prison life. At last the happy day dawns in the east. His money has been saved, not taken away, not stolen, and he brings it to the publican. To begin with, the latter gives him the vodka as pure as possible, that is, only twice diluted. But as the bottle gets emptier, he invariably fills it up again with water. A cup of vodka costs five or six times as much as in a tavern. You can imagine how many cups of such vodka must be drunk, 
and what they will have cost before the point of intoxication is reached. But from having lost the habit of drinking, and having abstained from it so long, the convict readily gets drunk, and he usually goes on drinking till he has spent all his money. Then he brings out all his new clothes. The publican is a pawnbroker as well. He first gets hold of the newly acquired personal possessions, then the old things, and finally the prison clothes. When he has drunk up everything to the last rag, the drunken convict lies down to sleep, and next day, waking up with the inevitable splitting headache, he vainly entreats the publican to give him just a sip of vodka as a pick-me-up. Mournfully he endures his sad plight, and the same day sets to work again, and works again for several months unceasingly, dreaming of the happy day of debauch lost and gone forever, and by degrees beginning to take heart again and look forward to another similar day, still far away, but sure to come sometime in its turn. As for the publican, after making a huge sum of money, some dozens of rubles, he gets the vodka ready for the last time, adding no water to it, for he means it for himself. He has done enough of trading. It is time for him to enjoy himself, too. Then begins an orgy of drinking, eating, and music. With such means at his disposal, he even softens the hearts of the inferior prison officials. The debauch sometimes lasts several days. All the vodka he has prepared is soon drunk, of course. Then the prodigal resorts to the other publicans who are on the lookout for him, and drinks until he has spent every farthing. However carefully the convicts guard their drunken fellow, he is sometimes seen by a higher official, by the major or the officer on duty. He is taken to the guardhouse, stripped of his money if he has it on him, and finally flogged. He shakes himself, goes back into the prison, and a few days later takes up his trade in vodka again. Some of the festive characters, the rich ones, of course, have dreams of the fair sex, too. For a big bribe to the guard escorting them, they can sometimes be taken in secret to some place in town instead of to work. There, in some out-of-the-way little house at the furthest end of the town, there is a feast on a huge scale, and really large sums of money are squandered. Even a convict is not despised if he has money. A guard is picked out beforehand who knows his way about. Such guards are usually future candidates for prison themselves. But anything can be done for money, and such expeditions almost always remain a secret. I must add that they are a very rare occurrence. So much money is needed, and devotees of the fair sex have recourse to other methods which are quite free from danger. Before I had been many days in prison, my curiosity was particularly aroused by a young convict, a very pretty lad. He was called Sorotkin. He was rather an enigmatic creature in many ways. What struck me, first of all, was his beautiful face. He was not more than three and twenty. He was in the special division that is, of criminals with a life sentence, which means that he was considered one of the worst of the military convicts. Mild and gentle, he talked little and rarely laughed. He had blue eyes, regular features, a clear-skinned, delicate face, and fair hair. He was such a pretty fellow that even his half-shaven head hardly disfigured him. He knew no sort of trade, but he often had money, though not much at a time. One could see that he was lazy, and he was untidy in his dress. But occasionally someone would give him something nice to wear, even sometimes a red shirt, and Sorotkin was obviously pleased at his new clothes, and walked about the prison to show himself. He did not drink nor play cards, and hardly ever quarreled with anyone. He used to walk behind the prison with his hands in his pockets, 
quiet and dreamy. What he could be dreaming about, it was difficult to guess. If one called to him sometimes from curiosity, asked him some question, he answered at once and even respectfully, not like a convict, though always briefly and uncommunicatively, and he looked at one like a child of ten years old. When he had any money, he did not buy himself something necessary, did not get his coat mended, did not order new boots, but bought rolls or gingerbread and ate them like a child of seven. Ah, oh, you Sorotkin, the convicts would say to him sometimes, you are an orphan all forlorn. Out of working hours he used to wander about the prison barracks. Almost everyone else would be at work, only he had nothing to do. If anything was said to him, usually a taunt, he and the others in his division were often made fun of, he would turn round and go off to another room without saying a word. Sometimes he blushed crimson if he were much ridiculed. I often wondered how this peaceable, simple-hearted creature had come into prison. Once I was in the convict's ward in the hospital. Sorotkin, too, was ill and was in the bed next to mine. One evening we fell into talk. Somehow he got warmed up and incidentally told me how he had been taken for a soldier, how his mother cried seeing him off, and how wretched he was as a recruit. He added that he could not endure the life of a recruit, because everyone there was so cross and stern, and the officers were almost always displeased with him. "'How did it end?' I asked. "'What brought you here? And in the special division, too? Oh, Sorotkin, Sorotkin! "'Why, I was only a year in the battalion, Alexander Petrovitch, and I came here because I killed my commanding officer. I'd heard it, Sorotkin, but I can't believe it. How could you kill anyone? It happened so, Alexander Petrovitch. I was awfully miserable. But how do the other recruits manage? Of course it's hard at first, but they get used to it, and in the end they become fine soldiers. Your mother must have spoiled you. She fed you on milk and goodies till you were eighteen. My mother was very fond of me, it's true. She took to her bed when I went for a recruit, and I've heard she never got up from it. Life was very bitter to me at last when I was a recruit. The officer did not like me. He was always punishing me. And what for? I gave way to everyone, was punctual in everything did not touch vodka, did not pick up any habits. It's a bad business, you know, Alexander Petrovitch, when one picks up habits. Such cruel-heartedness everywhere, no chance to have a good cry. Sometimes you'd get behind a corner and cry there. Well, I was once on sentry duty. It was at night. I was put as sentry by the gun rack. It was windy, it was autumn and pitch dark. And I felt so sick, so sick. I stood my gun on the ground. I twisted off the bayonet and put it on one side, slipped off my right boot, put the barrel to my breast, leant against it, and with my big toe pulled the trigger. It missed fire. I looked at the gun, cleaned the touch hole, poured some fresh powder into it, struck the flint and put the gun to my breast again. And would you believe it? The powder flashed, but the gun did not go off again. I wondered what was the meaning of it. I took my boot and put it on, fixed on the bayonet and walked to and fro, saying nothing. It was then I made up my mind to do what I did. I did not care where I went if I could get away from there. Half an hour later, the officer rode up. He was making the chief round of inspection. He went straight for me. Is that the way to stand on sentry duty? I took my gun in my hand and stuck the bayonet into him up to the hilt. I've come four thousand miles and I am here with a life sentence. 
he was not lying. And for what other crime could he have been given a life sentence? Ordinary crimes are punished far more leniently. But Sorotkin was the only good-looking one of these lifers. As for the others in the same case, of whom there were about fifteen among us, it was strange to look at them. There were only two or three tolerable faces among them. The others were all such hideous creatures, filthy-looking with long ears. Some of them were grey-headed men. If possible, I will describe all this group more exactly later on. Sorotkin was often friendly with Gazin, the convict whom I mention at the beginning of the chapter, describing how he staggered into the kitchen drunk, and how he upset my preconceived ideas of prison life. This Gazin was a horrible creature. He made a terrible and painful impression on everyone. It always seemed to me that there could not be a more ferocious monster than he was. I have seen at Tobolsk Kamenev, a robber famous for his crimes. Later on I saw Sokolov, a runaway soldier who was being tried for terrible murders he had committed. But neither of them made such a repulsive impression on me as Gazin. I sometimes felt as though I were looking at a huge, gigantic spider the size of a man. He was a totter, terribly strong, stronger than anyone in the prison, of more than average height, of Herculean proportions, with a hideous, disproportionately huge head. He walked with a slouch and looked sullenly from under his brows. There were strange rumors about him in the prison. It was known that he had been a soldier, but the convicts said among themselves, I do not know with what truth, that he was an escaped convict from Nurchinsk, that he had been sent more than once to Siberia, and had escaped more than once, had more than once changed his name, and had at last been sent to our prison with a life sentence. It was said, too, that he had been fond of murdering small children simply for pleasure, he would lure the child to some convenient spot, begin by terrifying and tormenting it, and after enjoying to the full the shuddering terror of the poor little victim, he would kill it with a knife slowly, with deliberation and enjoyment. All this perhaps was invented in consequence of the feeling of oppression Gazin aroused in everyone, but all these stories were in keeping with him and harmonized with his appearance. Yet at ordinary times, when he was not drunk, his behavior in prison was very orderly. He was always quiet, did not quarrel with anyone, and avoided quarrels. But, as it seemed, from contempt for the others, as though he considered himself superior to all the rest, he spoke very little and was, as it were, intentionally reserved. All his movements were calm, deliberate, self-confident. One could see from his eyes that he was very intelligent and exceedingly cunning, but there was always something of supercilious derision and cruelty in his face and smile. He traded in vodka and was one of the richest vodka dealers in the prison. But about twice in the year he would get drunk himself, and then all the brutality of his nature came out. As he gradually got drunk, he began at first attacking people with jibes, the most spiteful, calculated, as it seemed, long premeditated taunts. Finally, when he was quite drunk, he passed into a stage of blind fury, snatched up a knife and rushed at people. The convicts, knowing his terrible strength, ran and hid themselves. He fell upon anyone he met. But they soon found means to get control of him. A dozen men, inmates of the same prison ward as Gazin, would suddenly rush at him all at once and begin beating him. Nothing crueler could be imagined. They beat him on the chest, on the heart, on the pit of the stomach, on the belly. They beat him hard and beat him a long time. They only desisted when he lost consciousness and lay like a corpse. They could not have brought themselves to beat any other convict like that, 
To beat like that meant killing any other man, but not Gazin. Then they wrapped his unconscious body in a sheepskin and carried it to the bed. He'll sleep it off. And he did, in fact, get up next morning almost uninjured and went to work, silent and sullen. Every time Gazan got drunk, everyone in the prison knew that the day would certainly end in a beating for him. And he knew this himself, and yet he got drunk. So it went on for several years. At last it was noticed that Gazan was beginning to break up. He began to complain of pains of all sorts, grew noticeably weaker, and was more and more often in the hospital. He is breaking up, the convicts said among themselves. He came into the kitchen, followed by the nasty little pole with the fiddle, who was generally hired by the festive convicts to enhance their jollity, and he stood still in the middle of the room, silently and attentively scanning all present. All were silent. At last, seeing me and my companion, he looked at us spitefully and derisively, smiled self-complacently, seemed to think of something, and staggering heavily came towards our table. "'Where did you get the money for this little treat, may I inquire?' he began. He spoke Russian. I exchanged silent glances with my companion, realizing that the best thing was to hold our tongues and not to answer him. At the first contradiction, he would have flown into a fury. "'So you've money, have you?' he went on questioning us. "'So you've a lot of money, eh? And you come to prison to drink tea? You've come to drink tea, have you? Speak, damn you!' But seeing that we had made up our minds to be silent and to take no notice of him, he turned crimson and shook with rage. Near him in the corner stood a big tray which was used for the slices of bread cut for the dinner or supper of the convicts. It was large enough to hold the bread for half the prison. At the moment it was empty. He picked it up with both hands and raised it above us. In another moment he would have smashed our heads. A murder, or an attempt at murder, threatened the whole prison with extremely unpleasant consequences. It would be followed by inquiries, searches, and greater severity, and so the convicts did their utmost not to let things come to such an extremity. And yet in spite of that, on this occasion all kept quiet and waited. Not one word in our defense— not one shout at Gazan, so intense was their hatred of us. They were apparently pleased at our dangerous position. But the incident passed off without harm. Just as he was about to bring down the tray, someone shouted from the passage, Gazan! Vodka's stolen! He let the tray fall crashing on the floor and rushed like mad out of the kitchen. Well, God saved them, the convicts said among themselves. And they repeated it long after. I could not find out afterwards whether the news of the theft of the vodka was true or invented on the spur of the moment to save us. In the evening, after dusk, before the prison was locked up, I walked round the fence and an overwhelming sadness came upon me. I never experienced such sadness again in all my prison life. The first day of confinement, whether it be in prison, in the fortress, or in Siberia, is hard to bear. But I remember what absorbed me more than anything was one thought which haunted me persistently all the time I was in prison. A difficulty that cannot be fully solved. I cannot solve it even now. The inequality of punishment for the same crime. It is true that crimes cannot be compared even approximately. For instance, two men may commit murders. All the circumstances of each case are weighed, and in both cases almost the same punishment is given. Yet look at the difference between the crimes. 
one may have committed a murder for nothing, for an onion. He murdered a peasant on the high road who turned out to have nothing but an onion. See, father, you sent me to get booty. Here I've murdered a peasant and all I've found is an onion. Fool! An onion means a farthing. A hundred murders and a hundred onions and you've got a rouble. A prison legend. Another murders a sensual tyrant in defense of the honor of his betrothed, his sister, or his child. Another is a fugitive, hemmed in by the regiment of trackers, who commits a murder in defense of his freedom, his life, often dying of hunger. And another murders little children for the pleasure of killing, of feeling their warm blood on his hands, of enjoying their terror, and the last dove-like flutter under the knife. Yet all of these are sent to the same penal servitude. It is true that there are variations in the length of the sentence, but these variations are comparatively few, and the variations in the same sort of crime are infinitely numerous. There are as many shades of difference as there are characters. But let us admit that it is impossible to get over this inequality, that it is in its own way an insoluble problem, like squaring the circle. Apart from this, let us look at another inequality, at the difference in the effect of a punishment. One man will pine, waste away like a candle in prison, while another had no notion till he came to prison that such a jolly existence, such a pleasant club of spirited companions was to be found in the world. Yes, there are some in prison like that. Or take the case of an educated man with an awakened conscience, intelligence, heart. The mere ache of his own heart will kill him by its torments sooner than any punishment. He condemns himself for his crime more unsparingly, more relentlessly than the most rigorous law. And beside him is another who has never once all the time he has been in prison thought of the murder he has committed. He positively considers he has done right. And there are men who commit crimes on purpose to be sent to penal servitude, in order to escape from a far more penal life of labor outside. There he lived in the deepest degradation, never had enough to eat, and worked from morning to night for his exploiter. In prison the work is lighter than at home. There is bread in plenty and of better quality than he has ever seen before, and on holidays there is beef. Then there are alms and there is a chance of earning something. And the company? It consists of shrewd, crafty fellows who know everything, and he looks on his companions with respectful astonishment. He has never seen anyone like them before. He looks upon them as the very highest society in the world. Is the punishment equally felt in these two cases? But why trouble oneself with unanswerable questions? The drum beats. It is time to be back in our wards. Breaking in. The old believers were a religious group who split with the Russian Orthodox Church in the 17th century over its inclusion of Greek Orthodox practices in its rituals. They afterwards suffered persecution from the mainstream church. The fact that an honest, mild-mannered member from this group should feel compelled to burn down an Orthodox church for his faith is a testament to how deeply the convictions could run within the sect. The group is sometimes referred to as the Raskolniki, which means schismatics. That name might perk up the ears of those who have read Crime and Punishment. The protagonist of that novel similarly has a name that derives from the Russian word for schism. The figure of Sorotkin requires special mention. You might remember that the young man had no trade, but usually had some money. Where did that money come from? And why is he receiving new clothes as gifts? What are these taunts that are often sent his way? 
I mentioned at the end of the last chapter that Dostoevsky never explicitly mentions male prostitution, but his description of Tsurotkin here very subtly insinuates it. Sorotkin's story also includes a feature that will come up again in later chapters. While soldiering offered a promising career opportunity for young officers, for the peasant class it was often not much better than a prison sentence, and from Sorotkin's perspective was worse. His decision, combined with some comments our narrator offers at the end of this chapter, helped to explain the censor's concern that Dostoevsky's book might encourage crime. The state would not want others following Sorotkin's example. We hear in this chapter that Goryanchikov encountered a notorious criminal at Tobolsk. As noted in my introductory comments, Tobolsk was a stopping point on the road from European Russia to the prison camp and served as a sort of way station for these prison convoys. Dostoevsky will make frequent reference to this place in the pages ahead. We hear that Gazin was a Tatar. The Tatars were an ethnic group related to the Turks who lived in the south of Russia. Gazin is thus representing one of very many different ethnic groups in the camp. End of comments. Chapter 4 First Impressions The last roll call began. After this call over, the prison wards are locked up, each with its own lock, and the convicts remain shut up till daybreak. The roll was called by a sergeant and two soldiers. For this purpose, the convicts were sometimes drawn up in ranks in the yard, and the officer on duty was present. But more frequently, the ceremony was conducted in a more homely fashion. The roll was called indoors. This is how it was on that occasion. The men on duty made many mistakes, were wrong in their reckoning, went away and came back again. At last the poor fellows brought their sum out right and locked our prison room. In it there were as many as thirty convicts, rather closely packed on the bed. It was too early to go to sleep. Obviously everyone needed something to do. The only representative of authority in the room was the veteran soldier whom I have mentioned already. There was also in each room a head convict who was appointed by the major himself, on the grounds of good behavior, of course. It often happened that these head convicts were involved in some serious mischief. Then they were flogged, at once degraded and replaced by others. In our room the head convict was Akim Akimich, who to my surprise not infrequently shouted at other convicts. They usually responded with jeers. The veteran was wiser. He never interfered in any way, and if he ever did open his lips, it was no more than a matter of form to satisfy his conscience. He sat in silence on his bedstead sewing a boot. The convicts took hardly any notice of him. On that first day of my prison life I made one observation, and found as time went on that it was correct. All who are not convicts, whoever they are, from those who have the most contact with them, such as guards, soldiers on duty, down to all who have ever had any connection with prison life, have an exaggerated idea of convicts. It is as though they were every minute in uneasy expectation of the convicts suddenly flying at them with a knife. But what is most remarkable, the convicts were themselves aware that they were feared, and it gave them a certain conceit. And yet the very best man to look after convicts is one who is not afraid of them. And indeed, in spite of his conceit, the convict likes it much better when one trusts him. One may even win his affection by doing so. It happened, though very rarely during my life in prison, that some superior officer came into the prison without a guard. 
It was worth seeing how it impressed the convicts and impressed them in the most favorable way. Such a fearless visitor always aroused their respect, and if any harm had been possible, it would not have been so in his presence. The dread inspired by convicts is found everywhere where there are prisoners, and I really do not know to what exactly it is due. It has, of course, some foundation, even in the external appearance of the convict, who is, after all, an acknowledged malefactor. Besides, everyone who comes near the prison feels that all this mass of people has been brought together not of their own will, and that, whatever measures are taken, a live man cannot be made into a corpse. He will remain with his feelings, his thirst for revenge and life, his passions and the craving to satisfy them. At the same time, I am convinced that there is no need to fear convicts, a man does not so quickly or so easily fly at another with a knife. In fact, if there may be danger, if there is sometimes trouble, the rarity of such instances shows how trifling the risk is. I am speaking, of course, only of convicted prisoners, many of whom are glad to have reached the prison at last. A new life is sometimes such a good thing, and are consequently disposed to live quietly and peaceably. Moreover, the others will not let those who are really troublesome do mischief. Every convict, however bold and insolent he may be, is afraid of everything in prison. But a convict awaiting punishment is a different matter. He is certainly capable of falling on any outsider apropos of nothing, simply because he will have to face a flogging next day, and if he does anything to bring about another trial, his punishment will be delayed. Here there is an object, a motive for the attack. It is to change his luck at any cost and as quickly as possible. I know one strange psychological instance of the kind. In the military division in our prison there was a convict who had been a soldier, and had been sentenced for two years without deprivation of rights, an awful braggart and a conspicuous coward. As a rule, boastfulness and cowardice are rarely found in a Russian soldier. Our soldiers always seem so busy that if they wanted to show off they would not have time. But if one is a braggart, he is almost always an idler and a coward. Dutov, that was the convict's name, served out his sentence at last and returned to his line regiment. But as all, like him, sent to prison for correction are finally corrupted there, it usually happens that after they have been not more than two or three weeks in freedom, they are arrested again and come back to the prison, this time not for two or three years, but as a lifer for fifteen or twenty years, and so it happened with him. Three weeks after leaving the prison, Dutov stole something, breaking a lock to do so, and was insolent and unruly as well. He was tried and sentenced to a severe punishment. Reduced to the utmost terror by the punishment awaiting him, being a most pitiful coward, he fell knife in hand upon an officer who went into the convict's room, the day before he would have had to walk the Green Street. Of course he was well aware that by such an act he greatly increased his sentence and his term of penal servitude. But all he was reckoning on was putting off the terrible moment of punishment for a few days, even for a few hours. He was such a coward that he did not even wound the officer, but only attacked him as a matter of form that there might appear to be a new crime for which he would be tried again. The minute before punishment is certainly terrible for the condemned man, and in the course of several years it was my lot to see a good number of men on the eve of this fatal day. I usually came across these condemned prisoners in the convict ward of the hospital when I lay there ill, which happened pretty often. It is well known to all the convicts throughout Russia that the people most compassionate to them are doctors. They never make any distinction between convicts and other people, as almost all outsiders do, except perhaps the peasants. 
The latter never reproached the convict with his crime, however terrible it may have been, and forgive him everything on account of the punishment he has endured and his general misery. Significantly, the peasants all over Russia speak of crime as a misfortune, and of criminals as the unfortunate. It is a definition of deep import, and it is the more significant because it is unconscious, instinctive. The doctors are truly a refuge for the convicts in many cases, especially for those awaiting punishment, who are kept far more severely than the ordinary prisoners. The convict awaiting punishment, who has reckoned the probable date of the awful ordeal, often gets into hospital, trying to ward off the terrible moment, even by a little. When he is taking his discharge from the hospital, knowing almost for certain that the fatal hour will be next day, he is nearly always in a state of violent agitation. Some try from vanity to conceal their feelings, but their awkward show of swagger does not deceive their companions. Everyone understands how it is, but is silent from humane feeling. I knew a convict, a young man who had been a soldier, condemned for murder to the maximum number of strokes. He was so panic-stricken that on the eve of the punishment he drank off a jug of vodka in which he had previously soaked snuff. Vodka, by the way, is always taken just before the flogging. It is smuggled in long before the day, and a high price is paid for it. The convict would rather go without every necessity for six months than fail to have the money for a bottle of vodka to be drunk a quarter of an hour before the flogging. There is a general belief among the convicts that a drunken man feels the lash or the sticks less acutely. But I am wandering from my story. The poor fellow, after drinking his jug of vodka, was at once taken ill in earnest. He began vomiting blood, and he was carried to the hospital almost unconscious. The vomiting so affected his chest that in a few days he showed unmistakable signs of consumption, of which he died six months later. The doctors who treated him for tuberculosis did not know how it had been caused. But speaking of the cowardice so often found in the convict before punishment, I ought to add that some, on the contrary, astonish the observer by their extraordinary fearlessness. I remember some examples of courage which approached insensibility, and such examples were not so very rare. I particularly remember my meeting with a terrible criminal. One summer day a rumor spread in the hospital wards that a famous robber, a runaway soldier called Orlov, would be punished that evening, and would be afterwards brought to the ward. While the convict patients were expecting Orlov to be brought in, they asserted that he would be punished cruelly, they were all in some excitement, and I must confess that I, too, awaited the famous robber's arrival with extreme curiosity. I had heard marvelous stories about him long before. He was a criminal such as there are few who had murdered old people and children in cold blood, a man of a terrible strength of will and proud consciousness of his strength. He had confessed to many murders, and was sentenced to be beaten with sticks. It was evening before he was brought. It was dark, and the candles had been lighted in the ward. Orlov was almost unconscious, horribly pale, with thick, disheveled, pitch-black hair. His back was swollen and red and blue. The convicts were waiting on him all night, constantly bringing him water, turning him over, giving him medicines, as though they were looking after a brother or a benefactor. Next day he regained consciousness completely and walked twice up and down the ward. It amazed me. He had come into the hospital so very weak and exhausted. He had received at one time half of the whole number of blows to which he was sentenced. 
The doctor had only stopped the punishment when he saw that its continuance would inevitably cause his death. Moreover, Orlov was small and weakly built and exhausted by long imprisonment before his trial. Anyone who has met prisoners awaiting their trial probably remembers long after their thin, pale, worn-out faces, their feverish looks. But in spite of that, Orlov was recovering quickly. Evidently, the energy of his spirit assisted nature. He was certainly not an ordinary man. I was moved by curiosity to make a closer acquaintance with him, and for a week I studied him. I can confidently say that I have never in my life met a man of such strength, of so iron a will as he. I had already seen at Tobolsk a celebrity of the same kind, formerly a brigand chief. He was a wild beast in the fullest sense of the word, and when you stood near him you felt instinctively that there was a terrible creature beside you, even before you knew his name. But in that case what horrified me was the spiritual deadness of the man. The flesh had so completely got the upper hand of all spiritual characteristics that at the first glance you could see from his face that nothing was left but a fierce lust of physical gratification, sensuality, gluttony. I am convinced that Korenev, that was the brigand's name, would have been in a panic and trembling with fear before a flogging, although he could cut a man's throat without turning a hair. Orlov was a complete contrast to him. His was unmistakably the case of a triumph over the flesh. It was evident that the man's power of control was unlimited, that he despised every sort of punishment and torture, and was afraid of nothing in the world. We saw in him nothing but unbounded energy, a thirst for action, a thirst for vengeance, an eagerness to attain the object he had set before him. Among other things, I was struck by his strange haughtiness. He looked down on everything with incredible disdain, though he made no sort of effort to maintain this lofty attitude. It was somehow natural. I imagine there was no creature in the world who could have worked upon him simply by authority. He looked upon everything with surprising calmness, as though there were nothing in the universe that could astonish him, and though he quite saw that the other convicts looked on him with respect, he did not pose to them in the least. Yet vanity and self-assertion are characteristic of almost all convicts without exception. He was very intelligent and somehow strangely open, though by no means talkative. To my questions he answered frankly that he was only waiting to recover in order to get through the remainder of his punishment as quickly as possible, that he had been afraid beforehand that he would not survive it. But now, he added, winking at me, it's as good as over. I shall walk through the remainder of the blows and set off at once with the party to Nurchinsk. And on the way I'll escape. I shall certainly escape. If only my back would make haste and heal. And all those five days he was eagerly awaiting the moment when he could be discharged, and in the meantime was often laughing and merry. I tried to talk to him of his adventures. He frowned a little at such questions, but always answered openly. When he realized that I was trying to get at his conscience and to discover some sign of penitence in him, he glanced at me with great contempt and haughtiness, as though I had suddenly in his eyes become a foolish little boy, with whom it was impossible to discuss things as you would with a grown-up person. There was even a sort of pity for me to be seen in his face. A minute later he burst out laughing at me, a perfectly open-hearted laugh, free from any hint of irony, and I am sure that, recalling my words when he was alone, he laughed again to himself, many times over, perhaps. At last he got his discharge from hospital with his back hardly healed. I was discharged at the same time, and it happened that we came out of the hospital together, 
I going to the prison and he to the guardhouse near the prison where he had been detained before. As he said goodbye, he shook hands with me, and that was a sign of great confidence on his part. I believe he did it because he was much pleased with himself and glad that the moment had come. He could not really help despising me and must have looked upon me as a weak, pitiful, submissive creature, inferior to him in every respect. Next day he was let out for the second half of his punishment. When our prison room was shut, it suddenly assumed a special aspect, the aspect of a real dwelling place, of a home. It was only now that I could see the prisoners, my comrades, quite at home. In the daytime, the sergeants, the guards, and officials in general could make their appearance at any moment in the prison, and so all the inmates behaved somewhat differently, as though they were not quite at ease as though they were continually expecting something with some anxiety. But as soon as the room was shut up, they all quietly settled down in their places, and almost every one of them took up some handicraft. The room was suddenly lighted up. Everyone had his candle and his candlestick, generally made of wood. One worked at a boot, another sewed some garment. The foul atmosphere of the room grew worse from hour to hour. A group of festive souls squatted on their heels round a rug in a corner to a game of cards. In almost every prison room there was a convict who kept a threadbare rug a yard wide, a candle, and an incredibly dirty, greasy pack of cards. And all this together was called the Maidan. The owner of these articles let them to the players for fifteen kopecks a night. That was his trade. The players usually played three leaves, hillock, and such games. They always played for money. Each player heaped a pile of copper coins before him, all he had in his pocket, and only got up when he had lost every farthing or stripped his companions. The game went on till late in the night, sometimes lasting till daybreak, till the moment when the door was opened. In our room, as in all the other rooms of the prison, there were always a certain number of destitute convicts, who had lost all their money at cards or on vodka, or who were simply beggars by nature. I say by nature, and I lay special stress on this expression. Indeed, everywhere in Russia, in all surroundings and under all conditions, there always are and will be certain strange individuals, humble and not infrequently by no means lazy, whose destiny is to be destitute forever. They are always without family ties and always slovenly. They always look cowed and depressed about something, and are always at the beckoned call of someone usually a dissipity fellow or one who has suddenly grown rich and risen. And position of respect or anything calling for initiative is a burden and affliction to them. It seems as though they had been born on the understanding that they should begin nothing of themselves and only wait on others, that they should do not what they like, should dance while others pipe. Their vocation is only to carry out the will of others. And what is more, no circumstance, no change of luck can enrich them. They are always beggars. I have noticed that such individuals are to be found not only among the peasants, but in every class of society, in every party, in every association, and on the staff of every magazine. It is the same in every room, in every prison, and as soon as a game of cards is got up, such a beggar always turns up to wait on the party. And indeed, no card party can get on without an attendant. He was usually hired by all the players in common for five kopecks the night, and his chief duty was to stand all night in the passage in the dark, in thirty degrees of frost, listening to every knock, every clang, every step in the yard. But sometimes the major or the officers on duty visited the prison rather late at night, 
came in quietly and discovered the men at play and at work and the extra candles, which could indeed be seen from the yard. Anyway, when the key was grating in the lock of the door that led from the passage to the yard, it was too late to hide what they were doing, put out the lights, and go to bed. But as the attendant on duty caught it severely from the card players afterwards, cases of such neglect were extremely rare. Five kopecks, of course, is a ridiculously small sum, even for prison. But I was always struck in prison by the harshness and mercilessness of employers, in this and also in other cases. You've had your money, so do your work, was an argument that would bear no objection. For the trifle he had paid, the employer would take all he could take, take, if he could, more than was his due, and he considered that he was conferring a favor on the other into the bargain. The convict who was drunk and making merry, flinging his money right and left, always beats down his attendant, and I have noticed it not only in one prison, not only in one group of players. I have mentioned already that almost all in the room had settled down to some sort of work, Except the card players, there were not more than five people quite idle. They immediately went to bed. My place on the bed was next to the door. On the other side of the bed, his head nearly touching mine, lay Akim Akimich. Till ten or eleven he worked, making some sort of colored Chinese lantern, which had been ordered in the town for a fairly good price. He made lanterns in a masterly way and worked methodically without stopping. When he had finished his work, he put it away tidily, spread out his little mattress, said his prayers, and conscientiously went to bed. Conscientiousness and orderliness he carried apparently to the point of trivial pedantry. Evidently he must have considered himself an exceedingly clever person, as is usually the case with limited and dull-witted people. I did not like him from the first day, though I remember I thought a great deal about him that first day, and what surprised me most was that such a man should have got into the prison instead of making his way in the world. Later on I shall have to speak more than once of Akim Akimich. But I will briefly describe all the inmates of our room. I had many years to spend in it, and these were all my future comrades and associates. It may well be understood that I looked at them with eager curiosity. Next to me on the left were a group of mountaineers from the Caucasus who had been sent here to various terms of imprisonment, chiefly for robbery. There were two Lesgis, one Chechnyan, and three Dagestan Tatars. The Chechnyan was a gloomy and morose person. He hardly spoke to anyone, and was always looking about him from under his brows with hatred and a venomous, malignantly sneering smile. One of the Lesgis was an old man with a long, thin, hooked nose, a regular brigand in appearance. But the second... Nura made upon me from the first day a most charming and delightful impression. He was a man still young, of medium height, of Herculean build, with the face of a Finnish woman, quite flaxen hair, light blue eyes, and a snub nose. He had bandy legs from having spent all his previous life on horseback. His whole body was covered with scars, bayonet and bullet wounds. In the Caucasus he had belonged to an allied tribe, but was always riding over on the sly to the hostile mountaineers and making raids with them on the Russians. Everyone in prison liked him. He was always good-humored and cordial to everyone. He worked without grumbling and was calm and serene, though he often looked with anger at the filth and loathsomeness of prison life, and was furiously indignant at all the thieving, cheating, and drunkenness in fact, at everything that was dishonest. But he never picked a quarrel, he merely turned away with indignation. 
He had never during his prison life stolen anything himself or been guilty of any bad action. He was exceedingly devout. He religiously repeated his prayers. During the fasts before the Muhammadan holy days, he fasted fanatically and spent whole nights over his prayers. Everyone liked him and believed in his honesty. There is a lion, the convicts used to say, and the name Lion had stuck to him. He was firmly persuaded that on the expiration of his sentence he would be sent home to the Caucasus and only lived on the hope of it. I believe he would have died if he had been deprived of it. I got a vivid impression of him on my first day in prison. It was impossible to overlook his good, sympathetic face among the surly, ill-humored, and sneering faces of the other convicts. Within my first half hour in the prison, he slapped me on the shoulder as he passed by me and laughed good-naturedly in my face. I could not make out at first what this meant. He spoke Russian very badly. Soon afterwards he came up to me again and, smiling, gave me another friendly pat on the shoulder. He did it again and again, and so it went on for three days. It meant, as I guessed and found out later, that he was sorry for me, that he felt how hard it was for me to get used to prison, that he wanted to show his good will to me, to cheer me up and assure me of his protection. Kind, simple-hearted Nura. The Dagestan Tatars were three in number, and they were all brothers. Two of them were middle-aged men, but the third, Ale, was not more than two and twenty and looked even younger. His place on the bed was next to me. His handsome, open, intelligent, and at the same time good-naturedly simple face won my heart from the first minute. I was so thankful that fate had sent me him as a neighbor rather than any other. His whole soul was apparent in his handsome, one might even say beautiful, face. His smile was so confiding, so childishly trustful. His big black eyes were so soft, so caressing, that I always found a particular pleasure in looking at him, even a consolation in my misery and depression. I am not exaggerating. When he was in his native place, one of his elder brothers, he had five of them, two of the others had been sent to some sort of penal factory, ordered him to take his saber, to get on his horse and to go with them on some sort of expedition. The respect due to an elder brother is so great among the mountaineers that the boy did not dare ask, did not even dream of asking, where they were going and the others did not think it necessary to inform him. They were going out on a pillaging expedition to waylay and rob a rich Armenian merchant on the road. And so indeed they did. They killed the escort, murdered the Armenian, and carried off his goods. But the affair was discovered. All the six were caught, tried, convicted, punished, and sent to penal servitude in Siberia. The only mercy shown by the court to Ale was that he received a shorter sentence. He had been sent to Siberia for four years. His brothers were very fond of him, and their affection was more like a father's than a brother's. He was their comfort in exile, and sullen and gloomy as they usually were, they always smiled when they looked at him, and when they spoke to him, though they spoke to him very little, as though they still thought of him as a boy with whom it was useless to talk of serious things, their surly faces relaxed, and I guessed that they spoke to him of something humorous, almost childish. At least they always looked at one another and smiled good-humouredly after listening to his answer. He hardly dared to address them, so deep was his respect for them. It was hard to imagine how this boy was able during his prison life to preserve such a gentle heart, to develop such strict honesty, such warm feelings and charming manners, and to escape growing coarse and depraved. 
but his was a strong and steadfast nature in spite of all its apparent softness. As time went on, I got to know him well. He was pure as a chaste girl, and any ugly, cynical, dirty, unjust, or violent action in the prison brought a glow of indignation into his beautiful eyes, making them still more beautiful. But he avoided all strife and wrangling, though he was not one of those men who allow themselves to be insulted with impunity and knew how to stand up for himself. But he never had quarrels with anyone. Everyone liked him and was friendly to him. At first he was simply courteous to me. By degrees I began talking to him. In a few months he had learned to speak Russian very well, which his brothers never succeeded in doing all the time they were in Siberia. He seemed to me a boy of marked intelligence and peculiar modesty and delicacy, who had in fact reflected a good deal. I may as well say at once that I consider Ale far from being an ordinary person, and I look back upon my meeting with him as one of the happiest meetings in my life. There are natures so innately good, so richly endowed by God, that the very idea of their ever deteriorating seems impossible. One is always at ease about them. I am at ease about Ale to this day. Where is he now? One night, when I had been some time in prison, I was lying on the bed musing. Ale, always occupied and industrious, happened to be doing nothing at the moment, though it was early to go to bed. But it was their Mussulman holiday, and they were not working. He was lying down with his hands clasped behind his head, pondering on something, too, all at once he asked me, Are you very sad just now? I looked at him with curiosity, and it seemed strange to me to hear this rapid, direct question from Ale, always so delicate, so considerate, so full of the wisdom of the heart. But looking more intently, I saw in his face such sadness, such distress at some memory, that I felt at once that his own heart was heavy at that moment, and I told him so. He sighed and smiled mournfully. I loved his smile, which was always warm and tender. Besides, when he smiled he showed two rows of pearly teeth, which the greatest beauty in the world might have envied. Ah, Ale, no doubt you are thinking how they are keeping this holiday at home in Dagestan. It must be nice there. Yes, he answered enthusiastically, and his eyes shone. But how do you know I am thinking about it? How can I help knowing? It's better there than here, isn't it? Oh, why do you say that? What flowers there must be there now! What a paradise! Oh, better not talk of it. She was deeply stirred. Listen, Ale, had you a sister? Yes, but why? She must be a beauty if she is like you. Like me? She is such a beauty, there is no one in Dagestan handsomer. Ah, she is a beauty, my sister. You've never seen anyone like her. My mother was beautiful, too. Was your mother fond of you? Ah! Oh. What are you saying? She must have died of grieving over me by now. I was her favorite son. She loved me more than my sister, more than anyone. She came to me in my dreams last night and cried over me. He sank into silence and said nothing more that evening. But from that time forward he sought every opportunity to talk to me, though the respect which he had for some reason felt for me always prevented him from speaking first. But he was greatly delighted whenever I addressed him. I questioned him about the Caucasus, about his former life. His brothers did not hinder his talking to me. In fact, they seemed to like it. 
Seeing that I was getting fonder and fonder of Ale, they too became much more cordial to me. Ale helped me at work, did his utmost to be of service to me in the prison, and I could see that he was delighted when he could do anything to please me or make my life easier. And in his efforts to please me there was not a trace of anything cringing or self-seeking. Nothing but a warm, friendly feeling for me, which he no longer concealed. He had, moreover, a good deal of mechanical ability. He learnt to make underclothes fairly well, and to make boots and later on, as far as he could, to do carpentering. His brothers praised him and were proud of him. Listen, Ale, I said to him one day, why don't you learn to read and write Russian? It would be a great advantage to you in Siberia later on, you know. I should like to very much. But of whom can I learn? Lots of men here can read and write. But if you like, I'll teach you. Oh, please do. And he positively sat up on the bed and clasped his hands, looking at me imploringly. We set to work the next evening. I had the Russian translation of the New Testament, a book not prohibited in prison. With this book alone, and no alphabet, Ale learnt in a few weeks to read excellently. In three months he had completely mastered the language of the book. He learnt eagerly, with enthusiasm. One day we read together the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. I noticed that he seemed to read parts of it aloud with special feeling. I asked him if he liked what he had read. He glanced at me quickly, and the color came into his face. Oh, yes, he answered. Yes, Jesus is a holy prophet. Jesus speaks God's words. How good it is! What do you like best of all? Where he says, Forgive, love, don't hurt others, love even your enemies. Ah, oh, how well he speaks! He turned to his brothers who were listening to our conversation and began warmly saying something to them. They talked earnestly for a long time together and nodded their heads approvingly. Then, with a dignified and gracious, that is, a typically Mussulman smile, which I love so much and love especially for its dignity, they turned to me and repeated that Jesus was a prophet of God and that he worked great marvels, that he had made a bird out of clay, had breathed on it, and it had flown away, and that that was written in their books. They were convinced that in saying this they were giving me great pleasure by praising Jesus, and Ale was perfectly happy that his brothers had deigned and desired to give me this pleasure. The writing lessons, too, were very successful. Ale procured paper, he would not let me buy it with my money, pens and ink, and in about two months he had learnt to write an excellent hand. This actually impressed his brothers. Their pride and satisfaction knew no bounds. They did not know how to show their gratitude to me. If they happened to be working near me, they were continually helping me, and looked on it as a happiness to be able to. I need hardly say the name of Ale. He loved me perhaps as much as he loved his brothers. I shall never forget how he left prison. He drew me away behind the prison, flung himself on my neck, and cried. He had never before kissed me or shed tears. You've done so much for me, so much for me, he said that my father and my mother could not have done more. You have made a man of me. God will repay you, and I shall never forget you. Where is he now, my good, dear, dear Ale? Besides the Circassians, there was a group of Poles in our room, 
and they made a family apart and had hardly anything to do with the other convicts. I have mentioned already that their exclusiveness and their hatred of the Russian prisoners made them hated by everyone. There were six of them. They were men broken and made morbid by suffering. Some of them were educated men. I will speak of them more fully afterwards. During my later years in prison I used sometimes to get books from them. The first book I read made a great, strange, and peculiar impression upon me. I will speak of these impressions more particularly later. They were most interesting to me, and I am sure that to many people they would be utterly unintelligible. Some things one cannot judge without experience. One thing I can say, that moral privation is harder to bear than any physical agonies. When a peasant goes to prison, he finds there the company of his equals, perhaps even of his superiors. He has lost a great deal, of course. Home, family, everything. But his environment is the same. The educated man, condemned to the same punishment, often loses infinitely more. He must overcome all his cravings, all his habits, live under conditions that are insufficient for him, must learn to breathe a different air. He is a fish out of water. And often a punishment supposed to be equal in law is ten times as cruel for him. This is the truth, even if we consider only the material habits which have to be sacrificed. But the Poles formed a group apart. There were six of them, and they kept together. The only other person they liked in our room was a Jew, and him they liked perhaps simply because he amused them. He was liked indeed by the other convicts too, though every one without exception laughed at him. He was the only Jew among us, and I can't think of him even now without laughing. Every time I looked at him I could not help recalling Gogol's Jew, Yankel, in Taras Bulba, who, when he undressed at night and prepared to get into the cupboard where he slept with his wife, looked exactly like a chicken. Isai Fomich, our Jew, was the very image of a plucked chicken. He was a man about fifty, short and weakly built, cunning and at the same time decidedly stupid. He was impudent and conceited, and at the same time awfully cowardly. He was covered all over with wrinkles, and on his forehead and each cheek bore the marks of having been branded on the scaffold. I could never understand how he had survived sixty lashes. He had been sent here charged with murder. He had hidden away a receipt which his friends had procured from a doctor immediately after his punishment. It was the receipt for an ointment supposed to remove all traces of branding in a fortnight. He dare not make use of this ointment in the prison, and was awaiting the end of his twelve years' term of imprisonment, after which he fully intended to take advantage of the receipt when he could live as a settler. "'Else I shall never be able to get married,' he said to me once, "'and I certainly want to be married.' We were great friends. He was always in excellent spirits. He had not a bad time in prison. He was a jeweler by trade, always had more than enough work from the town, in which there was no jeweler, and so escaped hard labor. Of course he was a pawnbroker at the same time, and supplied the whole prison with money at a percentage and on security. He had come to the prison before me, and one of the Poles gave me a minute description of his arrival. It is a most amusing story which I will tell later on. I shall speak of Isai Fomich more than once again. Among the other prisoners in our room were four old believers, elderly men and great Bible readers, one of whom was the old fellow from the Starodubovsky settlement. Then there were two or three little Russians, gloomy fellows. A young convict of three and twenty, with a lean little face and a sharp little nose, who had already committed eight murders. 
a group of false coiners, one of whom kept all the room amused, and finally several gloomy and sullen individuals, shaven and hideous, taciturn and envious, who looked with hatred about them and meant to look like that, to scowl, to be silent and full of hatred for long years to come, the whole term of their imprisonment. Of all this I had only a glimpse on that first desolate evening of my new life, a glimpse in the midst of smoke and filth, of oaths and indescribable obscenity, of foul air, of clanking fetters, of curses and shameless laughter. I lay down on the bare boards of the bed, and putting my clothes under my head, I had not a pillow yet, covered myself with my sheepskin, but for a long while I could not get to sleep, though I was utterly worn out and shattered by all the monstrous, unexpected impressions of that first day. But my new life was only just beginning. There was much awaiting me in the future of which I had never dreamed, of which I had no foreboding. Breaking in the Leskis, the Chechnyan, and the Dagestan Tatars are all treated here as representatives of the broader Circassian group from the Caucasus that Akim Akimich mentioned two chapters earlier. We should expect that most of them would be practicing Muslims, or Muslimen, as it is put here, and so Ale's reaction to the New Testament is noteworthy. The story of Jesus giving life to clay birds does indeed appear in the Quran, as well as in a non-canonical Christian source, the infancy gospel of Thomas. Taras Bulba is an early novella by Nikolai Gogol, and his fictional character Yankel is a walking collection of anti-Semitic stereotypes. Since Isai Fomich apparently really did exemplify some of these stereotypes, it is a bit harder to accuse Dostoevsky of anti-Semitism, although perhaps modern readers will shift uncomfortably at his depiction, both here and in later passages. When our narrator mentions little Russians, he is not talking about Russians of small stature. He is referring to people from the region we now call Ukraine, this expression will pop up again in later pages. The Polish prisoners are of thematic importance, and we will come back to them later. We won't hear much more of the bandit Orlov, although his interaction with our narrator is of particular interest, and I'll address it in my closing remarks. End of comments. Chapter 5 The First Month Three days after my arrival in prison, I was ordered to go out to work. That first day of work is very distinct in my memory, though nothing very unusual happened to me in the course of it, except in so far as my position was in itself unusual. But it was still one of my first impressions and I still looked eagerly at everything. I had spent those three days in the greatest depression. This is the end of my wanderings. I am in prison, I was continually repeating to myself. This is to be my haven for many long years, my niche which I enter with such a mistrustful, such a painful sensation. And who knows? Maybe when I come to leave it many years hence I may regret it, I added, not without an element of that malignant pleasure which at times is almost a craving to tear open one's wound on purpose, as though one desired to revel in one's pain, as though the consciousness of one's misery was an actual enjoyment. The idea of ever regretting this whole struck me with horror. I felt even then how monstrously a man may get used to things. But that was all in the future, and meantime everything about me was hostile and terrible, for though not everything was really so, it seemed so to me. 
The savage curiosity with which my new comrades, the convicts, stared at me, the extra surliness of their behavior towards the new member of their community, who had been a gentleman, a surliness which sometimes reached the point of active hatred. All this so tortured me that I was eager to begin work, so as to find out and test all my sufferings as soon as possible, to begin living like all the rest, so as to get into the same rut with all the others without delay. Of course there was a great deal I did not notice then. I had no suspicion of things that were going on in front of me. I did not divine the presence of consolation in the midst of all that was hostile. Yet the few kind and friendly faces I had come across in the course of those three days helped to give me courage. The kindest and friendliest of all was Akim Akimich. And among the faces of other convicts that were sullen and full of hatred, I could not help noticing some kind and good-natured ones. There are bad people everywhere, and good ones among the bad, I hastened to console myself by reflecting. And who knows, these people are perhaps by no means so much worse than the remainder who have remained outside the prison. Even as I thought this, I shook my head at the idea. And yet, my God, if I had only known at the time how true that thought was! Here, for instance, was a man whom I only came to understand fully in the course of many, many years, and yet he was with me and continually near me almost all the time I was in prison. This was the convict Sushilov. As soon as I begin to speak of prisoners being no worse than other men, I involuntarily recall him. He used to wait on me. I had another attendant, too. From the very beginning, Akim Akimich recommended me one of the convicts called Osip, telling me that for thirty kopecks a month he would cook my food for me every day if I so disliked the prison fare and had the money to get food for myself. Osip was one of the four cooks elected by the convicts for our two kitchens. They were, however, quite free to accept or refuse the appointment, and could throw it up at any moment. The cooks did not go out to work, and their duties were confined to baking bread and preparing soup. They were not called povars, that is, male cooks, but striapki, that is, female cooks, not as a sign of contempt for them, for sensible and as far as might be honest convicts were chosen for the kitchen, but just as an amiable pleasantry which our cooks did not resent in the slightest. Osip was, as a rule, elected, and for several years in succession he was almost always cook, and only threw up the job occasionally for a time, when he was overcome with violent melancholy and a craving for smuggling in vodka. He was a man of rare honesty and gentleness, though he was in prison for smuggling. He was the tall, sturdy smuggler I have mentioned already. He was afraid of everything, especially of a flogging, was friendly to everyone, very meek and mild. He never quarreled, yet he had such a passion for smuggling that he could not resist bringing in vodka in spite of his cowardice. Like the other cooks, he carried on a trade in vodka, though, of course, not on the same scale as Gazin, for instance, because he had not the courage to risk much. I always got on capitally with Osip. As for providing one's food, the cost was trifling. I am not far wrong if I say that I hardly spent more than a rouble a month on my board, always excluding bread, which was part of the prison fare, and occasionally soup, which I took if I were very hungry in spite of the disgust it inspired, though that too passed off almost completely in time. Usually I bought a pound of beef a day, and in winter a pound cost a halfpenny. One of the old veterans, of whom there was one in each room to keep order, used to go to the market to buy beef. These veterans voluntarily undertook to go to market every day to buy things for the prisoners, and charged the merest trifle, next to nothing for doing so. They did this for the sake of their own peace and comfort, 
for they could hardly have existed in the prison if they had refused. In this way they brought in tobacco, tea and bricks, beef, fancy bread, and so on. Everything, in fact, but vodka. They were not asked to bring in vodka, though they were sometimes regaled with it. For years together Osip roasted me a piece of beef, always the same cut. But how it was roasted is another question, and indeed is not what mattered. It is a remarkable fact that for several years I hardly exchanged two words with Osip. Several times I tried to talk to him, but he was incapable of keeping up a conversation. He would smile or answer yes or no, and that was all. It was strange to see this Hercules who was like a child of seven. Another convict who helped me was Sushilov. I did not ask for his services nor seek them. He found me out and placed himself at my disposal of his own accord. I don't remember when or how it happened. He did my washing. There was a large hole for emptying the water at the back of the prison, made on purpose. The washing troughs stood above this hole, and the convict's clothes were washed there. Sushilov invented a thousand different little duties to please me. He got my tea ready, ran all sorts of errands, took my jacket to be mended, greased my boots four times a month. All this he did eagerly, fussily, as though no one knew what duties he was overwhelmed with. In fact, he completely threw in his lot with mine and took all my business on himself. He would never say, for instance, You have so many shirts, your jacket is torn, and so on, but always, We have so many shirts now, our jacket is torn. He watched me to forestall every want and seemed to make it the chief object of his life. He had no trade, and I think he earned nothing except from me. I paid him what I could, that is in halfpence, and he was always meekly satisfied. He could not help serving someone, and pitched upon me, I fancy, as being more considerate than others and more honest in paying. He was one of those men who could never grow rich and get on, and who undertook to act as sentry for card players, standing all night in the freezing cold passage listening to every sound in the yard on the alert for the major. They charged five farthings for spending almost the whole night in this way, while well, if they blundered they lost everything and had to pay for it with a beating. I have mentioned them already. It is the leading characteristic of such men to efface their personality always, everywhere, and before almost everyone, and to play not even a secondary but a tertiary part in everything done in common. All this is innate in them. Sushilov was a very pitiful fellow, utterly spiritless and humbled, hopelessly downtrodden, though no one used to ill-treat him, but he was downtrodden by nature. I always for some reason felt sorry for him. I could not look at him without feeling so, but why I was sorry for him I could not have said myself. I could not talk to him either. He, too, was no good at conversation, and it was evidently a great labor to him. He only recovered his spirits when I ended the conversation by giving him something to do, asking him to go somewhere or to run some errand. I was convinced at last that I was bestowing a pleasure upon him by doing so. He was neither tall nor short, neither good-looking nor ugly, neither stupid nor clever, somewhat pockmarked and rather light-haired. One could never say anything quite definite about him. Only one other point. He belonged, I believe, as far as I could guess, to the same section as Sorotkin, and belonged to it simply through his submissiveness and spiritlessness. The convict sometimes jeered at him, chiefly because he had exchanged on the way to Siberia, and had exchanged for the sake of a red shirt and a ruble. It was because of the smallness of the price for which he had sold himself that the convicts jeered at him. To exchange meant to change names and consequently sentences with someone else. 
Strange as it seems, this was actually done, and in my day the practice flourished among convicts on the road to Siberia, was consecrated by tradition, and defined by certain formalities. At first I could not believe it, but I was convinced at last by seeing it with my own eyes. This is how it is done. A party of convicts is being taken to Siberia. There are some of all sorts, going to penal servitude, to penal factories, or to a settlement. They travel together. Somewhere on the road, in the province of Perm, for instance, some convict wants to exchange with another. Some Mihailov, for instance, a convict sentenced for murder or some other serious crime, feels the prospect of many years' penal servitude unattractive. Let us suppose he is a crafty fellow who has knocked about and knows what he is doing. So he tries to find someone of the same party who is rather simple, rather downtrodden and submissive, and whose sentence is comparatively light, exiled to a settlement or to a few years in a penal factory, or even to penal servitude but for a short period. At last he finds a Sushilov. Sushilov is a serf who is simply being sent out to a settlement. He has marched fifteen hundred miles without a farthing in his pocket, for Sushilov, of course, never could have a farthing. Exhausted, weary, tasting nothing but the prison food, without even a chance morsel of anything good, wearing the prison clothes, and waiting upon everyone for a pitiful copper. Mihailov accosts Sushilov, gets to know him, even makes friends with him, and at last, at some etap, gives him vodka. Finally, he suggests to him, would not he like to exchange? He says his name is Mihailov, and tells him this and that, says he is going to prison, that is, not to prison, but to a special division. Though it is prison, it is special, therefore rather better. Lots of people, even in the government in Petersburg, for instance, never heard of the special division all the time it existed. It was a special, peculiar little class in one of the remote parts of Siberia, and there were so few in it, in my time not more than seventy, that it was not easy to get to hear of it. I met people afterwards who had served in Siberia and knew it well, who yet heard for the first time of the special division from me. In the legal code there are six lines about it. Quote, there shall be instituted in such and such a prison of special division for the worst criminals until the opening of works involving harder labor in Siberia. Unquote. Even the convicts of this division did not know whether it was a permanent or a temporary institution. No time limit was mentioned. All that was said was, until the opening of works involving harder labor, so it was meant for convicts who were in for life. It is no wonder that Sushilov and the rest of his party knew nothing about it, even including Mikhailov, who could only form an idea of the special division from the gravity of his crime, for which he had already received three or four thousand blows. He might well conclude they were not sending him to anything very nice. Sushilov was on his way to a settlement. Could anything be better? Wouldn't you like to exchange? Sushilov, a simple-hearted soul, a little tipsy and overwhelmed with gratitude to Mihailov for being kind to him, does not venture to refuse. Besides, he has heard already from the others that exchanges are possible, that other people have exchanged, so that there is nothing exceptional or unheard of about it. They come to an agreement. The shameless Mihailov, taking advantage of Sushilov's extraordinary simplicity, buys his name for a red shirt and a silver rouble, which he gives him on the spot before witnesses. Next day, Sushilov is no longer drunk, but he is given drink again. Besides, it is a mean thing to go back on a bargain. The rouble he has taken has gone on drink, and the red shirt quickly follows it. If he won't keep his bargain, he must give back the money. And where is Sushilov to get a whole silver rouble? 
and if he does not repay it, the gang will make him. That's a point they are strict about. Besides, if he has made a promise, he must keep it. The gang will insist on that too, or else they will devour him. They will beat him, perhaps, or simply kill him. In any case, they will threaten to. Indeed, if the gang were once to be indulgent in such a matter, the practice of changing names would be at an end. If it were possible to go back on a promise and break a bargain after taking money, who would ever keep it afterwards? This, in fact, is a question that concerns the gang, concerns all, and therefore the gang is very stern about it. At last Sushilov sees that there is no begging off it and makes up his mind to agree without protest. It is announced to the whole gang, and other people are bribed with drink and money if necessary. It is just the same to them, of course, whether Mikhailov or Sushilov goes to the devil, but vodka has been drunk, they have been treated, so they hold their tongues. At the next etap, the roll is called, when Mikhailov's name is called, Sushilov answers, Here. When Sushilov's is called, Mikhailov shouts, Here. And they go on their way. Nothing more is said about it. At Tobolsk, the convicts are sorted. Mikhailov is sent to a settlement, and Sushilov is conducted with extra guards to the special division. Protest later is impossible. And after all, how could he prove it? How many years would an inquiry into such a case take? Might he not come in for something else? Where are his witnesses? If he had them, they would deny it. So the upshot of it is that for a red shirt and a ruble, Sushilov is sent to the special division. The convicts laughed at Sushilov not because he had exchanged, though they feel contempt for all who exchange a lighter sentence for a heavier one, as they do for all fools who have been duped. But because he had done it for a red shirt and a ruble, too trivial a price. Convicts usually receive large sums, relatively speaking, for exchanging. They sometimes charge dozens of rubles. But Sushilov was so submissive, such a non-entity, so paltry in the eyes of all, that he was not even worth laughing at. I got on very well with Sushilov for several years. By degrees he became extremely devoted to me. I could not help noticing it, so that I became quite attached to him, too. But one day he did not do something I had asked him, though I had just given him some money, and I can never forgive myself for it. I had the cruelty to say to him, well, Sushilov, you take the money, but you don't do your work. He said nothing, ran to do the job, but became suddenly depressed. Two days passed. I thought to myself, surely it can't be on account of what I said. I knew that one of the convicts called Anton Vasiliev was worrying him very persistently about a trifling debt. Probably he has no money and is afraid to ask me. On the third day I said to him, Sushilov, I think you wanted to ask me for the money to pay Anton Vasiliev. Take it. I was sitting on the bed at the time. Sushilov was standing before me. He seemed greatly impressed at my offering him the money, at my thinking of his difficult position of my own accord, especially as he had, in his own opinion, been paid too much by me of late, so that he had not dared to hope that I would give him more. He looked at the money, then at me, suddenly turned away and went out. All this surprised me very much. I followed him and found him behind the prison. He was standing facing the fence with his head bent down and his elbow leaning on the fence. Sushilov, what is it? I asked him. He did not look at me, and I noticed to my great amazement that he was on the point of tears. Alexander Petrovitch, you think... He began in a breaking voice, trying to look away. 
that I do for you, for money, but I... <sighs> then he turned to the fence again, even striking his forehead against it, and broke into sobs. It was the first time I had seen a man crying in prison. With great effort I comforted him, and though after that he began to serve me and look after me more zealously than ever, if possible, yet from certain hardly perceptible signs I perceived that his heart could never forgive me that reproach. And yet other people laughed at him, nagged at him on every occasion, and sometimes abused him violently. And he was on amiable and even friendly terms with them, and never took offense. Yes, indeed, it is very hard to understand a man, even after long years. That is why I could not see the prisoners at first as they really were, and as they seemed to me later. That is why I said that, though I looked at everything with eager and concentrated attention, I could not discern a great deal that was just before my eyes. It was natural that I was struck at first by the most remarkable and prominent facts, but even these I probably saw incorrectly, and all that was left by them was an oppressive, hopelessly melancholy sensation, which was greatly confirmed by my meeting with A., a convict who had reached the prison not long before me, and who made a particularly painful impression upon me during the first days I was in prison. I knew, however, before I reached the prison, that I should meet A there. He poisoned that first terrible time for me and increased my mental sufferings. I cannot avoid speaking about him. He was the most revolting example of the depths to which a man can sink and degenerate, and the extent to which he can destroy all moral feeling in himself without difficulty or repentance. A was that young man of good family of whom I have mentioned already that he reported to the major everything that took place in the prison, and was friendly with his orderly Fedka. Here is a brief account of his story. After quarreling with his Moscow relations, who were horrified by his vicious conduct, he arrived in Petersburg without finishing his studies, and to get money he gave information to the police in a very base way that is, sold the lives of a dozen men for the immediate gratification of his insatiable lust for the coarsest and most depraved pleasures. Lured by the temptations of Petersburg and its taverns, he became so addicted to his vices that, though he was by no means a fool, he ventured on a mad and senseless enterprise. He was soon detected. In his information to the police, he had implicated innocent people and deceived others, and it was for this that he was sent for ten years to Siberia to our prison. He was still quite young. Life was only beginning for him. One would have thought such a terrible change in his fate must have made a great impression on his nature, would have called forth all his powers of resistance and have caused a complete transformation in him. But he accepted his new life without the slightest perturbation, without the slightest aversion indeed. He was not morally revolted by it, nor frightened by anything except the necessity of working, and the loss of the taverns and other attractions of Petersburg. It actually seemed to him that his position as a convict set him free to commit even more scoundrelly and revolting actions. If one is a convict, one may as well be one. If one is a convict, one may do nasty things, and it's no shame to. That was literally his opinion. I think of this disgusting creature as a phenomenon. I spent several years among murderers, profligates, and thoroughgoing scoundrels, but I can positively say that I never in my life met such an utter moral downfall, such complete depravity, and such insolent baseness, as in A. There was amongst us a parasite of good family. I have mentioned him already, but I became convinced from many traits and incidents that even he was incomparably nobler and more humane than A. 
all the while I was in prison, A seemed to me a lump of flesh with teeth and a stomach and an insatiable thirst for the most sensual and brutish pleasures. And to satisfy the most trifling and capricious of his desires, he was capable of the most cold-blooded murder, in fact of anything, if only the crime could be concealed. I am not exaggerating. I got to know A well. He was an example of what a man can come to when the physical side is unrestrained by any inner standard, any principle. And how revolting it was to me to look on his everlasting mocking smile. He was a monster, a moral Quasimodo. Add to that that he was cunning and clever, good-looking, even rather well-educated and had abilities. Yes, such a man is a worse plague in society than fire, flood, and famine. I have said already that there was such general depravity in prison that spying and treachery flourished, and the convicts were not angry at it. On the contrary, they were all very friendly with they, and behaved far more amiably to him than to us. The favor in which he stood with our drunken major gave him importance and weight among them. Meanwhile, he made the major believe that he could paint portraits. He had made the convicts believe that he had been a lieutenant in the guards. And the major insisted on A's being sent to work in his house, to paint the major's portrait, of course. Here he made friends with the major's orderly, Fedka, who had an extraordinary influence over his master, and consequently over everything and everybody in the prison. A played the spy amongst us to meet the major's requirements, and when the latter hit A in the face in his fits of drunkenness, he used to abuse him as being a spy and a traitor. It happened sometimes, pretty often in fact, that the major would sit down and command A to go on with his portrait immediately after beating him. Our major seemed really to believe that A was a remarkable artist, almost on a level with Brulov, of whom even he had heard. At the same time, he felt himself quite entitled to slap him in the face, feeling probably that, though he was a great artist, he was now a convict, and had he been ten times Brulov, the major was still his superior, and therefore could do what he liked with him. Among other things, he made A take off his boots for him and empty his slops, and yet for a long time he could not get over the idea that A was a great artist. The portrait lingered on endlessly, almost for a year. At last the Major realized that he was being duped, and becoming convinced that the portrait never would be finished, but on the contrary became less and less like him every day, he flew into a rage, gave the artist a thrashing, and sent him to hard labor in the prison as a punishment. A evidently regretted this and felt bitterly the loss of his idle days, his titbits from the major's table, the company of his friend Fedka and all the enjoyments that Fedka and he contrived for themselves in the major's kitchen. At any rate, after getting rid of A, the major gave up persecuting M, a convict whom A was always slandering to the major. At the time of A's arrival, M was the only political in the prison. He was very miserable, had nothing in common with the other convicts, looked upon them with horror and loathing, failed to observe what might have reconciled him to them, and did not get on with them. They repaid him with the same hatred. The position of people like M in prison is awful as a rule. M knew nothing of the crime that had brought A to prison. On the contrary, seeing the sort of man he had to do with, A at once assured him that he was being punished for the very opposite of treachery, almost the same thing, in fact, as a charge for which M was suffering. The latter was greatly delighted at having a comrade, a friend. She waited upon him, comforted him in the first days of prison, imagining that he must be in great distress, gave him his last penny, fed him, and shared the most necessary things with him. 
but A conceived a hatred for him at once, just because he was a fine man, just because he looked with horror on anything mean, because he was utterly unlike himself. And all that M told A about the major and the prison, A hastened at the first opportunity to report to the major. The major took an intense dislike to M in consequence and persecuted him. Had it not been for the governor of the prison, it would have ended in a tragedy. A was not in the least disconcerted when M found out later on how base he had been. On the contrary, he liked meeting him and looked at him ironically. It evidently gave him gratification. M himself pointed this out to me several times. This abject creature afterwards ran away from the prison with another convict and a guard, but that escape I will describe later. At first he made up to me, thinking I had heard nothing of his story. I repeat, he poisoned my first days in prison and made them even more miserable. I was terrified at the awful baseness and degradation into which I had been cast and in the midst of which I found myself. I imagined that everything here was as base and as degraded. But I was mistaken. I judged of all by A. I spent those three days wandering miserably about the prison and lying on the bed. I gave the stuff that was served out to me to a trustworthy convict recommended to me by Akim Akimich, and asked him to make it into shirts, for payment, of course, a few halfpence a shirt. I provided myself at Akim Akimich's urgent advice with a folding mattress made of felt encased in linen, but as thin as a pancake, and also got a pillow stuffed with wool, terribly hard till one was used to it. Akim Akimich was quite in a bustle arranging all these things for me, and helped to get them himself. With his own hands he made me a quilt out of rags of old cloth cut out of discarded jackets and trousers, which I bought from other convicts. The prison clothes become the property of the prisoner when they are worn out. They are at once sold on the spot in the prison, and however ancient a garment might be, there was always a hope of getting something for it. I was much surprised at first by all this. It was practically my first contact with men of the peasant class. I had suddenly become a man of the same humble class, a convict like the rest. Their habits, ideas, opinions, customs, became, as it were, also mine, externally, legally anyway, though I did not share them really. I was surprised and confused, as though I had heard nothing of all this and had not suspected its existence. Yet I had heard of it and knew of it. But the reality makes quite a different impression from what one hears and knows. I could, for instance, never have suspected that such things, such old rags, could be looked upon as objects of value. Yet it was of these rags that I made myself a quilt. It was hard to imagine such cloth as was served out for the convict's clothing. It looked like thick cloth such as is used in the army, but after very little wearing it became like a sieve and tore shockingly. Cloth garments were, however, only expected to last a year. Yet it was hard to make them do service for so long. The convict has to work, to carry heavy weights. His clothes quickly wear out and go into holes. The sheepskin coats are supposed to last three years, and they were used for that time as coats by day, and both under blanket and covering at night. But a sheepskin coat is strong, though it was not unusual to see a convict at the end of the third year in a sheepskin patched with plain hempen cloth. Yet even very shabby ones were sold for as much as forty kopecks at the end of the three years. Some in better preservation even fetched as much as sixty or seventy, and that was a large sum in prison. Money, as I have mentioned already, was of vast and overwhelming importance in prison. One may say for a positive fact that the sufferings of a convict who had money, 
however little, were not a tenth of what were endured by one who had none, though the latter too had everything provided by government, and so, as the prison authorities argue, could have no need of money. I repeat again, if the prisoners had been deprived of all possibility of having money of their own, they would either have gone out of their minds or have died off like flies, in spite of being provided with everything, or would have resorted to incredible violence, some from misery, others in order to be put to death and end it all as soon as possible, or anyway to change their luck, the technical expression. If, after earning his money with cruel effort, or making use of extraordinary cunning, often in conjunction with theft and cheating, the convict wastes what he has earned so carelessly, with such childish senselessness, it does not prove that he does not appreciate it, though it might seem so at the first glance. The convict is morbidly, insanely greedy of money, and if he throws it away like so much rubbish, he throws it away on what he considers of even more value. What is more precious than money for the convict? Freedom, or some sort of dream of freedom. The prisoner is a great dreamer. I shall have something to say of this later, but while we are on the subject, would it be believed that I have known convicts sentenced for twenty years, who, speaking to me, have quite calmly used such phrases as, you wait a bit. When, please God, my term is up, then I'll... The word convict means nothing else but a man with no will of his own, and in spending money he is showing a will of his own. In spite of brands, fetters, and the hateful prison fence which shuts him off from God's world and cages him in like a wild beast, he is able to obtain vodka, an article prohibited under terrible penalties, to get at women, even sometimes, though not always, to bribe the veterans and even the sergeants, who will wink at his breaches of law and discipline. He can play the swaggering bully over them into the bargain, and the convict is awfully fond of bullying, that is, pretending to his companions and even persuading himself, if only for a time, that he has infinitely more power and freedom than is supposed. He can, in fact, carouse and make an uproar, crush and insult others, and prove to them that he can do all this, that it is all in his own hands, that is, he can persuade himself of what is utterly out of the question for the poor fellow. That, by the way, is perhaps why one detects in all convicts, even when sober, a propensity to swagger, to boastfulness, to a comic and very naive, though fantastic, glorification of their personality. Moreover, all this disorderliness has its special risk, so it all has a semblance of life, and at least a far-off semblance of freedom. And what will one not give for freedom? What millionaire would not give all his millions for one breath of air if his neck were in the noose? The prison authorities are sometimes surprised that after leading a quiet, exemplary life for some years, and even being made a foreman for his model behavior, a convict with no apparent reason suddenly breaks out as though he were possessed by a devil, plays pranks, drinks, makes an uproar, and sometimes positively ventures on serious crimes, such as open disrespect to a superior officer, or even commits murder or rape. They look at him and marvel. And all the while, possibly the cause of this sudden outbreak, and the man from whom one would least have expected it, is simply the poignant, hysterical craving for self-expression, the unconscious yearning for himself, the desire to assert himself, to assert his crushed personality, a desire which suddenly takes possession of him and reaches the pitch of fury, of spite, of mental aberration, of fits and nervous convulsions. So perhaps a man buried alive and awakening in his coffin might beat upon its lid and struggle to fling it off, though of course reason might convince him that all his efforts would be useless. 
But the trouble is that it is not a question of reason. It is a question of nerves. We must take into consideration also that almost every expression of personality on the part of a convict is looked upon as a crime, and so it makes no difference whether it is a small offense or a great one. If he is to drink, he may as well do it thoroughly. If he is to venture on anything, he may as well venture on everything, even on a murder. And the only effort is to begin. As he goes on, the man gets intoxicated and there is no holding him back. And so it would be better in every way not to drive him to that point. It would make things easier for everyone. Yes, but how is it to be done? Breaking in While I am far from certain about this, when our narrator says that Sushilov belonged to the same division as Sorotkin, due to his submissiveness and spiritlessness, he may have more than one meaning in mind. On the one hand, his submissiveness led him to become a convict of the dreaded special division to which Sorotkin belongs. But there may be a veiled comment here about sexual orientation as well, which could potentially lie behind the jeers that Sushilov receives from other convicts. Quasimodo is the name of the famous Hunchback of Notre Dame from Hugo's novel. The point of Goryanchikov's application of this moniker is that A is morally deformed. Karl Brulov was one of the most famous Russian painters of the early 19th century who was well known for his portraits. The major was apparently disappointed to discover that A's acumen with the brush fell well short of Brulov's. A is among the more significant figures in the book simply for the impact he had upon the author. Similarly, the musings in the last few paragraphs of this chapter are very important thematically. I'll have occasion to address both later. End of comments. Chapter 6 The First Month I had a little money when I entered the prison. I carried only very little on me for fear it should be taken away, but as a last resource I had several roubles hidden in the binding of a New Testament, a book which one is allowed to have in prison. This book, together with the money hidden in the binding, was given me in Tobolsk by men who were exiles too, who could reckon their years of banishment by decades, and had long been accustomed to look at every unfortunate as a brother. There are in Siberia, and practically always have been, some people who seem to make it the object of their lives to look after the unfortunate, to show pure and disinterested sympathy and compassion for them, as though they were their own children. I must briefly mention here one encounter I had. In the town where our prison was there lived a lady, a widow called Nastasia Ivanovna. Of course, none of us could make her acquaintance while we were in prison. She seemed to devote her life to the relief of convicts, but was especially active in helping us. Whether it was that she had had some similar trouble in her family, or that someone particularly near and dear to her had suffered for a similar offense, anyway, she seemed to consider it a particular happiness to do all that she could for us. She could not do much, of course. She was poor. But we in prison felt that out there, beyond the prison walls, we had a devoted friend. She often sent us news of which we were in great need. When I left prison and was on my way to another town, I went to see her and made her acquaintance. She lived on the outskirts of the town in the house of a near relation. She was neither old nor young neither good-looking nor plain. It was impossible to tell even whether she were intelligent or educated. 
All that one could see in her was an infinite kindliness, an irresistible desire to please one, to comfort one, to do something nice for one. All that could be read in her kind, gentle eyes. Together with the comrade who had been in prison with me, I spent almost a whole evening in her company. She was eager to anticipate our wishes, laughed when we laughed, was in haste to agree with anything we said, and was all anxiety to regale us with all she had to offer. Tea was served with savouries and sweetmeats, and it seemed that if she had had thousands she would have been delighted, simply because she could do more for us and for our comrades in prison. When we said goodbye, she brought out a cigarette case as a keepsake for each of us. She had made these cigarette cases of cardboard for us, and how they were put together, and had covered them with colored paper, such as is used for covering arithmetic books for children in schools, and possibly some such school book had been sacrificed for the covering. Both the cigarette cases were adorned with an edging of gilt paper, which she had bought, perhaps, expressly for them. "'I see you smoke cigarettes, so perhaps it may be of use to you,' she said, as it were apologizing timidly for her present. "'Some people maintain, I have heard it and read it, that the purest love for one's neighbor is at the same time the greatest egoism. What egoism there could be in this case, I can't understand. Though I had not much money when I came into prison, I could not be seriously vexed with those of the convicts who, in my very first hours in prison, after deceiving me once, came a second, a third, and even a fifth time to borrow from me. But I will candidly confess one thing. It did annoy me that all these people with their naive cunning must, as I thought, be laughing at me and thinking of me as a simpleton and a fool just because I gave them money the fifth time of asking. They must have thought that I was taken in by their wiles and cunning, while if I had refused them and driven them away, I am convinced that they would have respected me a great deal more. But annoying as it was, I could not refuse. I was annoyed because I was seriously and anxiously considering during those first days what sort of position I could make for myself in the prison, or rather on what sort of footing I ought to be with them. I felt and thoroughly realized that the surroundings were completely new to me, that I was quite in the dark and could not go on living so for several years. I had to prepare myself. I made up my mind, of course, that above all I must act straightforwardly, in accordance with my inner feelings and conscience. But I knew, too, that that was a mere aphorism, and that the most unexpected difficulties lay before me in practice. And so, in spite of all the petty details of settling into the prison which I have mentioned already, and into which I was led chiefly by Akim Akimich, and although they served as some distraction, I was more and more tormented by a terrible, devouring melancholy. A dead house, I thought to myself sometimes, standing on the steps of the prison at twilight and looking at the convicts who had come back from work, and were idly loafing about the prison yard and moving from the prison to the kitchen and back again. I looked intently at them and tried to conjecture from their faces and movements what sort of men they were, and what were their characters. They sauntered about before me with scowling brows or over-jubilant faces. These two extremes are most frequently met with and are almost typical of prison life. Swearing or simply talking together, or walking alone with quiet, even steps, seemingly lost in thought some with a weary, apathetic air, others, even here, with a look of conceited superiority, with caps on one side, their coats flung over their shoulders, with a sly, insolent stare and an impudent jeer. "'This is my sphere, my world now,' I thought, "'with which I must live now, whether I will or not.' I tried to find out about them by questioning Akim Akimich, 
with whom I liked to have tea so as not to be alone. By the way, tea was almost all I could take at first. Tea Akimakimich did not decline, and used himself to prepare our absurd homemade little tin samovar, which was lent me by M. Akimakimich usually drank one glass. He had glasses, too. Drink it silently and sedately, returning it to me, thanked me, and at once began working at my quilt. But what I wanted to find out he could not tell me. He could not, in fact, understand why I was interested in the characters of the convicts surrounding us, and listened to me with a sort of sly smile which I very well remember. Yes, evidently I must find out by experience and not ask questions, I thought. On the fourth day, early in the morning, all the convicts were drawn up in two rows at the prison gates before the guardhouse, just as they had been that time when I was being refettered. Soldiers with loaded rifles and fixed bayonets stood opposite them, in front and behind. A soldier has the right to fire at a convict if the latter attempts to escape. At the same time, he would have to answer for firing, except in extreme necessity. The same rule applies in case of open mutiny among the convicts. But who would dream of attempting to escape openly? An officer of engineers, a foreman, and also the non-commissioned officers and soldiers who superintend the works were present. The roll was called. Those of the convicts who worked in the tailoring room set off first of all. The engineering officers had nothing to do with them. They worked only for the prison and made all the prison clothes. Then the contingent for the workshop started, followed by those who did unskilled work, of whom there were about twenty. I set off with them. On the frozen river behind the fortress were two government barges which were of no more use and had to be pulled to pieces, so that the timber might not be wasted, though I fancy all the old material was worth very little, practically nothing. Firewood was sold for next to nothing in the town, and there were forests all round. They put us on this job chiefly to keep us occupied, and the convicts themselves quite understood that. They always worked listlessly and apathetically at such tasks, and it was quite different when the work was valuable in itself and worth doing, especially when they could succeed in getting a fixed task. Then they seemed, as it were, inspirited, and although they got no advantage from it, I have seen them exert themselves to the utmost to finish the work as quickly and as well as possible. Their vanity indeed was somehow involved in it, but with work such as we had that day, done more as a matter of form than because it was needed, it was difficult to obtain a fixed task, and we had to work till the drums sounded the recall home at eleven o'clock in the morning. The day was warm and misty. The snow was almost thawing. All our group set off to the river bank beyond the fortress with a faint jingling of chains, which gave a thin, sharp, metallic clank at every step, though they were hidden under our clothes. Two or three men went into the house where the tools were kept to get the implements we needed. I walked with the rest and felt a little more cheerful. I was in haste to see and find out what sort of work it was. What was this hard labor? And how should I work for the first time in my life? I remember it all to the smallest detail. On the road we met a workman of some sort with a beard. He stopped and put his hand in his pocket. A convict immediately came forward out of our group, took off his cap, took the alms, five kopecks, and quickly rejoined the others. The workman crossed himself and went on his way. The five kopecks were spent that morning on rolls, which were divided equally among the party. Some of our gang were, as usual, sullen and taciturn, others indifferent and listless, others chattered idly together. 
One was for some reason extraordinarily pleased and happy. He sang and almost danced on the way, jingling his fetters at every caper. It was the same short, thick-set convict who on my first morning in prison had quarreled with another while they were washing, because the latter had foolishly ventured to declare that he was a cocky-locky. This merry fellow was called Skuratov. At last he began singing a jaunty song of which I remember the refrain. I was away when they married me, I was away at the mill. All that was lacking was a balalaika. His extraordinary cheerfulness, of course, at once aroused indignation in some of our party. It was almost taken as an insult. He is setting up a howl, a convict said reproachfully, though it was no concern of his. The wolf has only one note in that you've cribbed, you Tula fellow, observed another of the gloomy ones with a little Russian accent. I may be a Tula man, Skuratov retorted promptly, but you choke yourselves with dumplings in Poltava. Lie away, what do you eat? used to ladle out cabbage soup with a shoe. And now it might be the devil feeding us with cannonballs, added a third. I know I am a pampered fellow, mates, Skuratov answered with a faint sigh, as though regretting he had been pampered and addressing himself to all in general and to no one in particular. From my earliest childhood bred up, that is brought up, he intentionally distorted his words. On prunes and fancy bread, my brothers have a shop of their own in Moscow to this day. They sell fiddlesticks in no man's street. Very rich shopkeepers they are. And did you keep shop too? I too carried on in various qualities. It was then, mates, I got my first two hundred. You don't mean rubles? broke in one inquisitive listener, positively starting at the mention of so much money. No, my dear soul, not rubles. Sticks. Luca! Hey, Luca! To some I am Luca, but to you I am Luca Kuzmich, a thin little sharp-nosed convict answered reluctantly. Well, Luca Kuzmich, then, hang you, so be it. To some people I am Luka Kuzmich, but you should call me uncle. Well, hang you then, uncle. You are not worth talking to. But there was a good thing I wanted to say. That's how it happened, mates. I did not make much in Moscow. They gave me fifteen lashes as a parting present and sent me packing. So then I... But why were you sent packing? inquired one who had been carefully following the speaker. Why, it's against the rules to go into quarantine and to drink tin tacks and to play the jingle jangle. So I hadn't time to get rich in Moscow, mates, not worth talking about. And I did so, so, so want to get rich. I had a yearning I cannot describe. Many of his listeners laughed. Skuratov was evidently one of those volunteer entertainers, or rather buffoons, who seemed to make it their duty to amuse their gloomy companions, and who got nothing but abuse for their trouble. He belonged to a peculiar and noteworthy type, of which I may have more to say hereafter. "'Why, you might be hunted like sable now,' observed Luka Kuzmich. "'Your clothes alone would be worth a hundred roubles.' Skuratov had on the most ancient threadbare sheepskin, on which patches were conspicuous everywhere. He looked it up and down attentively, though unconcernedly. "'It's my head that's priceless, mates, my brain,' he answered. "'When I said good-bye to Moscow, what was my one comfort that I took my head with me? "'Farewell, Moscow, thanks for your bastings, thanks for your warmings. "'You gave me some fine dressings.' And my sheepskin is not worth looking at, my good soul. I suppose your head is, then? Even his head is not his own, but a charity gift, Luca put in again, 
It was given him at Tiumen for Christ's sake as he marched by with the gang. I say, Skuratov, had you any trade? Trade, indeed. He used to lead puppy dogs about and steal their titbits. That was all his trade, observed one of the gloomy convicts. I really did try my hand at cobbling boots, answered Skuratov, not observing this biting criticism. I only cobbled one pair. Well, were they bought? Yes, a fellow did turn up. I suppose he had not feared God or honored his father and mother, and so the Lord punished him and he bought them. All Skuratov's audience went off into peals of laughter. And I did once work here, Skuratov went on with extreme nonchalance. I put new uppers onto Lieutenant Pomortsev boots. Well, was he satisfied? No, mates, he wasn't. He gave me o's enough to last me a lifetime and a dig in the back with his knee, too. He was in an awful taking. Ah, my life has deceived me. The jades deceived me. And not many minutes later, Akulina's husband came. He unexpectedly caroled again and began pattering a dance step with his feet. The graceless fellow, the little Russian who was walking beside me observed with a side glance of spiteful contempt at Skuratov. A useless fellow, observed another in a serious and final tone. I could not understand why they were angry with Skuratov, and why, indeed, all the merry ones seemed to be held in some contempt, as I had noticed already during those first days. I put down the anger of the little Russian and of the others to personal causes. But it was not a case of personal dislike. They were angry at the absence of reserve in Skuratov, at the lack of the stern assumption of personal dignity about which all the prisoners were pedantically particular. In fact, at his being a useless fellow, to use their own expression. Yet they were not angry with all the merry ones, and did not treat all as they did Skuratov and those like him. It depended on what people would put up with. A good-natured and unpretentious man was at once exposed to insult, I was struck by this fact indeed. But there were some among the cheerful spirits who knew how to take their own part and liked doing so, and they exacted respect. In this very group there was one of these prickly characters. He was a tall, good-looking fellow with a large wart on his cheek and a very comic expression, though his face was rather handsome and intelligent. He was in reality a light-hearted and very charming fellow, though I only found out that side of him later on. They used to call him the Pioneer, because at one time he had served in the Pioneers. Now he was in the Special Division. I shall have a great deal to say of him later. Not all of the serious-minded, however, were so outspoken as the indignant little Russian. There were some men in the prison who aimed at superiority, at knowing all sorts of things, at showing resourcefulness, character, and intelligence. Many of these really were men of intelligence and character, and did actually attain what they aimed at, that is, a leading position and a considerable moral influence over their companions. These clever fellows were often at daggers drawn with one another, and every one of them had many enemies. They looked down upon other convicts with dignity and condescension. They picked no unnecessary quarrels, were in favor with the authorities, and took the lead at work. Not one of them would have found fault with anyone for a song, for instance. They would not have stooped to such trifles. These men were very polite to me all the time I was in prison, but they were not very talkative, also apparently from a sense of dignity. I shall have to speak more in detail of them also. We reached the river bank. The old barge which we had to break up was frozen into the ice below us. 
On the further side of the river, the steps stretched blue into the distance. It was a gloomy and desert view. I expected that everyone would rush at the work, but they had no idea of doing so. Some sat down on the logs that lay about on the bank. Almost all of them brought out of their boots bags of local tobacco, which was sold at three farthings a pound in the market, and short willow pipes of home manufacture. They lighted their pipes. The soldiers formed a cordon round us and proceeded to guard us with a bored expression. "'Whose notion was it to break up this barge?' one observed, as it were, to himself, not addressing anyone. "'Are they in want of chips?' "'He wasn't afraid of our anger, whoever it was,' observed another. "'Where are those peasants trudging to?' the first asked after a pause, not noticing, of course, the answer to his first question, and pointing to a group of peasants who were making their way in Indian file over untrodden snow in the distance. Everyone turned lazily in that direction, and a while away the time began mocking at them. One of the peasants, the last of the file, walked very absurdly, stretching out his arms and swinging his head on one side with a long peasant's cap on it, his whole figure stood out clearly and distinctly against the white snow. "'Look how Brother Peter has rigged himself out,' observed one, mimicking the peasant accent. It is remarkable that the convicts rather looked down on peasants, though half of them were of the peasant class. "'The last one, mates, walks as though he were sowing radishes,' "'He is a slow-witted fellow. He has a lot of money,' observed a third. "'They all laughed, but lazily, too, as it were reluctantly. "'Meantime, a baker woman had come, a brisk, lively woman. "'They bought rolls of her for the five kopecks that had been given us "'and divided them in equal shares on the spot. "'The young man who had sold rolls in prison took two dozen and began a lively altercation, trying to get her to give him three rolls instead of the usual two as his commission. But the baker woman would not consent. "'Well, and won't you give me something else?' "'What else?' "'What the mice don't eat!' "'A plague take you!' shrieked the woman and laughed. At last the sergeant who superintended the work came up with a stick in his hand. Nay hey there, what are you sitting there for? Get to work! Set us a task, Ivan Matveitch, said one of the leaders, slowly getting up from his place. Why didn't you ask for it at the start? Break up the barge, that's your task! At last they got up desultorily and slouched to the river. Some of them immediately took up the part of foreman, in words anyway. It appeared that the barge was not to be broken up anyhow, but the timber was to be kept as whole as possible, especially the crossway beams which were fixed to the bottom of the barge by wooden bolts along their whole length. "'We ought first of all to get out this beam. Set to this, lads,' observed one of the convicts who had not spoken before, a quiet and unassuming fellow, not one of the leading or ruling spirits, and stooping down he got hold of a thick beam, waiting for the others to help him. But nobody did help him. "'Get it up, no fear. You won't get it up, and if your grandfather the bear came along, he wouldn't,' muttered someone between his teeth. "'Well, then, brothers, how are we to begin? I don't know,' said the puzzled man, who had put himself forward, letting go the beam and getting on to his feet again. "'Work your hardest, you'll never be done. Why put yourself forward?' "'He could not feed three hens without making a mistake, and now he is to be first. The fidget!' "'I didn't mean anything, mates,' the disconcerted youth tried to explain." "'Do you want me to keep covers over you all, or to keep you in pickle through the winter?' 
shouted the sergeant again, looking in perplexity at the crowd of twenty convicts who stood not knowing how to set to work. Begin! Make haste! You can't do things quicker than you can, Ivan Matveyevich. Why, but you are doing nothing! Hey, Savalyev! Taki Petrovich ought to be your name! I ask you, why are you standing there rolling your eyes? Set to work! But what can I do alone? Set us a task, Ivan Matveyevich. You've been told you won't have a task. Break up the barge and go home. Get to work. They did set to work at last, but listlessly, unwillingly, incompetently. It was quite provoking to see a sturdy crowd of stalwart workmen who seemed utterly at a loss how to set to work. As soon as they began to take out the first and smallest beam, it appeared that it was breaking. Breaking of itself, as was reported to the overseer by way of apology. So it seemed they could not begin that way, but must try somehow else. There followed a lengthy discussion among the convicts what other way to try, what was to be done. By degrees it came, of course, to abuse and threatened to go further. The sergeant shouted again and waved his stick, but the beam broke again. It appeared finally that axes were not enough and other tools were needed. Two fellows were dispatched with a convoy to the fortress to fetch them, and meantime the others very serenely sat down on the barge, pulled out their pipes and began smoking again. The sergeant gave it up as a bad job at last. Well, you'll never make work look silly. Ah, what a set, what a set! He muttered angrily, and with a wave of his hand he set off for the fortress, swinging his stick. An hour later the foreman came. After listening calmly to the convicts, he announced that the task he set them was to get out four more beams without breaking them, and in addition he marked out a considerable portion of the barge to be taken to pieces, telling them that when it was done, they could go home. The task was a large one, but heavens, how they set to! There was no trace of laziness, no trace of incompetence. The axes rang. They began unscrewing the wooden bolts. Others thrust thick posts underneath and, pressing on them with twenty hands, levered up the beams, which to my astonishment came up now whole and uninjured. The work went like wildfire. Everyone seemed wonderfully intelligent all of a sudden. There was not a word wasted, not an oath was heard. Everyone seemed to know what to say, what to do, where to stand, what advice to give. Just half an hour before the drum beat, the last of the task was finished, and the convicts went home tired but quite contented, though they had only saved half an hour of their working day. But as far as I was concerned, I noticed one thing. Wherever I turned to help them during the work, everywhere I was superfluous, everywhere I was in the way, everywhere I was pushed aside almost with abuse. The lowest ragamuffin, himself a wretched workman, who did not dare to raise his voice among the other convicts who were sharper and cleverer than he, thought himself entitled to shout at me on the pretext that I hindered him if I stood beside him. At last one of the smarter ones said to me plainly and coarsely, "'Where are you shoving? Get away! Why do you poke yourself where you are not wanted?' "'Your game's up!' another chimed in at once. You'd better take a jug and go around asking for a halfpence to build a fine house and waste upon snuff. But there's nothing for you to do here. I had to stand apart, and to stand apart when all are working makes one feel ashamed. But when it happened that I did walk away and stood at the end of the barge, they shouted at once, Fine workmen they've given us. What can one get done with them? You can get nothing done. All this, of course, was done on purpose, for it amused everyone. 
they must have a jibe at one who has been a fine gentleman. And, of course, they were glad to have the chance. It may well be understood now why, as I have said already, my first question on entering the prison was how I should behave, what attitude I should take up before these people. I had a foreboding that I should often come into collision with them like this. But in spite of all difficulties, I made up my mind not to change my plan of action, which I had partly thought out during those days. I knew it was right. I had made up my mind to behave as simply and independently as possible, not to make any special effort to get on intimate terms with them, but not to repel them if they desired to be friendly themselves, not to be afraid of their menaces and their hatred, and as far as possible to affect not to notice, not to approach them on certain points, and not to encourage some of their habits and customs, not to seek, in fact, to be regarded quite as a comrade by them. I guessed at the first glance that they would be the first to despise me if I did. According to their ideas, however, I learned this for certain later on, I ought even to keep up and respect my class superiority before them, that is, to study my comfort, to give myself airs, to scorn them, to turn up my nose at everything, to play the fine gentleman, in fact. That was what they understood by being a gentleman. They would, of course, have abused me for doing so, but yet they would privately have respected me for it. To play such a part was not in my line. I was never a gentleman according to their notions. But, on the other hand, I avowed to make no concession derogatory to my education and my way of thinking. If I had begun to try and win their good will by making up to them, agreeing with them, being familiar with them, and had gone in for their various qualities, they would have at once supposed that I did it out of fear and cowardice, and would have treated me with contempt. A was not a fair example. He used to visit the Major, and they were afraid of him themselves. On the other side, I did not want to shut myself off from them by cold and unapproachable politeness, as the Poles did. I saw clearly that they despised me now for wanting to work with them, without seeking my own ease or giving myself airs of superiority over them. And although I felt sure that they would have to change their opinion of me later, yet the thought that they had, as it were, the right to despise me, because they imagined I was trying to make up to them at work. This thought was very bitter to me. When I returned to the prison in the evening after the day's work, worn out and exhausted, I was again overcome by terrible misery. How many thousands of such days lie before me, I thought. All the same, all exactly alike. As it grew dusk, I sauntered up and down behind the prison by the fence, silent and alone, and suddenly I saw our Sharik running towards me. Sharik was the dog that belonged to our prison, just as there are dogs belonging to companies, batteries, and squadrons. He had lived from time immemorial in the prison. He belonged to no one in particular, considering everyone his master, and he lived on scraps from the kitchen. He was a rather large mongrel, black with white spots, not very old, with intelligent eyes and a bushy tail. No one ever stroked him, no one took any notice of him. From the first day I stroked him and fed him with bread out of my hands. While I stroked him, he stood quietly, looking affectionately at me and gently wagging his tail as a sign of pleasure. Now, after not seeing me for so long, me, the only person who had for years thought of caressing him, he ran about looking for me amongst all of them, and finding me behind the prison, ran to meet me, whining with delight. I don't know what came over me, but I fell to kissing him. I put my arms round his head. He put his forepaws on my shoulders and began licking my face. 
So this is the friend fate has sent me, I thought, and every time I came back from work during that first hard and gloomy period, first of all, before I went anywhere else, I hurried behind the prison with Sharik leaping before me and whining with joy, held his head in my arms and kissed him again and again, and a sweet and at the same time poignantly bitter feeling wrung my heart. And I remember it was positively pleasant to me to think, as though priding myself on my suffering, that there was only one creature in the world who loved me, who was devoted to me, who was my friend, my one friend, my faithful dog, Sharik. Breaking in Our translator, Constance Garnett, adds a note on the first page of this chapter that when the Siberian widow takes a special interest in helping Goryanchikov and his companion due to the nature of their purported crime, that the author is referring to their arrest on political charges. This is a matter of interpretation by Garnett, but it is almost certainly right. The widow would have no special interest in murderers, for instance, since, as we have already seen, murderers are a dime a dozen in the prison camp. This is one of very many places where Dostoevsky appears to be utterly uninterested in keeping up the backstory for Goryanchikov that he provided in the introduction to Part One, where the man is supposed to have been arrested for the charge of murdering his wife. Clearly, our narrator is really Dostoevsky himself. When he states that he has heard people insisting that all charity is really done out of egoism, he probably has in mind Nikolai Chernyshevsky, a man who would emerge as one of Dostoevsky's foremost ideological antagonists of the early to mid-1860s. Chernyshevsky published this idea in an essay in 1860. By 1861, Dostoevsky was already wrestling with it in The Insulted and Injured. Chernyshevsky's novel, What is to be Done, came out in 1863, and Dostoevsky's rejoinder was published the following year in the form of the greatest of his novellas, Notes from Underground. Hopefully it is clear what the convicts mean by setting a task, Originally, they are appointed to work for a period of time, but they succeed in changing their workload to refer not to a period of time, but to the completion of a task, which ultimately saves them a half hour of labor. Among other things, this episode provides a poignant lesson in the power of incentives. End of comments. Chapter 7 New Acquaintances Petrov But time passed, and little by little I got used to it. Every day I was less and less bewildered by the daily events of my new life. My eyes grew, as it were, accustomed to incidents, surroundings, men. To be reconciled to this life was impossible, but it was high time to accept it as an accomplished fact. Any perplexities that still remained in my mind I concealed within myself as completely as possible. I no longer wandered about the prison like one distraught and no longer showed my misery. The savagely inquisitive eyes of the convicts were not so often fixed on me. They did not watch me with such an assumption of insolence. They had grown used to me, too, apparently, and I was very glad of it. I walked about prison as though I were at home, knew my place on the common bed, and seemed to have grown used to things which I should have thought I could never in my life have grown used to. Regularly, once a week, I went to have half my head shaved. Every Saturday in our free time we were called out in turn from the prison to the guardhouse, if we did not go, we had to get shaved on our own account. And there the barbers of the battalion rubbed our heads with cold lather and mercilessly scraped them with blunt razors. It makes me shiver even now when I recall that torture. 
But the remedy was soon found. Akim Akimich pointed out to me a convict in the military division who, for a kopeck, would shave with his own razor anyone who liked. That was his trade. Many of the convicts went to him to escape the prison barbers, though they were by no means a sensitive lot. Our convict barber was called the Major. Why, I don't know, and in what way he suggested the Major, I can't say. As I write, I recall this Major, a tall, lean, taciturn fellow, rather stupid, always absorbed in his occupation, never without a strop on which he was day and night sharpening his incredibly worn-out razor. He was apparently concentrated on this pursuit, which he evidently looked upon as his vocation in life. He was really extremely happy when the razor was in good condition and someone came to be shaved. His lather was warm, his hand was light, the shaving was like velvet. He evidently enjoyed his art and was proud of it, and he carelessly took the kopeck he had earned as though he did the work for art's sake and not for profit. A caught it on one occasion from our major when, telling him tales about the prisoners, he incautiously spoke of our barber as the major. The real major flew into a rage and was extremely offended. "'Do you know, you rascal, what is meant by a major?' he shouted, foaming at the mouth and falling upon A in his usual fashion. "'Do you understand what is meant by a major? And here you dare to call a scoundrelly convict major before me in my presence!' No one but A could have got on with such a man. From the very first day of my life in prison, I began to dream of freedom. To calculate in a thousand different ways when my days in prison would be over became my favorite occupation. It was always in my mind, and I am sure that it is the same with everyone who is deprived of freedom for a fixed period. I don't know whether the other convicts thought and calculated as I did, but the amazing audacity of their hopes impressed me from the beginning. The hopes of a prisoner deprived of freedom are utterly different from those of a man living a natural life. A free man hopes, of course, for a change of luck, for instance, or the success of an undertaking. But he lives, he acts, he is caught up in the world of life. It is very different with the prisoner. There is life for him, too, granted, prison life. But whatever the convict may be, and whatever may be the term of his sentence, he is instinctively unable to accept his lot as something positive, final, as part of real life. Every convict feels that he is, so to speak, not at home, but on a visit. He looks at twenty years as though they were two, and is fully convinced that when he leaves prison at fifty-five, he will be as full of life and energy as he is now at thirty-five. I've still life before me, he thinks, and resolutely drives away all doubts and other vexatious ideas. Even those in the special division who had been sentenced for life sometimes reckoned on orders suddenly coming from Petersburg, to send them to the mines at Nerchinsk and to limit their sentence. Then it would be all right. To begin with, it is almost six months' journey to Nerchinsk, and how much pleasanter the journey would be than being in prison. And afterwards the term in Nerchinsk would be over, and then... And sometimes even grey-headed men reckoned like this. At Tobolsk I have seen convicts chained to the wall. The man is kept on a chain seven feet long. He has a bedstead by him. He is chained like this for some exceptionally terrible crime committed in Siberia. They are kept like that for five years, for ten years. They are generally brigands. I only saw one among them who looked as if he had belonged to the upper classes, he had been in the government service somewhere. He spoke submissively with a lisp, 
His smile was mawkishly sweet. He showed us his chain, showed how he could most comfortably lie on the bed. He must have been a choice specimen. As a rule, they all behave quietly and seem contented, yet every one of them is intensely anxious for the end of his sentence. Why, one wonders. I will tell you why. He will get out of the stifling, dank room with its low, vaulted roof of brick, and will walk in the prison yard. And that is all. He will never be allowed out of the prison. He knows those who have been in chains are always kept in prison and fettered to the day of their death. He knows that, and yet he is desperately eager for the end of his time on the chain. But for that longing, how could he remain five or six years on the chain without dying or going out of his mind? Some of them would not endure it at all. I felt that work might be the saving of me, might strengthen my physical frame and my health. Continual mental anxiety, nervous irritation, the foul air of the prison might well be my destruction. Being constantly in the open air, working every day till I was tired, learning to carry heavy weights, at any rate, I shall save myself, I thought. I shall make myself strong. I shall leave the prison healthy, vigorous, hearty, and not old. I was not mistaken. The work and exercise were very good for me. I looked with horror at one of my companions, a man of my own class. He was wasting like a candle in prison. He entered it at the same time as I did, Young, handsome, and vigorous, and he left it half-shattered, gray-headed, gasping for breath, and unable to walk. No, I thought, looking at him, I want to live and will live. But at first I got into hot water among the convicts for my fondness for work, and for a long time they assailed me with jibes and contempt. But I took no notice of anyone and set off cheerfully, for instance, to the baking and pounding of alabaster, one of the first things I learnt to do. That was easy work. The officials who supervised our work were ready, as far as possible, to be lenient in allotting work to prisoners belonging to the upper classes, which was by no means an undue indulgence but simple justice. It would be strange to expect from a man of half the strength and no experience of manual labor the same amount of work as the ordinary workman had by regulation to get through. But this indulgence was not always shown, and it was, as it were, surreptitious. A strict watch was kept from outside to check it. Very often we had to go to heavy work, and then, of course, it was twice as hard for the upper-class convicts as for the rest. Three or four men were usually sent to the alabaster, old or weak by preference, and we, of course, came under that heading. But besides these, a real workman who understood the work was always told off for the job. The same workman went regularly for some years to this task, a dark, lean, oldish man called Almazov, grim, unsociable, and peevish. He had a profound contempt for us. But he was so taciturn that he was even lazy about grumbling at us. The shed in which the alabaster was baked and pounded stood also on the steep, desolate river bank. In winter, especially in dull weather, it was dreary to look over the river and at the faraway bank on the other side. There was something poignant and heart-rending in this wild, desolate landscape. But it was almost more painful when the sun shone brightly on the immense white expanse of snow. One longed to fly away into that expanse which stretched from the other side of the river, an untrodden plain for twelve hundred miles to the south. Almatsov usually set to work in grim silence. We were ashamed, as it were, that we could not be any real help to him, 
and he managed alone and asked no help from us on purpose, it seemed, to make us conscious of our shortcomings and remorseful for our uselessness. And yet all he had to do was to heat the oven for baking in it the alabaster, which we used to fetch for him. Next day, when the alabaster was thoroughly baked, the task of unloading it from the oven began. Each of us took a heavy mallet, filled himself a special box of alabaster, and set to work to pound it. This was delightful work. The brittle alabaster was quickly transformed to white shining powder. It crumbled so well and so easily. We swung our heavy mallets and made such a din that we enjoyed it ourselves. We were tired at the end, and at the same time we felt better. Our cheeks were flushed, our blood circulated more quickly. At this point even Almatsov began to look at us with indulgence, as people look at small children. He smoked his pipe condescendingly, though he could not help grumbling when he had to speak. But he was like that with everyone, though I believe he was a good-natured man at bottom. Another task to which I was sent was to turn the lathe in the workshop. It was a big, heavy wheel. It needed a good deal of effort to move it, especially when the turner, one of the regimental workmen, was shaping some piece of furniture for the use of an official, such as a banister or a big table leg for which a big log was required. In such cases it was beyond one man's strength to turn the wheel, and generally two of us were sent, myself and another gentleman, whom I will call B. For several years, whenever anything had to be turned, this task fell to our share. B. was a frail, weakly young fellow who suffered with his lungs. He had entered the prison a year before my arrival, together with two others, his comrades, one an old man who spent all his time, day and night, saying his prayers, for which he was greatly respected by the convicts, and died before I left prison, and the other quite a young lad, fresh, rosy, strong, and full of spirit, who had carried B for more than five hundred miles on the journey when the latter was too exhausted to walk. The affection between them was worth seeing. B. was a man of very good education, generous feelings, and a lofty character, which had been embittered and made irritable by illness. We used to manage the wheel together, and the work interested us both. It was first-rate exercise for me. I was particularly fond, too, of shoveling away the snow. This had to be done as a rule after snowstorms, which were pretty frequent in winter. After a snowstorm lasting twenty-four hours, some houses would be snowed up to the middle of the windows, and others would be almost buried. Then, as soon as the storm was over and the sun came out, we were driven out in big gangs, sometimes the whole lot of us, to shovel away the snowdrifts from the government buildings. Everyone was given a spade, a task was set for all together, and sometimes such a task that it was a wonder they could get through it, and all set to work with a will. The soft new snow, a little frozen at the top, was easily lifted in huge spadefuls and was scattered about, turning to fine glistening powder in the air. The spade cut readily into the white mass sparkling in the sunshine. The convicts were almost always merry over this job, the fresh winter air and the exercise warmed them up. Everyone grew more cheerful. There were sounds of laughter, shouts, jests. They began snowballing each other, not without protest, of course, from the serious ones who were indignant at the laughter and merriment, and the general excitement usually ended in swearing. Little by little I began to enlarge my circle of acquaintance. Though, indeed, I did not think of making acquaintances myself, I was still restless, gloomy, and mistrustful. My acquaintanceships arose of themselves. 
One of the first to visit me was a convict called Petrov. I say visit me, and I lay special emphasis on the word. Petrov was in the special division and lived in the part of the prison furthest from me. There could apparently be no connection between us, and we certainly had and could have nothing in common. And yet in those early days Petrov seemed to feel it his duty to come to our room to see me almost every day, or to stop me when I was walking in our leisure hour behind the prison as much out of sight as I could. At first I disliked this, but he somehow succeeded in making his visits a positive diversion to me, though he was by no means a particularly sociable or talkative man. He was a short, strongly built man, agile and restless, pale with high cheekbones and fearless eyes, with a rather pleasant face, fine white close-set teeth, and an everlasting plug of tobacco between them and his lower lip. This habit of holding tobacco in the mouth was common among the convicts. He seemed younger than his age. He was forty and looked no more than thirty. He always talked to me without a trace of constraint, and treated me exactly as his equal, that is, behaved with perfect good breeding and delicacy. If he noticed, for instance, that I was anxious to be alone, he would leave me in two or three minutes after a few words of conversation, and he always thanked me for attending to him, a courtesy which he never showed, of course, to anyone else in prison. It is curious that such relations continued between us for several years and never became more intimate, though he really was attached to me. I cannot to this day make up my mind what he wanted of me, why he came to me every day. Though he did happen to steal from me later on, he stole, as it were, by accident. He scarcely ever asked me for money, so he did not come for the sake of money or with any interested motive. I don't know why, but I always felt as though he were not living in prison with me, but somewhere far away in another house in the town, and that he only visited the prison in passing, to hear the news, to see me, to see how we were all getting on. He was always in a hurry, as though he had left someone waiting for him, or some job unfinished. And yet he did not seem flustered. The look in his eyes, too, was rather strange intent with a shade of boldness and mockery. Yet he looked, as it were, into the distance, as though beyond the things that met his eyes he were trying to make out something else far away. This gave him an absent-minded look. I sometimes purposely watched where Petrov went when he left me. Where was someone waiting for him? But he would hurry away from me to a prison ward or a kitchen, would sit down there beside some convicts, listen attentively to their conversation, and sometimes take part in it himself, even speaking with heat. Then he would suddenly break off and relapse into silence. But whether he were talking or sitting silent, it always appeared that he did so for a moment in passing, that he had something else to do and was expected elsewhere. The strangest thing was that he never had anything to do, he led a life of absolute leisure, except for the regulation work, of course. He knew no sort of trade, and he scarcely ever had any money. But he did not grieve much over the lack of it. And what did he talk to me about? His conversation was as strange as himself. He would see, for instance, that I was walking alone behind the prison, and would turn abruptly in my direction. He always walked quickly and turned abruptly. He walked up, yet it seemed he must have been running. Good morning. Good morning. I am not interrupting you. No. I wanted to ask you about Napoleon. He is a relation of the one who was here in 1812, isn't he? Petrov was a Cantonist and could read and write. Yes. He is some sort of president, they say, isn't he? He always asked rapid, abrupt questions, as though he were in a hurry to learn something. 
It seemed as though he were investigating some matter of great importance which would not admit of any delay. I explained how he was a president and added that he might soon be an emperor. How is that? I explained that, too, as far as I could. Petrov listened attentively, understanding perfectly and reflecting rapidly, even turning his ear towards me. Hmm. I wanted to ask you, Alexander Petrovich, is it true, as they say, that there are monkeys with arms down to their heels and as big as a tall man? Yes, there are. What are they like? That, too, I explained as far as I was able. And where do they live? In hot countries. There are some in the island of Sumatra. That's in America, isn't it? Don't they say that the people in those parts walk on their heads? Not on their heads. You mean the Antipodes. I explained what America was like and what was meant by the Antipodes. He listened as attentively as though he had come simply to hear about the Antipodes. Ah, oh, last year I read about the Countess Lavalliere. Arefe have got the book from the adjutants. Is it true or is it just invented? It's written by Dumas. It's invented, of course. Well, goodbye. Thank you. And Petra vanished, and we rarely talked except in this style. I began inquiring about him. M. positively warned me when he heard of the acquaintance. He told me that many of the convicts had inspired him with horror, especially at first, in his early days in prison. But not one of them, not even Gazin, had made such a terrible impression on him as this Petrov. "'He is the most determined, the most fearless of all the convicts,' said M. "'He is capable of anything. He would stick at nothing if the fancy took him.' He would murder you if it happened to strike him. He would murder you in a minute without flinching or giving it a thought afterwards. I believe he is not quite in his right mind. This view interested me very much. But M could give me no reason for thinking so. And strange to say, I knew Petrov for several years afterwards and talked to him almost every day. He was genuinely attached to me all that time, though I am absolutely unable to say why. And all those years he behaved well in prison and did nothing horrible. Yet every time I looked at him and talked to him I felt sure that M was right, and that Petrov really was a most determined and fearless man who recognized no restraint of any sort. Why I felt this I can't explain either. I may mention, however, that this Petrov was the convict who had intended, on being let out to be flogged, to murder the major, when the latter was saved only by a miracle, as the convict said, through driving away just before. It had happened once, before he came to prison, that he had been struck by the colonel at drill. Probably he had been struck many times before, but this time he could not put up with it, and he stabbed his colonel openly in broad daylight in the face of the regiment. But I don't know all the details of this story. He never told it me. No doubt these were only outbursts when the man's character showed itself fully all at once. But they were very rare in him. He really was sensible and even peaceable. Passions were latent in him, and hot, violent passions too, but the burning embers were always covered with a layer of ashes and smoldered quietly. I never saw the faintest trace of vanity or boastfulness in him, as in others. He rarely quarreled. On the other hand, he was not particularly friendly with anyone, except perhaps with Sorotkin, and then only when the latter was of use to him. Once, however, I saw him seriously angry, Something was not given him, something which was properly his share. A convict in the civilian division called Vasily Antonov was quarreling with him. He was a tall, powerful athlete, spiteful, 
quarrelsome, malicious, and very far from being a coward. They had been shouting at each other for a long time, and I thought that the matter would at most end in a blow or two, for at times, though rarely, Petrov swore and fought like the meanest convict. But this time it was not so. Petrov suddenly blanched. His lips suddenly quivered and turned blue. He began breathing hard. He got up from his place and slowly, very slowly, with his bare, noiseless steps, in summer he was very fond of going barefoot, he approached Antonov. There was a sudden silence in the noisy, shouting crowd. One could have heard a fly. Everyone waited to see what would happen. Antonov leapt up as he approached, looking aghast. I could not bear the sight of it and left the room. I expected to hear the shriek of a murdered man before he had time to get down the steps. But this time, too, it ended in nothing. Before Petrov had time to reach him, Antonov hastily and in silence flung him the object about which they were disputing, which was some old rag they used to put round their legs. Of course, two or three minutes later, Antonov swore at him a little to satisfy his conscience and keep up appearances by showing that he was not quite cowed. But Petrov took no notice of his abuse, did not even answer it. It was not a question of abuse. The point had been won in his favor. He was very well pleased and took his rag. A quarter of an hour later he was sauntering about the prison as usual, with an air of complete unconcern, and seemed to be looking round to find people talking about something interesting that he might poke his nose in and listen. Everything seemed to interest him, yet it somehow happened that he remained indifferent to most things and simply wandered aimlessly about the prison, drawn first one way and then another. One might have compared him with a workman, a stalwart workman who could send the work flying, but was for a while without a job, and meantime sat playing with little children. I could not understand either why he remained in prison, why he did not run away. He would not have hesitated to run away if he had felt any strong inclination to do so. Men like Petrov are only ruled by reason till they have some strong desire. Then there is no obstacle on earth that can hinder them. And I am sure he would have escaped cleverly, that he would have outwitted everyone, that he could have stayed for a week without bread, somewhere in the forest or in the reeds of the river. But he evidently had not reached that point yet, and did not fully desire it. I never noticed in him any great power of reflection or any marked common sense. These people are born with one fixed idea which unconsciously moves them hither and thither. So they shift from one thing to another all their lives till they find a work after their own hearts. Then they are ready to risk anything. I wondered sometimes how it was that a man who had murdered his officer for a blow could lie down under a flogging with such resignation. He was sometimes flogged when he was caught smuggling in vodka. Like all convicts without a trade, he sometimes undertook to bring in vodka. But he laid down to be flogged, as it were, with his own consent, that is, as though acknowledging that he deserved it. Except for that, nothing would have induced him to lie down. He would have been killed first. I wondered at him, too, when he stole from me in spite of his unmistakable devotion. This seemed to come upon him, as it were, in streaks. It was he who stole my Bible when I asked him to carry it from one place to another. He had only a few steps to go, but he succeeded in finding a purchaser on the way, sold it, and spent the proceeds on drink. Evidently, he wanted very much to drink, and anything that he wanted very much he had to do. That is the sort of man who will murder a man for sixpence to get a bottle of vodka, though another time he would let a man pass with ten thousand pounds on him. In the evening he told me of the theft himself without the slightest embarrassment or regret, quite indifferently, 
as though it were the most ordinary incident. I tried to give him a good scolding. Besides, I was sorry to lose my Bible. He listened without irritation, very meekly, in fact, agreed that the Bible was a very useful book, sincerely regretted that I no longer possessed it, but expressed no regret at having stolen it. He looked at me with such complacency that I at once gave up scolding him. He accepted my scolding, probably reflecting that it was inevitable that one should be sworn at for such doings, and better I should relieve my feelings and console myself by swearing, but that it was all really nonsense, such nonsense that a serious person would be ashamed to talk about it. It seemed to me that he looked upon me as a sort of child, almost a baby, who did not understand the simplest things in the world. If I began, for instance, on any subject not a learned or bookish one, he would answer me indeed, but apparently only from politeness, confining himself to the briefest reply. I often wondered what the book knowledge about which he usually questioned me meant to him. I sometimes happened to look sideways at him during our conversations to see whether he were laughing at me. But no, usually he was listening seriously and even with some attention, though often so little that I felt annoyed. He asked exact and definite questions, but showed no great surprise at the information he got from me, and received it indeed rather absent-mindedly. I fancied, too, that he had made up his mind once for all, without bothering his head about it, that it was no use talking to me as one would to other people, that apart from talking of books I understood nothing and was incapable of understanding anything, so there was no need to worry me. I am sure that he had a real affection for me, and that struck me very much. Whether he considered me undeveloped, not fully a man, or felt for me that special sort of compassion that every strong creature instinctively feels for someone weaker, recognizing me as such, I don't know. And although all that did not prevent him from robbing me, I am sure he felt sorry for me as he did it. Ugh, he may have thought as he laid hands on my property. What a man! He can't even defend his own property! But I fancy that was what he liked me for. He said to me himself one day, as it were casually, that I was a man with too good a heart, and so simple, so simple, that it makes one feel sorry for you. Only don't take it amiss, Alexander Petrovitch, he added a minute later. I spoke without thinking from my heart. It sometimes happens that such people come conspicuously to the front and take a prominent position at the moment of some violent mass movement or revolution, and in that way achieve all at once their full possibilities. They are not men of words and cannot be the instigators or the chief leaders of a movement, but they are its most vigorous agents and the first to act. They begin simply, with no special flourish, but they are the first to surmount the worst obstacles, facing every danger without reflection, without fear, and all rush after, blindly following them to the last wall, where they often lay down their lives. I do not believe that Petrov has come to a good end. He would make short work of everything all at once, and, if he has not perished yet, it is simply that the moment has not come. Who knows, though? Maybe he will live till his hair is gray and will die peaceably of old age, wandering aimlessly to and fro. But I believe M. was right when he said that Petrov was the most determined man in all the prison. Breaking In In this chapter, Dostoevsky is papering over the effect of prison upon his physical welfare. While, as he states here, the manual labor may have done him good, and prevented him from withering away like Durov, prison life did no favors to his overall health. The most significant effect was the exacerbation of his nervous condition, and his post-Siberian life would be plagued by severe epileptic fits. We will see in later chapters that he spends a disproportionate amount of time in the prison hospital. 
The frail and sickly B, to whom we are briefly introduced here, is a Polish political prisoner. We'll get to know more about this group later. The desultory flurry of questions Petrov shoots at Goryantrikov in that brief snatch of dialogue reveals that Petrov has greater-than-average exposure to intellectual topics, but is beset with the most elementary of misconceptions. He confuses America with the Antipodes, that is, the region including Australia and New Zealand, and assumes that, since people there are in the Southern Hemisphere, they must walk on their heads. Louis de Valier is part of a sequence of novels by Dumas, which begins with The Three Musketeers and ends with The Man in the Iron Mask. Petrov can read it, but is unable to recognize it as fiction. The Napoleon Petrov refers to is Napoleon III, the nephew of the great general who was beaten back by the Russians in 1812. He was elected president of France in 1848, but declared himself emperor in 1852. So we can take a guess as to roughly when this conversation took place. End of comments. Chapter 8 Determined Characters Luchka it is difficult to talk about determined characters. In prison, as everywhere else, they are few in number. A man may look terrible. If one considers what is said of him, one keeps out of his way. An instinctive feeling made me shun such people at first. Afterwards, I changed my views in many respects, even about the most terrible murderers. Some who had never murdered anyone were more terrible than others who had been convicted of six murders. There was an element of something so strange in some crimes that one could not form even a rudimentary conception of them. I say this because among the peasantry, murders are sometimes committed for most astounding reasons. The following type of murderer, for instance, is to be met with, and not uncommonly indeed. He lives quietly and peaceably and puts up with a hard life. He may be a peasant, a house serf, a soldier, or a workman. Suddenly something in him seems to snap. His patience gives way, and he sticks a knife into his enemy and oppressor. Then the strangeness begins. The man gets out of all bounds for a time. The first man he murdered was his oppressor, his enemy, that is criminal, but comprehensible. In that case, there was a motive. But later on, he murders not enemies, but anyone he comes upon. Murders for amusement, for an insulting word, for a look, to make a round number, or simply, Out of my way, don't cross my path, I am coming. The man is, as it were, drunk, in delirium. It is as though, having once overstepped the sacred limit, he begins to revel in the fact that nothing is sacred to him, as though he had an itching to defy all law and authority at once, and to enjoy the most unbridled and unbounded liberty, to enjoy the thrill of horror which he cannot help feeling at himself. He knows, too, that a terrible punishment is awaiting him. All this, perhaps, is akin to the sensation with which a man gazes down from a high tower into the depths below his feet, till at last it would be a relief to throw himself headlong, anything to put an end to it quickly. And this happens even to the most peaceable until then inconspicuous people. Some of these people positively play a part to themselves in this delirium. The more downtrodden such a man has been before, the more he itches now to cut a dash, to strike terror into people. He enjoys their terror and likes even the repulsion he arouses in others. He assumes a sort of desperateness, and a desperate character sometimes looks forward to speedy punishment, looks forward to being settled, because he finds it burdensome at last to keep up his assumed recklessness. 
It is curious that in most cases all this state of mind, this whole pose, persists up to the moment of the scaffold, and then it is cut short once for all, as though its duration were prescribed and defined beforehand. At the end of it, the man suddenly gives in, retires into the background and becomes as limp as a rag. He whimpers on the scaffold and begs forgiveness of the crowd. He comes to prison and he is such a driveling, sniveling fellow that one wonders whether he can be the man who has murdered five or six people. Some, of course, are not soon subdued even in prison. They still preserve a certain bravado, a certain boastfulness which seems to say, I am not what you take me for. I am in for six souls. But yet he, too, ends by being subdued. Only at times he amuses himself by recalling his reckless exploits, the festive time he once had when he was a desperate character. And if he can only find a simple-hearted listener, there is nothing he loves better than to give himself airs and boast with befitting dignity, describing his feats, though he is careful not to betray the pleasure this gives him. See the sort of man I was, he seems to say. And with what subtlety this pose is maintained, how lazily casual the story sometimes is, what studied nonchalance is apparent in the tone, in every word. Where do such people pick it up? Once in those early days I spent a long evening lying idle and depressed on the plank bed, and listened to such a story, and in my inexperience took the storyteller to be a colossal, hideous criminal of an incredible strength of will, while I was inclined to take Petrov lightly. The subject of the narrative was how the speaker, Luka Kuzmich, for no motive but his own amusement, had laid out a major. This Luka Kuzmich was the little, thin, sharp-nosed young convict in our room, a little Russian by birth, whom I have mentioned already. He was really a great Russian, but had been born in the South. I believe he was a house serf. There was really something pert and aggressive about him. Though the bird is small, its claw is sharp. But convicts instinctively see through a man. They had very little respect for him, or, as the convicts say, little respect to him. He was fearfully vain. He was sitting that evening on the platform bed, sewing a shirt. Sewing undergarments was his trade. Beside him was sitting a convict called Kobilin, a tall, stalwart lad, stupid and dull-witted, but good-natured and friendly, who slept next to him on the bed. As they were neighbors, Luchka frequently quarreled with him and generally treated him superciliously, ironically and despotically, of which Kobilin in his simplicity was not fully conscious. He was knitting a woolen stocking, listening indifferently to Luchka. The latter was telling his story rather loudly and distinctly. He wanted everyone to hear, though he tried to pretend that he was telling no one but Kobilin. "'Well, brother, they sent me from our parts,' he began, sticking in his needle, "'to tea for being a tramp.' "'When was that long ago?' asked Kobilin. "'It will be a year ago when the peas come in. "'Well, when we came to K, they put me in prison there for a little time. "'In prison with me there were a dozen fellows, all little Russians, "'tall, healthy, and as strong as bulls.' But they were such quiet chaps. The food was bad, or the Major did as he liked with them. I hadn't been there two days before I saw they were a cowardly lot. "'Why do you knuckle under to a fool like that?' says I. "'You go and talk to him yourself,' they said. And they fairly laughed at me. I didn't say anything. "'One of those little Russians was particularly funny, lads.' he added suddenly, abandoning Kobilin and addressing the company generally. He used to tell us how he was tried and what he said in court, and kept crying as he told us. 
He had a wife and children left behind, he told us. And he was a big, stout, grey-headed old fellow. I says to him nay, he told us. And he, the devil's son, kept on writing and writing. Well, says I to myself, may you choke, I'd be pleased to see it. And he kept on writing and writing, and at last he'd written something and it was my ruin. Give me some thread, Vasya, the damned stuff is rotten. It's from the market, said Vasya, giving him some thread. Ours in the tailoring shop is better. The other day we sent our veteran for some, and I don't know what wretched woman he buys it from. Luchka went on, threading his needle by the light. A crony of his, no doubt. No doubt. Well, but what about the major? asked Kobylin, who had been quite forgotten. This was all Luchka wanted. But he did not go on with his story at once. Apparently he did not deign to notice Kobylin. He calmly pulled out his thread, calmly and lazily drew up his legs under him, and at last began to speak. I worked up my little Russians at last, and they asked for the major. And I borrowed a knife from my neighbor that morning. I took it and hid it to be ready for anything. The major flew into a rage, and he drove up. Come, said I, don't funk it, you chaps. But their hearts failed them. They were all of a tremble. The major ran in, drunk. Who is here? What's here? I am Tsar. I am God, too. As he said that, I stepped forward, Luchka proceeded, my knife in my sleeve. No, said I, your honor. And little by little I got closer. No, how can it be, your honor, said I, that you are our Tsar and God too? No, oh, that's you, that's you, shouted the major. You mutinous fellow. No, I said, and I got closer and closer. No, I said, your honor, as may be well known to yourself, our God, the Almighty, and all present is the only one. And there is only one Tsar set over us by God himself. He, your honor, is called the monarch, says I. And you, says I, your honor, are only a major. Our commander, by the grace of the Tsar and your merits, says I. What, 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 what? He fairly cackled. He choked and couldn't speak. He was awfully astonished. Why this, says I, and I just pounced on him and plunged the whole knife into his stomach. It did the trick. He rolled over and did not move except for his legs kicking. I threw down the knife. Look, you fellows, pick him up now, says I. Here I must make a digression. Unhappily, such phrases as, I am your czar, I am your god too, and many similar expressions, were not uncommonly used in old days by many commanding officers. It must be admitted, however, that there are not many such officers left. Perhaps they are extinct altogether. I may note that the officers who liked to use and prided themselves on using such expressions were mostly those who had risen from the lower ranks. Their promotion turns everything topsy-turvy in them, including their brains. After groaning under the yoke for years and passing through every subordinate grade, they suddenly see themselves officers, gentlemen in command, and in the first intoxication of their position, their inexperience leads them to an exaggerated idea of their power and importance, only in relation to their subordinates, of course. To their superior officers they show the same servility as ever, though it is utterly unnecessary and even revolting to many people. Some of these servile fellows hasten with peculiar zest to declare to their superior officers that they come from the lower ranks, though they are officers, and that, 
they never forget their place. But with the common soldiers, they are absolutely autocratic. Now, of course, there are scarcely any of these men left, and I doubt if anyone could be found to shout, I am your czar, I am your god. But in spite of that, I may remark that nothing irritates convicts, and indeed all people of the poorer classes, so much as such utterances on the part of their officers. This insolence of self-glorification, this exaggerated idea of being able to do anything with impunity, inspires hatred in the most submissive of men and drives them out of all patience. Fortunately, this sort of behavior, now almost a thing of the past, was always severely repressed by the authorities even in old days. I know several instances of it. And indeed, people in a humble position generally are irritated by any supercilious carelessness, any sign of contempt shown them. Some people think that if convicts are well fed and well kept and all the requirements of the law are satisfied, that is all that is necessary. This is an error, too. Everyone, whoever he may be and however downtrodden he may be, demands, though perhaps instinctively, perhaps unconsciously, respect for his dignity as a human being. The convict knows himself that he is a convict, an outcast, and knows his place before his commanding officer. But by no branding, by no fetters will you make him forget that he is a human being. And as he really is a human being, he ought to be treated humanely. My God, yes. Humane treatment may humanize even one in whom the image of God has long been obscured. These unfortunates need even more humane treatment than others. It is their salvation and their joy. I have met some good-hearted, high-minded officers. I have seen the influence they exerted on these degraded creatures. A few kind words from them meant almost a moral resurrection for the convicts. They were as pleased as children, and as children began to love them. I must mention another strange thing. The convicts themselves do not like to be treated too familiarly and too softly by their officers. They want to respect those in authority over them, and too much softness makes them cease to respect them. The convicts like their commanding officer to have decorations, too. They like him to be presentable. They like him to be in favor with some higher authority. They like him to be strict and important and just, and they like him to keep up his dignity. The convicts prefer such an officer. They feel that he keeps up his own dignity and does not insult them, and so they feel everything is right and as it should be. You must have caught it hot for that, Kobilin observed calmly. Hm, hot, my boy, yes. It was hot, certainly. I'll pass the scissors. Why is it they are not playing cards today, lads? They've drunk up all their money, observed Vasya. If they hadn't, they'd have been playing. If? They'll give you a hundred roubles for an if in Moscow, observed Luchka. And how much did you get altogether, Luchka? Kobilin began again. They gave me a hundred and five, my dear chap. And you know, they almost killed me, mates. Luchka declared, abandoning Kobilin again. They drove me out in full dress to be flogged. Till then I'd never tasted the lash. There were immense crowds, the whole town ran out. A robber was to be flogged, a murderer to be sure. You can't think what fools the people are, there's no telling you. The hangman stripped me, made me lie down and shouted, Look out, I'll sting you. I wondered what was coming. At the first lash I wanted to shout. I opened my mouth, but there was no shout in me. My voice failed me. When the second lash came, you may not believe it, I did not hear them count two. And when I came to, I heard them call seventeen. 
Four times, lad, they took me off the donkey and gave me half an hour's rest and poured water over me. I looked at them all with my eyes starting out of my head and thought, I shall die on the spot. And you didn't die? Kobilin asked naively. Luchka scanned him with a glance of immense contempt. There was a sound of laughter. He is a regular block. He is not quite right in the top story, observed Luchka, as though regretting he had deigned to converse with such a man. He is a natural, Vasya summed up conclusively. Though Luchka had murdered six people, no one was ever afraid of him in the prison. Yet perhaps it was his cherished desire to be considered a terrible man. Breaking in This chapter contains another occasion where Dostoevsky is doing his best to avoid casting blame on his contemporary Russian government. Since he is clearly attempting to avoid raising the hackles of the censor, it is unclear just how sincere he is when he denies that there are any officers left in Russia who tyrannize over their subordinates as though they are God or the Tsar. Dostoevsky has organized his content carefully in putting these two character sketches in back-to-back -back chapters. We can't help but notice a contrast between a Petrov on the one hand and a Luka Kuzmich on the other. I may come back to this issue in later remarks. End of comments. Chapter 9 Isai Fomich, The Bathhouse, Baklushin's Story Christmas was approaching. The convicts looked forward to it with a sort of solemnity, and looking at them, I, too, began to expect something unusual. Four days before Christmas Day, they took us to the bathhouse. In my time, especially in the early years, the convicts were rarely taken to the bathhouse. All were pleased and began to get ready. It was arranged to go after dinner, and that afternoon there was no work. The one who was most pleased and excited in our room was Isai Fomich Bumstein, a Jewish convict whom I have mentioned in the fourth chapter of my story. He liked to steam himself into a state of stupefaction, of unconsciousness, and whenever going over old memories I recall our prison baths, which deserve to be remembered, the blissful countenance of that prison comrade, whom I shall never forget, takes a foremost place in the picture. Heavens, how killingly funny he was! I have already said something about his appearance. He was a thin, feeble, puny man of fifty, with a wrinkled white body like a chicken's, and on his cheeks and forehead awful scars left from being branded. His face wore a continual expression of imperturbable self-complacency and even blissfulness. Apparently he felt no regret at being in prison. As he was a jeweler, and there were no jewelers in the town, he worked continually at nothing but his own trade for the gentry and officials of the town. He received some payment for his work. He wanted for nothing, was even rich, but he saved money and used to lend it out at interest to all the convicts. He had a samovar of his own, a good mattress, cups, and a whole dining outfit. The Jews in the town did not refuse him their acquaintance and patronage. On Saturdays he used to go with an escort to the synagogue in the town, which is sanctioned by law. He was in clover, in fact. At the same time he was impatiently awaiting the end of his twelve-year sentence to get married. He was a most comical mixture of naivety, stupidity, craft, impudence, good nature, timidity, boastfulness, and insolence. It surprised me that the convicts never jeered at him, though they sometimes made a joke at his expense. 
Isai Fomich was evidently a continual source of entertainment and amusement to all. He is our only one. Don't hurt Isai Fomich, was what they felt. And although Isai Fomich saw his position, he was obviously proud at being so important, and that greatly amused the convicts. His arrival in the prison was fearfully funny. It happened before my time, but I was told of it. One day, in the leisure hour towards evening, a rumor suddenly spread through the prison that a Jew had been brought, and was being shaved in the guard room, and that he would come in directly. There was not a single Jew in the prison at the time. The convicts waited with impatience and surrounded him at once when he came in at the gate. The sergeant led him to the civilian room and showed him his place on the common bed. Isai Fomich carried in his arms a sack containing his own belongings, together with the regulation articles which had been given to him. He laid down the sack, climbed onto the bed, and sat down, tucking his feet under him, not daring to raise his eyes. There were sounds of laughter and prison jokes alluding to his Jewish origin. Suddenly a young convict made his way through the crowd, carrying in his hand his very old, dirty, tattered summer trousers, together with the regulation leg wrappers. He sat down beside Isai Fomich and slapped him on the shoulder. I say, my dear friend, I've been looking out for you these last six years. Look here, how much will you give? And he spread the rags out before him. Isai Fomich, who had been too timid to utter a word, and so cowed at his first entrance that he had not dared to raise his eyes in the crowd of mocking, disfigured, and terrible faces which hemmed him in, was cheered at once at the sight of the proffered pledge, and began briskly turning over the rags. He even held them up to the light. Everyone waited to hear what he would say. Well, you won't give me a silver rouble, I suppose. It's worth it, you know, said the would-be borrower, winking at Isai Fomich. A silver rouble, no, but seven kopecks, maybe. And those were the first words uttered by Isai Fomich in prison. Everyone roared with laughter. Seven? Well, give me seven, then. It's a bit of luck for you. Mind you take care of the pledge. It's as much as your life's worth if you lose it. With three kopecks interest makes ten, the Jew went on jerkily in a shaking voice, putting his hand in his pocket for the money and looking timidly at the convicts. He was fearfully scared, and at the same time he wanted to do business. Three kopecks a year interest, I suppose? No, not a year. A month. You're a tight customer, Jew. What's your name? Isai Fomich. Well, Isai Fomich, you'll get on finely here. Goodbye. Isai Fomich examined the pledge once more, folded it up carefully, and put it in his sack in the midst of the still laughing convicts. Everyone really seemed to like him, and no one was rude to him, though almost all owed him money. He was himself as free from malice as a hen, and seeing the general goodwill with which he was regarded, he even swaggered a little, but with such simple-hearted absurdity that he was forgiven at once. Luchka, who had known many Jews in his day, often teased him, and not out of ill-feeling, but simply for diversion, just as one teases dogs, parrots, or any sort of trained animal. Isai Fomich saw that clearly, was not in the least offended, and answered him back adroitly. Hey, Jew, I'll give you a dressing. You give me one blow, and I'll give you ten, Isai Fomich would respond gallantly. You damned scab! I don't care if I am. You itching Jew! I don't care if I am. I may itch, but I am rich. I've money. You sold Christ. 
I don't care if I did. That's right, Isai Formich, bravo! Don't touch him, he's the only one we've got. The convicts would shout, laughing. I do, you'll get the whip. You'll be sent to Siberia. Why, I am in Siberia now. Well, you'll go further. And is the Lord God there too? Well, I suppose he is. Well, I don't mind then. If the Lord God is there and there's money, I shall be all right everywhere. Bravo, Isai Fomich, you are a fine chap, no mistake, the convicts shouted round him. And though Isai Fomich saw they were laughing at him, he was not cast down. The general approval afforded him unmistakable pleasure, and he began caroling a shrill little chant, La 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 la, all over the prison, an absurd and ridiculous tune without words, the only tune he hummed all the years he was in prison. Afterwards, when he got to know me better, he protested on oath to me that that was the very song and the very tune that the six hundred thousand Jews, big and little, had sung as they crossed the Red Sea, and that it is ordained for every Jew to sing that song at the moment of triumph and victory over his enemies. Every Friday evening convicts came to our ward from other parts of the prison on purpose to see Isai Fomich celebrate his Sabbath. Isai Fomich was so naively vain and boastful that this general interest gave him pleasure too. With pedantic and studied gravity he covered his little table in the corner, opened his book, lighted two candles, and muttering some mysterious words began putting on his vestment. It was a party-colored shawl of woolen material which he kept carefully in his box. He tied phylacteries on both hands and tied some sort of wooden ark by means of a bandage on his head, right over his forehead, so that it looked like a ridiculous horn sprouting out of his forehead. Then the prayer began. He repeated it in a chant, uttered cries, spat on the floor, and turned round, making wild and absurd gesticulations. All this, of course, was part of the ceremony, and there was nothing absurd or strange about it. But what was absurd was that Isai Fomich seemed purposely to be playing a part before us, and made a show of his ritual. Suddenly he would hide his head in his hands and recite with sobs. The sobs grew louder, and in a state of exhaustion and almost howling, he would let his head, crowned with the ark, drop on the book. But suddenly, in the middle of the most violent sobbing, he would begin to laugh and chant in a voice broken with feeling and solemnity, and weak with bliss. "'Isn't he going it?' the convicts commented. I once asked Isai Fomich what was the meaning of the sobs and then the sudden solemn transition to happiness and bliss. Isai Fomich particularly liked such questions from me. He at once explained to me that the weeping and sobbing were aroused at the thought of the loss of Jerusalem, and that the ritual prescribed sobbing as violently as possible and beating the breast at the thought. But at the moment of the loudest sobbing, he, Isai Fomich, was suddenly, as it were accidentally, the suddenness was also prescribed by the ritual, to remember that there is a prophecy of the return of the Jews to Jerusalem. Then he must at once burst into joy, song, and laughter, and must repeat his prayers in such a way that his voice itself should express as much happiness as possible and his face should express all the solemnity and dignity of which it was capable. This sudden transition and the obligation to make it were a source of extreme pleasure to Isai Fomich. He saw in it a very subtle Kunststück, and boastfully told me of this difficult rule. Once, when the prayer was in full swing, the Major came into the ward accompanied by the officer on duty and the sentries, all the convicts drew themselves up by the bed. Isai Fomich alone began shouting and carrying on more than ever. He knew that the prayer was not prohibited. 
It was impossible to interrupt it, and, of course, there was no risk in his shouting before the major. But he particularly enjoyed making a display before the major and showing off before us. The major went up within a step of him. Isai Fomich turned with his back to his table and, waving his hands, began chanting his solemn prophecy right in the major's face. As it was prescribed for him to express extreme happiness and dignity in his face at that moment, he did so immediately, screwing up his eyes in a peculiar way, laughing and nodding his head at the major. The major was surprised but finally went off into a guffaw, called him a fool to his face and walked away, and Isai Fomich vociferated louder than ever. An hour later, when he was having supper, I asked him, And what if the major in his foolishness had flown into a rage? What major? What major? Why, didn't you see him? No. Why, he stood not a yard away from you, just facing you. But Isai Fomich began earnestly assuring me that he had not seen the major, and that at the time, during the prayer, he was usually in such a state of ecstasy that he saw nothing and heard nothing of what was going on around him. I can see Isai Fomich before me now as he used to wander about the prison on Saturdays with nothing to do, making tremendous efforts to do nothing at all, as prescribed by the law of the Sabbath. What incredible anecdotes he used to tell me every time he came back from the synagogue. What prodigious news and rumors from Petersburg he used to bring me, assuring me that he had got them from his fellow Jews, and that they had them firsthand. But I have said too much of Isai Fomich. There were only two public baths in the town, one of these, which was kept by a Jew, consisted of separate bathrooms, for each of which a fee of fifty kopecks was charged. It was an establishment for people of the higher class. The other bathhouse was intended for the working class. It was dilapidated, dirty, and small, and it was to this house that we convicts were taken. It was frosty and sunny and the convicts were delighted at the very fact of getting out of the fortress grounds and looking at the town. The jokes and laughter never flagged all the way. A whole platoon of soldiers with loaded rifles accompanied us, to the admiration of the whole town. In the bathhouse we were immediately divided into two relays. The second relay had to wait in the cold anteroom while the first were washing themselves. This division was necessary because the bathhouse was so small. But the space was so limited that it was difficult to imagine how even half of our number could find room. Yet Petrov did not desert me. He skipped up of his own accord to help and even offered to wash me. Another convict who offered me his services was Baklushin, a prisoner in the special division who was nicknamed the Pioneer, and to whom I have referred already as one of the liveliest and most charming of the convicts, as indeed he was. I was already slightly acquainted with him. Petrov even helped me to undress, for, not being used to it, I was slow undressing, and it was cold in the anteroom, almost as cold as in the open air. It is, by the way, very difficult for a convict to undress till he has quite mastered the art. To begin with, one has to learn how to unlace quickly the bands under the ankle irons. These bands are made of leather, are eight inches in length, and are put on over the undergarment, just under the ring that goes round the ankle. A pair of these bands costs no less than sixty kopecks, and yet every convict procures them, at his own expense, of course, for it is impossible to walk without them. The ring does not fit tightly on the leg. One could put one's finger in between, so that the iron strikes against the flesh and rubs it. And without the leather, a convict would rub his leg into a sore in a day. But to get off the bands is not difficult. 
It is more difficult to learn how to get off one's underlinen from under the fetters. It is quite a special art. Drawing off the undergarment from the left leg, for instance, one has first to pull it down between the ring and the leg. Then, freeing one's foot, one has to draw the linen up again between the leg and the ring. Then the whole of the left leg of the garment has to be slipped through the ring on the right ankle and pulled back again. One has to go through the same business when one puts on clean linen. It is hard for a novice even to guess how it can be done. I was first taught how to do it at Tobolsk by a convict called Korenev, who had been the chief of a band of robbers and had been for five years chained to the wall. But the convicts get used to it and go through the operation without the slightest difficulty. I gave Petrov a few kopecks to get me soap and a handful of tow. Soap was indeed served out to the convicts, a piece each, the size of a halfpenny and as thick as the slices of cheese served at the beginning of supper among middle-class people. Soap was sold in the anteroom as well as hot spiced mead, rolls, and hot water. By contract with the keeper of the bathhouse, each convict was allowed only one bucketful of hot water. Everyone who wanted to wash himself cleaner could get for a halfpenny another bucketful, which was passed from the anteroom into the bathroom through a little window made on purpose. When he had undressed me, Petrov took me by the arm, noticing that it was very difficult for me to walk in fetters. "'You must pull them higher onto your calves,' he kept repeating, supporting me as though he were my nurse. "'And now be careful, here's a step.' I felt a little ashamed indeed. I wanted to assure Petrov that I could walk alone, but he would not have believed it. He treated me exactly like a child not able to manage alone, whom everyone ought to help. Petrov was far from being a servant. He was preeminently not a servant. If I had offended him, he would have known how to deal with me. I had not promised him payment for his services, and he did not ask for it himself. What induced him, then, to look after me in this way? When we opened the door into the bathroom itself, I thought we were entering hell. Imagine a room twelve paces long and the same in breadth, in which perhaps as many as a hundred and certainly as many as eighty were packed at once, for the whole party were divided into only two relays, and we were close on two hundred. Steam blinding one's eyes, filth and grime, such a crowd that there was not room to put one's foot down. I was frightened and tried to step back, but Petrov at once encouraged me. With extreme difficulty we somehow forced our way to the benches round the wall, stepping over the heads of those who were sitting on the floor, asking them to duck to let us get by. But every place on the benches was taken. Petrov informed me that one had to buy a place, and at once entered into negotiations with the convict sitting near the window. For a kopeck the latter gave up his place, receiving the money at once from Petrov, who had the coin ready in his fist, having providently brought it with him into the bathroom. The convict I had ousted at once ducked under the bench just under my place, where it was dark and filthy, and the dirty slime lay two inches thick. But even the space under the benches was all filled. There, too, the place was alive with human beings. There was not a spot on the floor as big as the palm of your hand where there was not a convict squatting, splashing from his bucket. Others stood up among them, and, holding their buckets in their hands, washed themselves standing. The dirty water trickled off them onto the shaven heads of the convicts sitting below them. On the top shelf and on all the steps leading up to it, men were crouched, huddled together, washing themselves. But they did not wash themselves much. 
Men of the peasant class don't wash much with soap and hot water. They only steam themselves terribly and then douche themselves with cold water. That is their whole idea of a bath. Fifty birches were rising and falling rhythmically on the shelves. They all thrashed themselves into a state of stupefaction. More steam was raised every moment. It was not heat. It was hell. All were shouting and vociferating to the accompaniment of a hundred chains clanking on the floor. Some of them, wanting to pass, got entangled in other men's chains and caught in their own chains the heads of those below them. They fell down, swore, and dragged those they caught after them. Liquid filth ran in all directions. Everyone seemed in a sort of intoxicated, overexcited condition. There were shrieks and cries. By the window of the anteroom from which the water was handed out, there was swearing, crowding, and a regular scuffle. The fresh hot water was spilt over the heads of those who were sitting on the floor before it reached its destination. Now and then the mustached face of a soldier with a gun in his hand peeped in at the window or the half-open door to see whether there were anything wrong. The shaven heads and crimson steaming bodies of the convicts seemed more hideous than ever. As a rule, the steaming backs of the convicts show distinctly the scars of the blows or lashes they have received in the past, so that all those backs looked now as though freshly wounded. The scars were horrible. A shiver ran down me at the sight of them. They pour more boiling water on the hot bricks, and clouds of thick, hot steam fill the whole bathhouse. They all laugh and shout. Through the cloud of steam one gets glimpses of scarred backs, shaven heads, bent arms and legs. And to complete the picture, Isai Fomich is shouting with laughter on the very top shelf. He is steaming himself into a state of unconsciousness, but no degree of heat seems to satisfy him. For a kopeck he has hired a man to beat him, but the latter is exhausted at last flings down his birch and runs off to douche himself with cold water. Isai Fomich is not discouraged and hires another, and a third. He is resolved on such an occasion to disregard expense and hires even a fifth man to wield the birch. He knows how to steam himself. Bravo, Isai Fomich! The convicts shout to him from below. Isai Fomich, for his part, feels that at the moment he is superior to everyone and has outdone them all. He is triumphant, and in a shrill, crazy voice screams out his tune, La 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 la, which rises above all the other voices. It occurred to me that if one day we should all be in hell together, it would be very much like this place. I could not help expressing this thought to Petrov. He merely looked round and said nothing. I wanted to buy him, too, a place beside me, but he sat down at my feet and declared that he was very comfortable. Meantime, Baklushin was buying us water and brought it as we wanted it. Petrov declared that he would wash me from head to foot, so that you will be all nice and clean and he urged me to be steamed. This I did not venture on. Petrov soaped me all over. But now I'll wash your little feet, he added in conclusion. I wanted to reply that I could wash them myself, but I did not contradict him, and gave myself into his hands completely. There was not the faintest note of servility about the expression little feet. It was simply that Petrov could not call my feet simply feet, probably because other real people had feet, while mine were little feet. After having washed me, he led me back into the anteroom with the same ceremonies, that is, giving me the same support and warnings at every step, as though I were made of china. Then he helped me to put on my linen, 
and only when he had quite finished with me he rushed back to the bathroom to steam himself. When we got home I offered him a glass of tea. Tea he did not refuse. He emptied the glass and thanked me. I thought I would be lavish and treat him to a glass of vodka. This was forthcoming in our ward. Petrov was extremely pleased. He drank it, cleared his throat, and observing that I had quite revived him, hurried off to the kitchen as though there were something there that could not be settled without him. His place was taken by another visitor, Baklushin, the pioneer, whom I had invited to have tea with me before we left the bathhouse. I don't know a more charming character than Baklushin's. It was true that he would not knuckle under to anyone. Indeed, he often quarreled. He did not like people to meddle with his affairs. In short, he knew how to take his own part. But he never quarreled for long, and I believe we all liked him. Wherever he went, everyone met him with pleasure. He was known even in the town as the most amusing fellow in the world who was always in high spirits. He was a tall fellow of thirty, with a good-natured and spirited countenance, rather good-looking, though he had a wart on his face. He could contort his features in a killing way, mimicking anyone he came across, so that no one near him could help laughing. He, too, belonged to the class of comic men, but he would not be sat upon by those who despised and detested laughter, so they never abused him for being a foolish and useless person. He was full of fire and life. He made my acquaintance during my first days and told me that he was a cantonist and had afterwards served in the pioneers, and had even been noticed and favored by some great personages, a fact which he still remembered with great pride. He began at once questioning me about Petersburg, he even used to read. When he came to have tea with me, he at once entertained the whole ward by describing what a dressing down Lieutenant S. had given the Major that morning, and sitting down beside me, he told me with a look of pleasure that the theatricals would probably come off. They were getting up theatricals in the prison for Christmas. Actors had been discovered and scenery was being got ready by degrees. Some people in the town had promised to lend dresses for the actors, even for the female characters. They positively hoped by the assistance of an orderly to obtain an officer's uniform with epaulets. If only the major did not take it into his head to forbid it as he did last year. But last Christmas he had been in a bad temper, he had lost at cards somewhere, and besides there had been mischief in the prison, so he had forbidden it out of spite. But now perhaps he would not want to hinder it. In short, Baklushin was excited. It was evident that he was one of the most active in getting up the performance, and I inwardly resolved on the spot that I would certainly be present. Baklushin's simple-hearted delight that everything was going well with the theatricals pleased me. Little by little we got into talk. Among other things he told me that he had not always served in Petersburg, that he had been guilty of some misdemeanor there and had been transferred to R, though as a sergeant in a garrison regiment. "'It was from there I was sent here,' observed Baklushin. "'But what for?' I asked. "'What for? What do you think it was for, Alexander Petrovitch? "'Because I fell in love.' "'Oh, well, they don't send people here for that yet,' I retorted, laughing. "'It is true,' Baklushin added. "'It's true that through that I shot a German there with my pistol.' But was the German worth sending me here for? Tell me that. But how was it? Tell me, it's interesting. It's a very funny story, Alexander Petrovitch. So much the better. Tell me. Shall I? Well, listen then. 
I heard a strange, though not altogether amusing, story of a murder. This is how it was, Baklushin began. When I was sent to R, I saw it was a fine big town, only there were a lot of Germans in it. Well, of course, I was a young man then. I stood well with the officers. I used to pass the time walking about with my cap on one side, winking at the German girls. And one little German girl, Louisa, took my fancy. They were both laundresses, only doing the finest work, she and her aunt. Her aunt was a stuck-up old thing, and they were well off. I used to walk up and down outside their windows at first, and then I got to be real friends with her. Louisa spoke Russian well, too. She only lisped a little, as it were. She was such a darling. I never met one like her. I was for being too free at first, but she said to me, No, you mustn't, Sasha, for I want to keep all my innocence to make you a good wife. And she'd only caress me and laugh like a bell. And she was such a clean little thing. I never saw anyone like her. She suggested our getting married herself. Now, could I help marrying her? Tell me that. So I made up my mind to go to the lieutenant colonel for permission. One day I noticed Louisa did not turn up at our meeting place, and again a second time she didn't come, and again a third. I sent a letter. No answer. What is it, I wondered? If she had been deceiving me, she would have contrived somehow, have answered the letter, and have come to meet me. But she did not know how to tell a lie, so she simply cut it off. It's her aunt, I thought. I didn't dare go to the aunt's, though she knew it, we always met on the quiet. I went about as though I were crazy. I wrote her a last letter and said, If you don't come, I shall come to your aunt's myself. She was frightened and came. She cried. She told me that a German called Schultz, a distant relation, a watchmaker, well off and elderly, had expressed a desire to marry her. To make me happy, he says, and not to be left without a wife in his old age. And he loves me, he says, and he's had the idea in his mind for a long time, but he kept putting it off and saying nothing. You see, Sasha, she said, he is rich, and it's a fortunate thing for me. Surely you don't want to deprive me of my good fortune. I looked at her. She was crying and hugging me. Yeah, I thought, she is talking sense. What's the use of marrying a soldier, even though I am a sergeant? Well, Louisa, said I, Goodbye, God be with you. I've no business to hinder your happiness. Tell me, is he good-looking? No, she said. He is an old man with a long nose. And she laughed herself. I left her. Well, I thought, it was not fated to be. The next morning I walked by his shop. She had told me the street. I looked in at the window. There was a German sitting there, mending a watch, a man of forty-five with a hooked nose and goggle eyes, wearing a tailcoat and a high stand-up collar. Such a solemn-looking fellow. I fairly cursed. I should like to have broken his window on the spot. But there, I thought, it's no good touching him. It's no good crying over spilt milk. I went home to the barracks at dusk, laid down on my bed, and would you believe it, Alexander Petrovitch, I burst out crying. Well, that day passed, and another, and a third. I did not see Louisa. And meantime I heard from a friend, she was an old lady, another laundress whom Louisa sometimes went to see, that the German knew of our love, and that was why he made up his mind to propose at once, or else he would have waited another two or three years. 
He had made Louisa promise, it seemed, that she would not see me again, and that so far he was, it seems, rather churlish with both of them, Louisa and her aunt, as though he might change his mind and had not quite decided even now. She told me, too, that the day after tomorrow, Sunday, he had invited them both to have coffee with him in the morning, and that there would be another relation there, an old man who had been a merchant but was very poor now and served as a caretaker in a basement. When I knew that maybe on Sunday everything would be settled, I was seized with such fury that I did not know what I was doing. And all that day and all the next I could do nothing but think of it. I felt I could eat that German. On Sunday morning I did not know what I would do, but when the mass was over I jumped up, put on my overcoat, and set off to the Germans. I thought I would find them all there. And why I went to the Germans and what I meant to say I did not know myself. But I put a pistol in my pocket to be ready for anything. I had a wretched little pistol with an old-fashioned trigger. I used to fire it as a boy. It wasn't fit to be used. But I put a bullet in it. I thought, if they try turning me out and being rude, I'll pull out the pistol and frighten them all. I got there. There was no one in the shop. They were all sitting in the back room. And not a soul but themselves, no servant. He had only one, a German cook. I walked through the shop and saw the door was shut. But it was an old door, fastening with a hook. My heart beat. I stood still and listened. They were talking German. I kicked the door with all my might, and it opened. I saw the table was laid. On the table there was a big coffee pot, and the coffee was boiling on a spirit lamp. There were biscuits. On another tray a decanter of vodka, herring and sausage, and another bottle with wine of some sort. Louisa and her aunt were sitting on the sofa, dressed in their best. On a chair opposite them the German, her suitor, with his hair combed, in a tailcoat and a stand-up collar sticking out in front. And in another chair at the side sat another German, a fat, grey-headed old man who did not say a word. When I went in, Louisa turned white. The aunt started up, but sat down again, and the German frowned, looking so cross, and got up to meet me. "'What do you want?' said he. I was a bit abashed, but I was in such a rage. "'What do I want? Why, you might welcome a visitor and give him a drink. I've come to see you.' The German thought a minute and said, Sit you. I sat down. Well, give me some vodka, I said. Here's some vodka, he said. Drink it, pray. Give me some good vodka, said I. I was in an awful rage, you know. It is good vodka. I felt insulted that he treated me as though I were of no account, and above all with Louisa looking on. I drank it off and said, "'What do you want to be rude for, German? You must make friends with me. I've come to you as a friend.' "'I cannot with you be a friend,' said he. "'You are a simple soldier.' Then I flew into a fury. "'Ah, you scarecrow!' I said. "'You sausage-eater! "'But you know that from this moment I can do anything I like with you. "'Would you like me to shoot you with my pistol?' "'I pulled out my pistol, stood before him, and put the muzzle straight at his head. "'The woman sat more dead than alive, afraid to stir. "'The old man was trembling like a leaf. "'He turned pale and didn't say a word.' The German was surprised, but he pulled himself together. "'I do not fear you,' said he. 
and I beg you as an honorable man to drop your joke at once, and I do not fear you. That's a lie, said I. You do. Why, he did not dare to move his head away. He just sat there. No, said he. You that will never dare. Why don't I dare, said I. Because, said he, that you is strictly forbidden, and for that they will you strictly punished. The devil only knows what that fool of a German was after. If he hadn't egged me on, he'd have been living to this day. It all came from our disputing. So I daren't, you think? No, I daren't. To treat me so, you will never dare. Well, there then, sausage. I went bang, and he rolled off his chair. The woman screamed. I put the pistol in my pocket and made off, and as I was going into the fortress I threw the pistol into the nettles at the gate. I went home, laid down on my bed, and thought, they'll come and take me directly. One hour passed, and then another. They did not take me, and when it got dark such misery came over me. I went out. I wanted to see Louisa, whatever happened. I went by the watchmaker's shop. There was a crowd there and police. I went to my old friend. Fetch Louisa, said I. I waited a little, and then I saw Louisa running up. She threw herself on my neck and cried. It's all my fault, said she, for listening to my aunt. She told me that her aunt had gone straight home after what happened that morning, and was so frightened that she was taken ill and said nothing. She's told no one herself, and she's forbidden me too, says she. She is afraid and feels, let them do what they like. No one saw us this morning, said Louisa. He had sent his servant away too, for he was afraid of her. She would have scratched his eyes out if she had known that he meant to get married. There were none of the workmen in the house either. He had sent them all out. He prepared the coffee himself and got lunch ready. And the relation had been silent all his life. He never used to say anything. And when it all happened that morning, he picked up his hat and was the first to go. And no doubt he will go on being silent, said Louisa. So it was. For a fortnight no one came to take me, and no one had any suspicion of me. That fortnight, though you mayn't believe it, Alexander Petrovitch, was the happiest time in my life. Every day I met Louisa. And how tender, how tender she grew to me. She would cry and say, I'll follow you wherever they send you. I'll leave everything for you. It was almost more than I could bear. She wrung my heart so. Well, and in a fortnight they took me. The old man and the aunt came to an understanding and gave information against me. But excuse me, I interrupted. For that they could not have given you more than ten or twelve years at the utmost in the civil division. But you are in the special division. How can that be? Oh, that is a different matter, said Baklushin. When I was brought to the court, the captain swore at me with nasty words before the court. I couldn't control myself and said to him, What are you swearing for? Don't you see you are in a court of justice, you scoundrel? Well, that gave a new turn to things. They tried me again, and for everything together they condemned me to four thousand blows and sent me here in the special division. And when they brought me out for punishment, they brought out the captain too. Me to walk down the green street, and him to be deprived of his rank and sent to serve as a soldier in the Caucasus. Goodbye, Alexander Petrovitch. Come and see our performance. Breaking in. 
The bathhouse scene is one of the more famous passages in the book, and it frequently induces comparisons with the imagery of Dante's Inferno. I prefer to interpret Petrov's assistance to Goryanchikov in the bathhouse as kind devotion toward a weaker creature who is clearly out of his element, although one could, I suppose, read a subtle layer of homoeroticism into it. On this score, I should probably note that Chapter 7 gives us independent reason to believe that Petrov occasionally secures Sorotkin's services. But again, I am not confident about this possible subtext, and I prefer the more straightforward interpretation. Baklushin's story is the first account we have in the book of murder over sexual jealousy, with the exception of Goryanchikov's own backstory as provided by the introduction. There is another account coming up later, however, which will demand further discussion. End of comments. Chapter 10 Christmas At last the holidays came. The convicts did hardly any work on Christmas Eve. Some went to the sewing rooms and workshops. The others were sent to their different tasks, but for the most part singly or in groups came back to prison immediately afterwards, and they all remained indoors after dinner. Indeed, the majority had left the prison in the morning more on their own business than for regulation work. Some to arrange about bringing in and ordering vodka, others to see friends, male and female, or to collect any little sums owing to them for work done in the past. Baklushin and others who were taking part in the theatricals went to see certain acquaintances, principally among the officers' servants, and to obtain necessary costumes. Some went about with an anxious and responsible air, simply because others looked responsible, and though many of them had no grounds for expecting money, they too looked as though they were reckoning on getting it. In short, everyone was looking forward to the next day in expectation of a change, of something unusual. In the evening, the veterans in charge who had been marketing for the convicts brought in eatables of all sorts, beef, sucking pigs, even geese. Many of the convicts, even the humblest and most careful who used to save up their farthings from one year's end to another, felt obliged to be lavish for such an occasion and to celebrate befittingly the end of the fast. The next day was a real holiday, guaranteed to them by law and not to be taken from them. On that day the convict could not be set to work, and there were only three such days in the year. And who knows what memories must have been stirred in the hearts of these outcasts at the coming of such a day. The great festivals of the church make a vivid impression on the minds of peasants from childhood upwards. They are the days of rest from their hard toil, the days of family gatherings. In prison they must have been remembered with grief and heartache. Respect for the solemn day had passed indeed into a custom strictly observed among the convicts. Very few caroused, all were serious and seemed preoccupied, though many of them had really nothing to do. But whether they drank or did nothing, they tried to keep up a certain dignity. It seemed as though laughter were prohibited. In fact, they showed a tendency to be over-particular and irritably intolerant, and if anyone jarred on the prevailing mood, even by accident, the convicts set on him with outcries and abuse and were angry with him, as though he had shown disrespect to the holiday itself. This state of mind in the convicts was remarkable and positively touching. Apart from their innate reverence for the great day, the convicts felt unconsciously that by the observance of Christmas they were, as it were, in touch with the whole of the world, that they were not altogether outcasts and lost men, not altogether cut off, 
that it was the same in prison as amongst other people. They felt that. It was evident and easy to understand. Akim Akimich too, made great preparations for the holiday. He had no home memories, for he had grown up an orphan among strangers, and had faced the hardships of military service before he was sixteen. He had nothing very joyful to remember in his life, for he had always lived regularly and monotonously, afraid of stepping one hair's breadth out of the prescribed path. He was not particularly religious either, for propriety seemed to have swallowed up in him all other human qualities and attributes, all passions and desires, bad and good alike. And so he was preparing for the festival without anxiety or excitement, untroubled by painful and quite useless reminiscences, but with a quiet, methodical propriety which was just sufficient for the fulfillment of his duties and of the ritual that has been prescribed once and for all. As a rule, he did not care for much reflection. The inner meaning of things never troubled his mind, but rules that had once been laid down for him he followed with religious exactitude. If it had been made the rule to do exactly the opposite, he would have done that tomorrow with the same docility and scrupulousness. Once only in his life he had tried to act on his own judgment, and that had brought him to prison. The lesson had not been thrown away on him. And though destiny withheld from him forever all understanding of how he had been to blame, he had deduced a solitary principle from his misadventure, never to use his own judgment again under any circumstances, for sense was not his strong point, as the convicts used to say. In his blind devotion to established ritual, he looked with a sort of anticipatory reverence even upon the festal sucking pig, which he himself stuffed with kasha and roasted, for he knew how to cook, as though regarding it not as an ordinary pig which could be bought and roasted any day, but as a special holiday pig. Perhaps he had been used from childhood to see a sucking pig on the table at Christmas, and had deduced from it that a sucking pig was indispensable on the occasion and I am sure that if he had once missed tasting sucking pig on Christmas Day, he would for the rest of his life have felt a conscience prick at having neglected his duty. Until Christmas Day he remained in his old jacket and trousers, which were quite threadbare, though neatly darned. It appeared now that he had been carefully keeping away in his box the new suit given to him four months ago, and had refrained from touching it, with a delectable idea of putting it on for the first time on Christmas Day. And so he did. On Christmas Eve he got out his new suit, unfolded it, examined it, brushed it, blew on it, and tried it on. The suit seemed a good fit. Everything was as it should be, buttoning tightly to the collar. The high collar stood up as stiff as cardboard under his chin, at the waist it fitted closely, almost like a uniform. Akim Akimich positively grinned with delight, and not without a certain swagger he turned before the tiny looking-glass, round which at some leisure moment he had pasted a border of gold paper. Only one hook on the collar seemed not quite in the right place. Noticing it, Akim Akimich made up his mind to alter it. He moved it, tried the coat on again, and then it was perfectly right. Then he folded it up as before and put it away in his box again, with his mind at rest. His head was satisfactorily shaven, but examining himself carefully in the looking-glass he noticed that his head did not seem perfectly smooth. There was a scarcely visible growth of hair, and he went at once to the Major to be properly shaven according to regulation. And although Akim Akimich was not to be inspected next day, he was shaven simply for conscience' sake, that he might leave no duty unperformed before Christmas. A reverence for epaulets, buttons, and details of uniform had from childhood been indelibly impressed upon his mind and upon his heart, as a duty that could not be questioned, 
and as the highest form of the beautiful that could be attained by a decent man. After this, as the senior convict in the ward, he gave orders for hay to be brought in, and carefully superintended the laying of it on the floor. The same thing was done in the other wards. I don't know why, but hay was always laid on the floor at Christmas time. Then, having finished his labors, Akim Akimich said his prayers, lay down in his bed, and at once fell into a sweet sleep like a baby's, to wake up as early as possible next morning. All the convicts did the same, however. In all the wards they went to bed much earlier than usual. Their usual evening pursuits were laid aside. There was no thought of cards. All was expectation of the coming day. At last it came. Quite early, before daybreak, as soon as the morning drum had sounded, the wards were unlocked, and the sergeant on duty who came in to count over the prisoners gave them Christmas greetings, and was greeted by them in the same way, with warmth and cordiality. After hastily saying their prayers, Akim Akimich and many of the others who had geese or sucking pigs in the kitchen hurried off to see what was being done with them, how the roasting was getting on, where they had been put, and so on. From the little prison windows blocked up with snow and ice, we could see through the darkness in both kitchens bright fires that had been kindled before daybreak, glowing in all the six ovens. Convicts were already flitting across the courtyard with their sheepskins properly put on or flung across their shoulders, all rushing to the kitchen. Some, though very few, had already been to the publicans. They were the most impatient. On the whole, all behaved decorously, peaceably, and with an exceptional seemliness. One heard nothing of the usual swearing and quarreling. Everyone realized that it was a great day and a holy festival. Some went into other wards to greet special friends. One saw signs of something like friendship. I may mention in parenthesis that there was scarcely a trace of friendly feeling among the convicts. I don't mean general friendliness, that was quite out of the question. I mean the personal affection of one convict for another. There was scarcely a trace of such feeling among us, and it is a remarkable fact. It is so different in the world at large. All of us, as a rule, with very rare exceptions, were rough and cold in our behavior to one another, and this was, as it were, the accepted attitude adopted once for all. I, too, went out of the ward. It was just beginning to get light. The stars were growing dim, and a faint, frosty haze was rising. The smoke was puffing in clouds from the kitchen chimneys. Some of the convicts I came upon in the yard met me with ready and friendly Christmas greetings. I thanked them and greeted them in the same way. Some of them had never said a word to me till that day. At the kitchen door I was overtaken by a convict from the military division with his sheepskin thrown over his shoulders. He had caught sight of me in the middle of the yard and shouted after me, Alexander Petrovitch! Alexander Petrovitch! He was running towards the kitchen in a hurry. I stopped and waited for him. He was a young lad with a round face and a gentle expression, very taciturn with everyone. He had not spoken a word to me or taken any notice of me since I entered the prison. I did not even know his name. He ran up to me out of breath and stood facing me, gazing at me with a blank but at the same time blissful smile. "'What is it?' I asked, wondering, seeing that he was standing at gazing at me with opened eyes, was smiling but not saying a word. "'Why, it's Christmas!' he muttered, and realizing that he could say nothing more, he left me and rushed into the kitchen." I may mention here that we had never had anything to do with one another, and scarcely spoke from that time till I left the prison. 
In the kitchen, round the glowing ovens, there was great crowding and bustling. Quite a crush. Everyone was looking after his property. The cooks were beginning to prepare the prison dinner, which was earlier that day. No one had yet begun eating, though some of them wanted to, but they had a regard for decorum in the presence of the others. They were waiting for the priest, and the fast was only to be broken after his visit. Meanwhile, before it was fully daylight, we heard the corporal at the prison gate calling the cooks. He shouted almost every minute and went on for nearly two hours. The cooks were wanted to receive the offerings, which were brought into the prison from all parts of the town. An immense quantity of provisions was brought, such as rolls, cheesecakes, pastries, scones, pancakes, and similar good things. I believe there was not a housewife of the middle or lower class in the town who did not send something of her baking by way of Christmas greeting to the unfortunate and captives. There were rich offerings, large quantities of fancy bread made of the finest flour. There were very humble offerings, too, such as a farthing roll and a couple of rye cakes with a smear of sour cream on them. These were the gifts of the poor to the poor, and all they had to give. All were accepted with equal gratitude, without distinction of gifts and givers. The convicts took off their caps as they received them, bowed, gave their Christmas greetings, and took the offerings into the kitchen. When the offerings were piled up in heaps, the senior convicts were sent for, and they divided all equally among the wards. There was no scolding or quarreling. It was honestly and equitably done. The share that was brought to our ward was divided among us by Akim Akimich with the help of another convict. They divided it with their own hands, and with their own hands gave each convict his share. There was not the slightest protest, not the slightest jealousy. All were satisfied. There could be no suspicion of an offering being concealed or unfairly divided. Having seen to his cooking, Akim Akimich proceeded to array himself. He dressed himself with all due decorum and solemnity, not leaving one hook unfastened, and as soon as he was dressed he began saying his real prayers. He spent a good time over them. A good many of the convicts, chiefly the elder ones, were already standing saying their prayers. The younger ones did not pray much. The most they did, even on a holiday, was to cross themselves when they got up. When his prayers were over, Akim Akimich came up to me, and with a certain solemnity offered me his Christmas greeting. I at once invited him to join me at tea, and he invited me to share his sucking pig. Soon after, Petrov, too, ran up to greet me. He seemed to have been drinking already, and, though he ran up out of breath, he did not say much. He only stood a little while before me as though expecting something, and soon went off into the kitchen again. Meanwhile, in the military ward, they were preparing for the priest. That ward was arranged differently from the others. The plank bed ran along the walls instead of being in the middle of the room as in all the other wards, so that it was the only room in the prison which had a clear space in the middle. It probably was so arranged in order that, when necessary, the convicts could be all gathered together there. In the middle of the room they put a table, covered it with a clean towel, and on it set the icon and lighted the lamp before us. At last the priest came with the cross and the holy water. After repeating prayers and singing before the icon, he stood facing the convicts, and all of them with genuine reverence came forward to kiss the cross. Then the priest walked through all the wards and sprinkled them with holy water. In the kitchen he praised our prison bread, which was famous throughout the town, and the convicts at once wanted to send him two new freshly baked loaves. A veteran was at once dispatched to take them. 
They followed the cross out with the same reverence with which they had welcomed it, and then almost immediately the governor and the major arrived. The governor was liked and even respected among us. He walked through all the wards, escorted by the major. He gave them all Christmas greetings, went into the kitchen and tried the prison soup. The soup was excellent. Nearly a pound of beef for each prisoner had been put into it in honor of the occasion. There was boiled millet, too, and butter was liberally allowed. When he had seen the governor off, the major gave orders that they should begin dinner. The convicts tried to avoid his eye. We did not like the spiteful way in which he glanced to right and to left from behind his spectacles, trying even today to find something amiss, someone to blame. We began dinner. Akim Akimich's sucking pig was superbly cooked. I don't know how to explain it, but immediately after the major had gone, within five minutes of his departure, an extraordinary number of people were drunk, and yet only five minutes before they had all been almost sober. One suddenly saw flushed and beaming faces, and balalaikas were brought out. The little pole with a fiddle was already at the heels of a reveller who had engaged him for the whole day. He was scraping away merry jig tunes. The talk began to grow louder and more drunken. But they got through dinner without much disturbance. Everyone had had enough. Many of the older and more sedate at once lay down to sleep. Akim Akimich did the same, apparently feeling that on a great holiday one must sleep after dinner. The old dissenter from Starodubov had a brief nap and then clambered on the stove, opened his book, and prayed almost uninterruptedly till the dead of night. It was painful to him to see the shamefulness, as he said, of the convicts carousing. All the Circassians settled themselves on the steps and gazed at the drunken crowd with curiosity and a certain disgust. I came across Nura. Bud, bud, he said, shaking his head with pious indignation. No, oh, it's bud. Allah will be angry. Isai Fomich lighted his candle with an obstinate and supercilious air and set to work, evidently wanting to show that the holiday meant nothing to him. Here and there card parties were made up. The players were not afraid of the veterans, though they put men on the lookout for the sergeant, who for his part was anxious not to see anything. The officer on duty peeped into the prison three times during the day, but the drunken men were hidden and the cards were slipped away when he appeared, and he, too, seemed to have made up his mind not to notice minor offenses. Drunkenness was looked on as a minor offense that day. Little by little the convicts grew noisier. Quarrels began. Yet the majority were still sober, and there were plenty to look after those who were not. But those who were drinking drank a vast amount. Gazin was triumphant. He swaggered up and down near his place on the bed, under which he had boldly stored away the vodka, hidden till that day under the snow behind the barracks, and he chuckled slyly as he looked at the customers coming to him. He was sober himself. He had not drunk a drop. He meant to carouse when the holidays were over, when he would have emptied the convict's pockets. There was singing in all the wards. But drunkenness was passing into stupefaction, and the singing was on the verge of tears. Many of the prisoners walked to and fro with their balalaikas, their sheepskins over their shoulders, twanging the strings with a jaunty air. In the special division they even got up a chorus of eight voices. They sang capitally to the accompaniment of balalaikas and guitars. Few of the songs were genuine peasant songs. I only remember one, and it was sung with spirit. I, the young woman, went at eve to the feast. 
and I heard a variation of that song which I had never heard before. Several verses were added at the end. I, the young woman, have tidied my house. The spoons are rubbed, the boards are scrubbed, the soup's in the pot, the peas are hot. For the most part, they sang what are called in Russia prison songs, all well-known ones. One of them, in times gone by, was a comic song, describing how a man had enjoyed himself in the past and lived like a gentleman at large, but now was shut up in prison. It described how he had flavored blamange with champagne in old days, and now... Cabbage and water they give me to eat, and I gobble it up as though it were sweet. A popular favorite was the hackneyed song. As a boy I lived in freedom, had my capital as well, but the boy soon lost his money, straightway into bondage fell. And so on. There were mournful songs, too. One was a purely convict song, a familiar one, too, I believe. Now the dawn in heaven is gleaming, heard is the awakening drum. Doors will open to the jailer, the recording clerk will come. We behind these walls are hidden, none can see us, none can hear. But the Lord of heaven is with us, even here we need not fear. Another was even more depressing, but sung to a fine tune, and probably composed by a convict. The words were mawkish and somewhat illiterate. I remember a few lines of it. Nevermore shall I behold the country of my birth. In suffering guiltless I'm condemned to pass my life on earth. The owl upon the roof will call, and grief my heart will tear. His voice will echo in the woods, and I shall not be there. This song was often sung amongst us, not in chorus, but as a solo. Someone would go out onto the steps, sit down, ponder a little with his cheek on his hand, and begin singing it in a high falsetto. It made one's heart ache to hear it. There were some good voices among us. Meanwhile, it was beginning to get dark. Sadness, despondency, and stupefaction were painfully evident through the drunkenness and merrymaking. The man who had been laughing an hour before was sobbing, hopelessly drunk. Others had had a couple of fights by now. Others, pale and hardly able to stand, lounged about the wards, picking quarrels with everyone. Men whose liquor never made them quarrelsome were vainly looking for friends to whom they could open their hearts and pour out their drunken sorrows. All these poor people wanted to enjoy themselves, wanted to spend the great holiday merrily. And good God, how dreary, how miserable the day was for almost all of us. Everyone seemed disappointed. Petrov came to see me twice again. He had drunk very little all day and was almost sober. But up to the last hour he seemed to be still expecting that something must be going to happen, something extraordinary, festive, and amusing. Though he said nothing about it, one could see this in his eyes. He kept flitting from ward to ward without wearying. But nothing special happened or was to be met with, except drunkenness, drunken, senseless oaths, and men stupefied with drink. Sorotkin, too, wandered through the wards, well washed and looking pretty in a new red shirt. He, too, seemed quietly and naively expectant of something. 
By degrees it became unbearable and disgusting in the wards. No doubt there was a great deal that was laughable, but I felt sad and sorry for them all. I felt dreary and stifled among them. Here were two convicts disputing which should treat the other. Evidently they had been wrangling for a long time, and this was not their first quarrel. One in particular seemed to have an old grudge against the other. He was complaining and speaking thickly, was struggling to prove that the other had been unfair to him. Some sheepskin coat had been sold, a sum of money had been made away with somehow a year before at Carnival. There was something else besides. He was a tall, muscular fellow of peaceable disposition and by no means a fool. When he was drunk he was disposed to make friends with anyone and to open his heart to him. He even swore at his opponent and got up a grievance against him in order to be reconciled and more friendly afterwards. The other, a short, thick-set, stubby man with a round face, was a sharp and wily fellow. He had drunk more than his companion, perhaps, but was only slightly drunk. He was a man of character and was reputed to be well off, but it was for some reason to his interest just now not to irritate his expansive friend, and he led him up to the vodka dealer, while the friend kept repeating that he should and must treat him, If only you are an honest man! The publican, with a shade of respect for the short man, and a shade of contempt for his expansive companion, because the latter was being treated and not drinking at his own expense, brought out some vodka and poured out a cupful. "'No, Stiopka, you owe it me,' said the expansive friend, seeing he had gained his point. "'For it's what you owe me.' "'I am not going to waste my breath on you,' answered Stiopka. No, Stiopka, that's a lie, protested the other, taking the cup from the publican. For you owe me money, you've no conscience. Why, your very eyes are not your own, but borrowed. You are a scoundrel, Stiopka, that's what you are, that's the only word for you. What are you whining about? You've spilt your vodka. One stands you treat, so you might as well drink cried the publican to the expansive friend. You can't keep us standing here till tomorrow. But I'm going to drink it. What are you shouting about? Merry Christmas to you, Stepan Dorofeyitch. Cup in hand, he turned politely and made a slight bow to Stiopka, whom half a minute before he had called a scoundrel. Good health to you for a hundred years, not reckoning what you've lived already. He emptied his cup, cleared his throat, and wiped his mouth. I could carry a lot of vodka in my day, lads, he observed with grave dignity, addressing the world in general and no one in particular. But now it seems age is coming upon me. Thank you, Stepan Dorofeyitch. Not at all. But I shall always tell you of it, Stiopka. Besides your behaving like a regular scoundrel to me, I tell you... And I have something to tell you, you drunken lout, Stiopka broke in, losing all patience. Listen and mark my words. Look here. We'll have the world between us. You take one half, and I'll take the other. You go your way and don't let me meet you again. I am sick of you. Then you won't pay me the money. What money, you drunken fool? On the next world you'll be wanting to pay it, but I won't take it. We work hard for our money with sweat on our brows and blisters on our hands. You'll suffer for my five kopecks in the other world. Now go to the devil. Don't drive me, I am not in harness yet. Go on, go on. Scoundrel! You jailbird! And abuse followed again, more violent than before. Here two friends were sitting apart on the bed. 
One of them, a tall, thick-set, fleshy fellow with a red face, who looked like a regular butcher, was almost crying, for he was very much touched. The other was a frail-looking, thin, skinny little man, with a long nose which always looked moist, and little piggy eyes which were fixed on the ground. He was a polished and cultivated individual. He had been a clerk and treated his friend a little superciliously, which the other secretly resented. They had been drinking together all day. "'He's taken a liberty!' cried the fleshy friend, shaking the clerk's head violently with his left arm, which he had round him. By taking a liberty he meant that he had hit him. The stout one, who had been a sergeant, was secretly envious of his emaciated friend, and so they were trying to outdo one another in the choiceness of their language. "'And I tell you that you are wrong, too,' the clerk began dogmatically, resolutely refusing to look at his opponent and staring at the floor with a dignified air. "'He's taken a liberty, do you hear?' the first man broke in, shaking his friend more violently than ever. "'You are the only friend I have in the world, do you hear? And that's why I tell you and no one else, he's taken a liberty.' And I tell you again, such a feeble justification, my friend, is only a discredit to you, said the clerk in a high-pitched, bland voice. You'd better admit, my friend, that all this drunken business is due to your own incontinence. The stout convict staggered back a little, looked blankly with his drunken eyes at the self-satisfied clerk, and suddenly and quite unexpectedly, drove his huge fist with all his might into his friend's little face. That was the end of a whole day's friendship. His dear friend was sent flying senseless under the bed. A friend of mine from the special division, a clever, good-humored fellow of boundless good nature and extraordinarily simple appearance, who was fond of a joke but quite without malice, came into our ward. This was the man who on my first day in prison had been at dinner in the kitchen, asking where the rich peasant lived and declaring that he had pride, and who had drunk tea with me. He was a man of forty, with an extraordinarily thick lower lip and a large fleshy nose covered with pimples. He was holding a balalaika and carelessly twanging the strings. A diminutive convict with a very large head was following him about as though he were on a string. I had scarcely seen him before, and indeed no one ever noticed him. He was a queer fellow, mistrustful, always silent and serious. He used to work in the sewing room and evidently tried to live a life apart and to avoid having anything to do with the rest. Now, being drunk, he followed Varlamov about like a shadow. He followed him about in great excitement, waving his arms in the air, bringing his fist down on the wall and on the bed, and almost shedding tears. Varlamov seemed to be paying no attention to him, as though he were not beside him. It is worth remarking that these men had had scarcely anything to do with one another before. They had nothing in common in their pursuits or their characters. They belonged to different divisions and lived in different wards. The little convict's name was Bulkin. Varlamov grinned on seeing me. I was sitting on my bed by the stove. He stood at a little distance facing me, pondered a moment, gave a lurch, and coming up to me with unsteady steps, he flung himself into a swaggering attitude and, lightly touching the strings, chanted in measured tones with the faint tap of his boot. Round face, fair face like a tomtit in the meadow, hear my darling's voice, when she wears a dress of satin with some most becoming trimming, oh, she does look nice. This song seemed the last straw for Bulkin. He gesticulated, 
and addressing the company in general, he shouted, "'He keeps telling lies, lads! He keeps telling lies! Not a word of truth in it! It is all a lie!' "'Respects to old Alexander Petrovich,' said Varlamov. He peeped into my face with a sly laugh and was on the point of kissing me. He was very drunk. The expression old so-and-so is used among the people all over Siberia, even in addressing a lad of twenty. The word old suggests respect, veneration, something flattering, in fact. Well, Varlamov, how are you getting on? Oh, I am jogging along. If one's glad it's Christmas, one gets drunk early, you must excuse me. Varlamov talked in rather a drawl. That's all lying, all lying again, shouted Bulkin, thumping on the bed in a sort of despair. But Varlamov seemed determined to take no notice of him, and there was something very comic about it, because Bulkin had attached himself to Varlamov from early morning for no reason whatever, simply because Varlamov kept lying, as he somehow imagined. He followed him about like a shadow, found fault with every word he said, wrung his hands, banged them against the walls and the bed till they almost bled, and was distressed, evidently distressed, by the conviction that Varlamov was lying. If he had had any hair on his head, I believe he would have pulled it out in his mortification. It was as though he felt responsible for Varlamov's conduct, as though all Varlamov's failings were on his conscience. But what made it comic was that Varlamov never even looked at him. He keeps lying, nothing but lying and lying. There's not a word of sense in all he says, shouted Bulkin. But what's that to you? responded the convicts, laughing. I beg to inform you, Alexander Petrovitch, that I was very handsome and that the wenches were awfully fond of me. Varlamov began suddenly, apropos of nothing. He's lying! He's lying again! Bulkin broke in with a squeal. The convicts laughed. And didn't I swell it among them? I had a red shirt and velveteen breeches. I lay at my ease like that Count Bottle. That is, as drunk as a Swede, anything I liked, in fact. That's a lie, Bulkin protested stoutly. And in those days I had a stone house of two stories that had been my father's. In two years I got through the two stories... I'd nothing but the gate left and no gate posts. Well, money is like pigeons that come and go. That's a lie, Bulkin repeated more stoutly than ever. So the other day I sent my parents a tearful letter. I thought maybe they'd send me something, for I've been told I went against my parents. I was disrespectful to them. It's seven years since I sent it to them. And haven't you had an answer? I asked, laughing. No, I haven't, he answered, suddenly laughing too, bringing his nose nearer and nearer to my face. And I have a sweetheart here, Alexander Petrovitch. Have you? A sweetheart? Anufriev said the other day, my girl may be pockmarked and plain, but look what a lot of clothes she's got. And yours may be pretty, but she is a beggar and goes about with a sack on her back. And is it true? It's true she is a beggar, he answered, and he went off into a noiseless laugh. There was laughter among the other convicts, too. Everyone knew indeed that he had picked up with a beggar girl and had only given her ten kopecks in the course of six months. "'Well, what of it?' I asked, wanting to get rid of him at last. He paused, looked at me feelingly, and pronounced tenderly, "'Why, things being so, won't you be kind enough to stand me a glass?' 
I've been drinking tea all day, Alexander Petrovich, he added with feeling, accepting the money I gave him. I've been swilling tea till I am short of breath, and it's gurgling in my belly like water in a bottle. When he was taking the money, Bolkin's mental agitation reached its utmost limits. He gesticulated like a man in despair, almost crying. Good people, he shouted, addressing the whole ward in his frenzy. Look at him! He keeps lying! Whatever he says, it's nothing but lies, lies, lies! But what is it to you? cried the convicts, wondering at his fury. You ridiculous fellow! I won't let him tell lies! cried Bulkin with flashing eyes, bringing his fist down on the bed with all his might. I don't want him to tell lies! Everyone laughed. Varlamov took the money, bowed to me, and, grimacing, hurried out of the ward. To the publican, of course. And then he seemed for the first time to become aware of Bulkin. "'Well, come along,' he said to him, stopping in the doorway, as though he were of some use to him. "'You walking stick!' he added, as he contemptuously made way for the mortified Bulkin to pass out before him, and began twanging the balalaika again. But why describe this bedlam? The oppressive day came to an end at last. The convicts fell heavily asleep on the plank bed. They talked and muttered in their sleep that night even more than usual. Here and there they were still sitting over cards. The holiday so long looked forward to was over. Tomorrow the daily round. Tomorrow work again. Chapter 11 The Theatricals On the third day in Christmas week we had the first performance of our theatricals. A great deal of trouble had no doubt been spent on getting them up, but the actors had undertaken it all so that the rest of us had no idea how things were going, what was being done. We did not even know for certain what was to be performed. The actors had done their best during those three days to get hold of costumes when they went out to work. When Baklushin met me, he did nothing but snap his fingers with glee. Even the Major seemed to be in a decent mood, though we really were not sure whether he knew of the theatricals. If he did know, would he give his formal sanction, or only make up his mind to say nothing, winking at the convict's project, insisting, of course, that everything should be as orderly as possible? I imagine he knew about the theatricals and could not but have known of them, but did not want to interfere, realizing that he might make things worse by prohibiting them. The convicts would begin to be disorderly and drunken, so that it would really be much better for them to have something to occupy them. I assume that this was the Major's line of argument, simply because it is most natural, sensible, and correct. It may even be said if the convicts had not got up theatricals or some such entertainment for the holidays, the authorities ought to have thought of it themselves. But as our major's mind did not work like the minds of the rest of mankind, but in quite the opposite way, it may very well be that I am quite in error in supposing that he knew of the theatricals and allowed them. A man like the major must always be oppressing someone, taking something away, depriving men of some right, making trouble somewhere, in fact. He was known all over the town for it. What did it matter to him if restrictions might lead to disturbances in prison? There were penalties for such disturbances, such as the reasoning of men like our major, and severity and strict adherence to the letter of the law is all that the scoundrelly convicts need. These obtuse ministers of the law absolutely fail to understand and are incapable of understanding that the strict adherence to the letter of it 
without using their reason, without understanding the spirit of it, leads straight to disturbance and has never led to anything else. It is the law, there's nothing more to be said, they say, and they are genuinely astonished that they should be expected to show common sense in a clear head as well. This seems particularly unnecessary to many of them, a revolting superfluity, a restriction and a piece of intolerance. But however that may have been, the senior sergeant did not oppose the convicts, and that was all they cared about. I can say with certainty that the theatricals and the gratitude felt for their being permitted were the reason why there was not one serious disturbance in the prison during the holidays. Not one violent quarrel, not one case of theft. I myself witnessed the convicts themselves trying to repress the riotous or quarrelsome, simply on the ground that the theatricals might be prohibited. The sergeant exacted a promise from the convicts that everything should be orderly and that they would behave themselves. They agreed joyfully and kept their promise faithfully. They were much flattered at their words being trusted. It must be added, however, that it cost the authorities nothing to allow the theatricals. They had not to contribute. No space had to be set apart for the theater. The stage could be rigged up and taken to pieces again in a quarter of an hour. The performance lasted for an hour and a half, and if the order had suddenly come from headquarters to stop the performance, it could all have been put away in a trice. The costumes were hidden in the convicts' boxes. But before I describe how the theatricals were arranged and what the costumes were like, I must describe the program, that is, what it was proposed to perform. There was no written program. But on the second and third performances, a program in the handwriting of Baclusian made its appearance for the benefit of the officers and of distinguished visitors generally who had honored our theatricals by being present at the first performance. The officer of the guard usually came, and on one occasion the commanding officer of the guards came himself. The officer of the engineers came, too, on one evening, and it was for visitors like these the program was prepared. It was assumed that the fame of the prison theatricals would spread far and wide in the fortress and would even reach the town, especially as there was no theater in the town. There was a rumor that one performance had been got up by a society of amateurs, but that was all. The convicts were like children, delighted at the smallest success, vain over it indeed. Who knows, they thought and said among themselves. Perhaps even the highest authorities will hear about it. They'll come and have a look. Then they'll see what the convicts are made of. It's not a simple soldier's performance with dummy figures, floating boats and dancing bears and goats. We have actors, real actors. They act high-class comedies. There's no theater like it even in the town. General Abromazov had a performance, they say, and is going to have another. But I dare say he'll only beat us in the dresses. As for the conversations, who knows whether they'll be as good. It will reach the governor's ears, maybe, and, you never can tell, he may take it into his head to have a look at it himself. There's no theater in the town. In fact, the prisoner's imagination was so worked up during the holidays, especially after the first success, that they were ready to fancy they might receive rewards or have their term of imprisonment shortened, though at the same time they were almost at once ready to laugh very good-naturedly at their own expense. They were children, in fact, perfect children, though some of these children were over forty. But though there was no regular program, I already knew in outline what the performance would consist of. The first piece was called Filatka and Miroshka, or The Rivals. Baklushin had boasted to me a week beforehand that the part of Filatka which he was undertaking would be acted in a style such as had never been seen even in the Petersburg theatres. 
He strolled about the wards, bragging without shame or scruple, though with perfect good nature. And now and then he would suddenly go through a bit of theatrical business, a bit of his part, that is, and they all would laugh, regardless of whether the performance was amusing. Though even then, it must be admitted, the convicts knew how to restrain themselves and keep up their dignity. The only convicts who were enraptured by Baklushin's pranks and his stories of what was coming were either quite young people, greenhorns, deficient in reserve, or else the more important among the convicts whose prestige was firmly established, so that they had no reason to be afraid of giving vent to their feelings of any sort, however simple, that is, however unseemly, according to prison notions, they might be. The others listened to the gossip and rumors in silence. They did not, it is true, contradict or disapprove, but they did their utmost to take up an indifferent and even to some extent supercilious attitude to the theatricals. Only during the last days, just before the performance, everyone began to feel inquisitive. What was coming? How would our men do? What was the Major saying? Would it be as successful as it was last year? And so on. Baklushin assured me that the actors had been splendidly chosen, everyone to fit his part, that there would even be a curtain, that Falatka's betrothed was to be acted by Sorotkin. And you'll see what he is like in woman's dress, he added, screwing up his eyes and clicking with his tongue. The benevolent lady was to wear a mantle and a dress with a flounce, and to carry a parasol in her hand. The benevolent gentleman was to come on in an officer's coat with epaulets, and was to carry a cane in his hand. There was to be a second piece with a highly dramatic ending called Kedril the Glutton. The title aroused my curiosity, but in spite of all my inquiries I could learn nothing about this piece beforehand. I only learnt that they had not taken the play out of a book, but from a written copy, that they got the play from a retired sergeant living in the town who had probably once taken part in a performance of it himself in some soldier's entertainment. In our remote towns and provinces there are such plays which no one seems to know anything about, and which have perhaps never been printed but seem to have appeared of themselves, and so have become an indispensable part of every people's theatre. It would be a very, very good thing if some investigator would make a fresh and more careful study of the people's drama, which really does exist, and is perhaps by no means valueless. I refuse to believe that all I saw on our prison stage was invented by the convicts themselves. There must be a continuous tradition, established customs and conceptions handed down from generation to generation and consecrated by time. They must be looked for among soldiers, among factory hands, in factory towns, and even among the working classes in some poor, obscure little towns. They are preserved, too, in villages and provincial towns among the servants of the richer country gentry. I imagine, indeed, that many old-fashioned plays have been circulated in written copies all over Russia by house serfs. Many of the old-fashioned landowners and Moscow gentlemen had their own dramatic companies made up of serf actors. And these theatres laid the foundations of the national dramatic art of which there are unmistakable signs. As for Kedril the Glutton, I was able to learn nothing about it beforehand, except that evil spirits appear on the stage and carry Kedril off to hell. But what does the name Kedril mean? Why is it Kedril and not Kirill? Whether it is a Russian story or a foreign origin, I could not find out. It was announced that, finally, there would be a pantomime to the accompaniment of music. All this, of course, was very interesting. The actors were fifteen in number, all smart, spirited fellows. They bestirred themselves, rehearsed, sometimes behind the prison, held their tongues and kept things secret. 
In fact, they meant to surprise us with something extraordinary and unexpected. On working days, the prison was locked up early, as soon as night came on. Christmas week was an exception. They did not lock up till the evening tattoo. This concession was made expressly for the sake of the theater. Almost every afternoon during Christmas week, they sent a messenger from the prison to the officer of the watch with the humble request to allow the theatricals and leave the wards unlocked a little longer, adding that this had been allowed the day before and there had been no disorder. The officer of the watch reasoned that there really had been no disorder the day before, and if they gave their word that there would be none today, it meant that they would see to that themselves, and that made things safer than anything. Besides, if the theatricals were not allowed, maybe, there's no knowing with a lot of criminals, they might get up some mischief through spite and get the watch into trouble. Another point was that it was tedious to serve on the watch, and here was a play, not simply got up by the soldiers, but by the convicts, and convicts are an interesting lot. It would be amusing to see it. The officers of the watch always had the privilege of looking on. If his superior officer came along, he would ask, Where is the officer of the watch? He is in the prison, counting over the convicts and locking the wards. A straightforward answer and a sufficient explanation. And so every evening through the Christmas holidays, the officers of the watch allowed the performance and did not lock the wards till the evening tattoo. The convicts knew beforehand that there would be no hindrance from the officers of the watch, and they had no anxiety on that ground. About seven o'clock, Petrov came to fetch me, and we went to the performance together. Almost all the inmates of our ward went to the performance except the old believer and the Poles. It was only on the very last performance, on the 4th of January, that the Poles made up their minds to be present, and only then after many assurances that it was nice and amusing, and that there was no risk about it. The disdain of the Poles did not irritate the convicts in the very least, and they were welcomed on the 4th of January quite politely. They were even shown into the best places. As for the Circassians and still more Isaifomich, the performance was to them a real enjoyment. Isaifomich paid three kopecks every time, and on the last performance put ten kopecks in the plate and there was a look of bliss on his face. The actors decided to collect from the audience what they were willing to give for the expenses of the theater and for their own fortifying. Petrov assured me that I should be put into one of the best seats, however crowded the theater might be, on the ground that being richer than most of them, I should probably subscribe more liberally, and also that I knew more about acting. And so it was. But I will first describe the room and the arrangement of the theater. The military ward in which our stage was arranged was fifteen paces long. From the yard one mounted some steps into the passage leading to the ward. This long ward, as I have mentioned already, was different from the others. The bed platform ran round the wall so that the middle of the room was free. The half of the room nearest to the steps was given up to the spectators, and the other half which communicated with another ward was marked off for the stage. What struck me first of all was the curtain. It stretched for ten feet across the room. To have a curtain was such a luxury that it was certainly something to marvel at. What is more, it was painted in oil colors with a design of trees, arbors, lakes, and stars. It was made of pieces of linen, old and new, such as they were able to collect among the convicts, old leg wrappers and shirts sewn together after a fashion into one large strip. And where the linen fell short, the gap was filled simply with paper which had been begged, 
sheet by sheet from various offices and departments. Our painters, amongst whom the Brulov of the prison, A, was conspicuous, had made it their work to decorate and paint it. The effect was surprising. Such a refinement delighted even the most morose and fastidious of the convicts, who, when it came to the performance, were without exception as childish in their admiration as the most enthusiastic and impatient. All were very much pleased and even boastful in their pleasure. The stage was lighted by means of a few tallow candles which were cut into pieces. In front of the curtain stood two benches brought from the kitchen, and in front of the benches were three or four chairs from the sergeant's room. The chairs were intended for any officers that might come in, the benches for the sergeants and the engineering clerks, foremen and other persons in official positions, though not officers, in case any such looked in on the performance. And as a fact, spectators from outside were present at every performance. There were more on some evenings than on others, but at the last performance there was not a vacant seat on the benches. In the back of the room were the convicts themselves, standing, and in spite of the suffocating, steamy heat of the room, wearing their coats or sheepskins, and carrying their caps in their hands, out of respect for their visitors. Of course the space allotted to the convicts was too small. And not only were people literally sitting on others, especially in the back rows, but the beds too were filled up, as well as the spaces to right and left of the curtain, and there were even some ardent spectators who always went round behind the scenes and looked at the performance from the other ward at the back. The crush in the first part of the ward was incredible and might even be compared to the crush and crowding I had lately seen at the bathhouse. The door into the passage was open, and the passage where the temperature was twenty degrees below zero was also thronged with people. Petrov and I were at once allowed to go to the front, almost up to the benches, where we could see much better than from the back. They looked upon me as to some extent a theatre-goer, a connoisseur, who had frequented performances very different from this. They had seen Baklushin consulting me all this time and treating me with respect, so on this occasion I had the honour of a front place. The convicts were no doubt extremely vain and frivolous, but it was all on the surface. The convicts could laugh at me, seeing that I was a poor hand at their work. Almatsov could look with contempt upon us gentlemen and pride himself on knowing how to burn alabaster. But mixed with their persecution and ridicule there was another element. We had once been gentlemen. We belonged to the same class as their former masters, of whom they could have no pleasant memories. But now at the theatricals they made way for me. They recognized that in this I was a better critic, that I had seen and knew more than they. Even those who liked me least were, I know for a fact, anxious now for my approval of their theatricals, and without the slightest servility they let me have the best place. I see that now, recalling my impressions at the time. It seemed to me at the time, I remember, that in their correct estimate of themselves there was no servility but a sense of their own dignity. The highest and most striking characteristic of our people is just their sense of justice and their eagerness for it. There is no trace in the common people of the desire to be cock of the walk on all occasions and at all costs, whether they deserve to be or not. One has but to take off the outer, superimposed husk, and to look at the colonel more closely, more attentively, and without prejudice, and some of us will see things in the people that we should never have expected. There is not much our wise men could teach them. On the contrary, I think it is the wise men who ought to learn from the people. Before we started, Petrov told me naively that I should have a front place partly because I should subscribe more. There was no fixed price of admission, 
Everyone gave what he could or what he wished. When the plate was taken round, almost everyone put something in it, even if it were only a halfpenny. But if I were given a front place partly on account of money, on the supposition that I should give more than others, what a sense of their own dignity there was in that again! You are richer than I am, so you can stand in front, and though we are all equal, you'll give more, and so a spectator like you is more pleasing to the actors. You must have the first place, for we are all here not thinking of the money, but showing our respect so we ought to sort ourselves of our own accord. How much fine and genuine pride there is in this! It is a respect not for money, but respect for oneself. As a rule, there was not much respect for money, for wealth in the prison, especially if one looks at convicts without distinction, as a gang in the mass. I can't remember one of them seriously demeaning himself for the sake of money, there were men who were always begging, who begged even of me. But this was rather mischief, roguery, than the real thing. There was too much humor and naivety in it. I don't know whether I express myself so as to be understood. But I am forgetting the theatricals. To return. Till the curtain was raised, the whole room was a strange and animated picture. To begin with, masses of spectators crowded, squeezed tightly, packed on all sides, waiting with patient and blissful faces for the performance to begin. In the back rows, men were clambering on one another. Many of them had brought blocks of wood from the kitchen. Fixing the thick block of wood against the wall, a man would climb onto it, leaning with both hands on the shoulders of someone in front of him, and would stand like that without changing his attitude for the whole two hours, perfectly satisfied with himself and his position. Others got their feet on the lower step of the stove and stayed so all the time, leading on men in front of them. This was quite in the hindmost rows next to the wall. At the sides, too, men were standing on the bed in dense masses above the musicians. This was a good place. Five people had clambered onto the stove itself, and, lying on it, looked down from it. They must have been blissful. The window sills on the opposite wall were also crowded with people who had come in late or failed to get a good place. Everyone behaved quietly and decorously. Everyone wished to show himself in the best light before the gentry and the officers. All faces expressed a simple-hearted expectation. Every face was red and bathed in sweat from the closeness and heat. A strange light of childlike joy, of pure, sweet pleasure, was shining on these lined and branded brows and cheeks, on those faces usually so morose and gloomy, in those eyes which sometimes gleamed with such terrible fire. They were all bareheaded, and all the heads were shaven on the right side. Suddenly sounds of bustle and hurrying were heard on the stage. In a minute the curtain would rise. Then the band struck up. This band deserves special mention. Eight musicians were installed on the bed on one side. Two violins, one from the prison and one borrowed from someone in the fortress, but both the fiddlers were convicts. Three balalaikas, all homemade, two guitars and a tambourine instead of a double bass. The violins simply scraped and squealed. The guitars were wretched, but the balalaikas were wonderful. The speed with which they twanged the strings with their fingers was a positive feat of agility. They played dance tunes. At the liveliest part of the tunes, the balalaika players would tap the case of the instruments with their knuckles. The tone, the taste, the execution, the handling of the instrument, and the characteristic rendering of the tune, all was individual, original, and typical of the convicts. One of the guitarists, too, played his instrument splendidly. 
This was the gentleman who had murdered his father. As for the tambourine, it was simply marvelous. The player whirled it round on his finger and drew his thumb across the surface. Now we heard rapid, resonant, monotonous taps. Then suddenly this loud, distinct sound seemed to be broken into a shower of innumerable jangling and whispering notes. Two accordions also appeared on the scene. Upon my word, I had had no idea till then what could be done with simple peasant instruments. The blending and harmony of sounds, above all, the spirit, the character of the conception and rendering of the tune in its very essence, were simply amazing. For the first time, I realized fully all the reckless dash and gaiety of the gay, dashing Russian dance songs. At last the curtain rose. There was a general stir. Everyone shifted from one leg to the other. Those at the back stood on tiptoe. Someone fell off his block of wood. Everyone, without exception, opened his mouth and stared, and absolute silence reigned. The performance began. Near me was standing Ale in a group consisting of his brothers and all the other Circassians. They were all intensely delighted with the performance and came every evening afterwards. All Mohammedans, Tatars, and others, as I have noticed more than once, are passionately fond of spectacles of all sorts. Next to them, Isaifomich had tucked himself in. From the moment the curtain rose, he seemed to be all ears and eyes and simple-hearted, greedy expectations of delights and marvels. It would have been pitiful indeed if he had been disappointed. Ale's charming face beamed with such pure childlike joy that I must confess I felt very happy in looking at him, and I remember that at every amusing and clever sally on the part of the actors, when there was a general burst of laughter, I could not help turning to Ale and glancing at his face. He did not see me. He had no attention to spare for me. On the left side, quite near me, stood an old convict who was always scowling, discontented and grumbling. He, too, noticed Ale, and I saw him more than once turn with a half-smile towards him. He was so charming. Ale Semyonitch, he called him. I don't know why. They began with Filatka and Miroshka. Filatka, acted by Baklushin, was really splendid. He played his part with amazing precision. One could see that he had thought out every phrase, every movement. Into the slightest word or gesture, he knew how to put value and significance in perfect harmony with the character he was acting. And to this conscientious effort and study must be added an inimitable gaiety, simplicity, and naturalness. If you had seen Baklushin, you would certainly have agreed that he was a born actor of real talent. I had seen Falatka more than once at theatres in Moscow and Petersburg, and I can say positively that the city actors were inferior to Baklushin in the part of Falatka. By comparison with him, they were too much of Pezan. They were not real Russian peasants. They were too anxious to mimic the Russian peasant. Baklushin was stirred, too, by emulation. Everyone knew that in the second play the part of Kedril would be taken by the convict Potsekin, who was for some reason considered by all a more talented actor than Baklushin, and at this Baklushin was as chagrined as a child, how often he had come to me during those last few days to give vent to his feelings. Two hours before the performance he was in a perfect fever. When they laughed and shouted to him from the crowd, Bravo, Baklushin! First rate! His whole face beamed with pleasure. There was a light of real inspiration in his eyes. The scene of his kissing Miroshka, when Falatka shouts to him beforehand, Wipe your nose, and wipes his own, was killingly funny. Everyone was rocking with laughter. 
But what interested me more than all was the audience. They were all completely carried away. They gave themselves up to their pleasure without reserve. Shouts of approbation sounded more and more frequently. One would nudge his neighbor and hurriedly whisper his impressions, without caring or even noticing who was beside him. Another would turn ecstatically to the audience at an amusing passage, hurriedly look at everyone, wave his hand as though calling on everyone to laugh, and immediately turn greedily round to the stage again. Another one simply clicked with his fingers and his tongue, and could not stand still, but being unable to move from his place, kept shifting from one leg to the other. By the end of the performance, the general gaiety had reached its height. I am not exaggerating anything. Imagine prison, fetters, bondage, the vista of melancholy years ahead, the life of days as monotonous as the drip of water on a dull autumn day. And suddenly all these oppressed and outcast are allowed for one short hour to relax, to rejoice, to forget the weary dream, to create a complete theater, and to create it to the pride and astonishment of the whole town, to show what fellows we convicts are. Of course, everything interested them, the dresses, for example. They were awfully curious, for instance, to see a fellow like Vanka Otpeti or Netsvateyev or Baklushin in a different dress from that in which they had seen them every day for so many years. Why, he is a convict, a convict the same as ever, with the fetters jingling on him. And there he is in a frock coat, with a round hat on, in a cloak, like an ordinary person. He's got on mustaches and a wig. Here he's brought a red handkerchief out of his pocket. He is fanning himself with it. He is acting a gentleman, for all the world as though he were a gentleman. And all were in raptures. The benevolent country gentleman came on in an adjutant's uniform, a very old one, it's true, in epaulets and a cap with a cockade, and made an extraordinary sensation. There were two competitors for the part, and, would you believe it, they quarreled like little children as to which should play it. Both were eager to appear in an adjutant's uniform with shoulder knots. The other actors parted them, and by a majority of votes gave the part to Netsvateyev, not because he was better looking and more presentable than the other, and so looked more like a gentleman, but because Netsvateyev assured them that he would come on with a cane and would wave it about and draw patters on the ground with it like a real gentleman and tip-top swell, which Vanka Otpeti could not do, for he had never seen any real gentleman. And indeed, when Netsvateyev came on the stage with his lady, he kept on rapidly drawing patterns on the floor with a thin reedy cane, which he had picked up somewhere no doubt considering this a sign of the highest breeding, foppishness, and fashion. Probably at some time in his childhood, as a barefoot servant boy, he had happened to see a finely dressed gentleman with a cane, and been fascinated by his dexterity with it, and the impression had remained printed indelibly on his memory, so that now at thirty he remembered it exactly as it was, for the enchantment and delectation of the whole prison. Netsvateyev was so absorbed in his occupation that he looked at no one. He even spoke without raising his eyes. He simply watched the tip of his cane. The benevolent country lady, too, was a remarkable conception in its way. She came on in a shabby old muslin dress which looked no better than a rag, with her neck and arms bare, and her face horribly rouged and powdered with a cotton nightcap tied under her chin, carrying a parasol in one hand, and in the other a painted paper fan with which she continually fanned herself. A roar of laughter greeted this lady's appearance. The lady herself could not refrain from laughing several times. A convict called Ivanov took the part. Sirotkin, dressed up as a girl, looked very charming. The verses, too, went off very well. 
In fact, the play gave complete satisfaction to all. There was no criticism, and indeed there could not be. The orchestra played the song My Porch, My New Porch, by way of overture, and the curtain rose again. The second piece was Kedril, a play somewhat in the style of Don Juan. At least the master and servant are both carried off to hell by devils at the end. They acted all they had, but it was obviously a fragment of which the beginning and the end were lost. There was no meaning or consistency in it. The action takes place in Russia, at an inn. The innkeeper brings a gentleman in an overcoat and a battered round hat into the room. He is followed by his servant Kedril carrying a trunk and a fowl wrapped up in a piece of blue paper. Kedril wears a sheepskin and a footman's cap. It is he who is the glutton. He was acted by Baklushin's rival, Putsekin. His master was acted by Ivanov, who had been the benevolent lady in the first piece. The innkeeper, Netsvateyev, warns them that the room is haunted by devils and then goes away. The gentleman, gloomy and preoccupied, mutters that he knew that long ago, and tells Kedril to unpack his things and prepare the supper. Kedril is a coward and a glutton. Hearing about the devils, he turns pale and trembles like a leaf. He would run away, but is afraid of his master. And, what's more, he is hungry. He is greedy, stupid, cunning in his own way, and cowardly. He deceives his master at every step, and at the same time is afraid of him. He is a striking type which obscurely and remotely suggests the character of Leporello. It was really remarkably rendered. Potsekin had unmistakable talent, and in my opinion was even a better actor than Baklushin. Of course, when I met Baklushin next day, I did not express my opinion quite frankly. I should have wounded him too much. The convict who acted the master acted pretty well, too. He talked the most fearful nonsense, but his delivery was good and spirited, and his gestures were appropriate. While Kedril was busy with the trunk, the master paced up and down the stage, lost in thought, and announced aloud that that evening he had reached the end of his travels. Kedril listened inquisitively, made grimaces, spoke aside, and made the audience laugh at every word. He had no pity for his master, but he had heard of the devils. He wants to know what that meant, and so he begins to talk and ask questions. His master at last informs him that in some difficulty in the past he had invoked the aid of hell. The devils had helped him and had extricated him, but that today the hour had come, and that perhaps that evening the devils would arrive according to their compact to carry off his soul. Kedril begins to be panic-stricken. But the gentleman keeps up his spirits and tells him to prepare the supper. Kedril brightens up brings out the fowl, brings out some wine, and now and then pulls a bit off the fowl and tastes it. The audience laughs. Then the door creaks, the wind rattles the shutters. Kedril shudders in hastily, almost unconsciously, stuffs into his mouth a piece of chicken too huge for him to swallow. Laughter again. Is it ready? asks the gentleman, striding about the room. "'Directly, sir, I am getting it ready,' says Kedril. He seats himself at the table and calmly proceeds to make away with his master's supper. The audience is evidently delighted at the smartness and cunning of the servant and at the master's being made a fool of. It must be admitted that Putsekin really deserved the applause he got. The words... Directly, sir, I am getting it ready, he pronounced superbly. Sitting at the table, he began eating greedily, starting at every step his master took, for fear the latter should notice what he was about. As soon as the master turned round, he hid under the table, pulling the chicken after him. At last he had taken off the edge of his appetite. 
the time came to think of his master. Kadro, how long will you be? cries the master. Ready, Kadro replies briskly, suddenly realizing that there is hardly anything left for his master. There is nothing but one drumstick left on the plate. The gentleman, gloomy and preoccupied, sits down to the table, noticing nothing, and Kedril stands behind his chair holding a napkin. Every word, every gesture, every grimace of Kedril's, when, turning to the audience, he winked at his simpleton of a master, was greeted by the spectators with irresistible peals of laughter. But as the master begins to eat, the devils appear. At this point the play became quite incomprehensible, and the devil's entrance was really too grotesque. A door opened in the wing, and something in white appeared having a lantern with a candle in it instead of a head. Another phantom, also with a lantern on his head, held a scythe. Why the lanterns? Why the scythe? Why the devils in white? No one could make out. Though, indeed, no one thought of it. It was evidently as it should be. The gentleman turns pretty pluckily to the devils and shouts to them that he is ready for them to take him. But Kedril is as frightened as a hare. He creeps under the table, but for all his fright does not forget to take the bottle with him. The devils vanish for a minute. Kedril creeps out from under the table. But as soon as the master attacks the chicken once more, three devils burst into the room again, seize the master from behind, and carry him off to the lower regions. Kedril, save me! shouts his master. But Kedril has no attention to spare. This time he has carried off the bottle, a plate, and even the loaf under the table. Here he is now alone. There are no devils, no master either. Kedril creeps out, looks about him, and his face lights up with a smile. He winks slyly, sits down in his master's place, and nodding to the audience, says in a half-whisper, Well, now I am alone, without a master. Everyone roars at his being without a master, and then he adds in a half-whisper, turning confidentially to the audience and winking more and more merrily. The devils have got my master! The rapture of the audience was beyond all bounds. Apart from the master's being taken by the devils, this was said in such a way, with such slyness, such an ironically triumphant grimace, that it was impossible not to applaud. But Kedril's luck did not last long. He had hardly taken the bottle, filled his glass, and raised it to his lips, when the devils suddenly come back, steal up on tiptoe behind him, and seize him under the arms. Kedril screams at the top of his voice. He is so frightened he dare not look round. He cannot defend himself either. He has the bottle in one hand and the glass in the other, and cannot bring himself to part with either. For half a minute he sits, his mouth wide open with fright, staring at the audience with such a killing expression of cowardly terror that he might have sat for a picture. At last he is lifted up and carried away. Still holding the bottle, he kicks and screams and screams. His screams are still heard from behind the scenes. But the curtain drops and everyone laughs. Everyone is delighted. The orchestra strikes up the Kamarinsky. They begin quietly, hardly audibly. But the melody grows stronger and stronger, the time more rapid. Now and then comes the jaunty note of a flip on the case of the instrument. It is the Kamarinsky in all its glory, and indeed it would have been nice if Glinka could by chance have heard it in the prison. The pantomime begins to the music, which is kept up all through. The scene is the interior of a cottage. On the stage are a miller and his wife. The miller in one corner is mending some harness, 
In the other corner, his wife is spinning flax. The wife was played by Sorotkin, the miller by Netsvetaev. I may observe that our scenery was very poor. Both in this play and in the others, we rather supplied the scene from our imagination than saw it in reality. By way of a background, there was a rug or a horse cloth of some sort. On one side, a wretched sort of screen. On the left side, there was nothing at all, so that we could see the bed. But the audience was not critical and was ready to supply all deficiencies by their imagination. And indeed, convicts are very good at doing so. If you are told it's a garden, you've got to look on it as a garden. If it's a room, it's a room. If it's a cottage, it's a cottage. It doesn't matter, and there is no need to make a fuss about it. Sorotkin was very charming in the dress of a young woman. Several compliments were paid him in undertones among the audience. The miller finishes his work, takes up his hat, takes up his whip, goes up to his wife and explains to her by signs that he must go out, but that if his wife admits anyone in his absence, then and he indicates the whip. The wife listens and nods. Probably she is well acquainted with that whip. The hussy amuses herself when her husband is away. The husband goes off. As soon as he has gone, the wife shakes her fist after him. Then there is a knock. The door opens and another miller appears, a neighbor, a peasant with a beard, wearing a full coat. He has a present for her, a red kerchief. The woman laughs, but as soon as the neighbor tries to embrace her, there is another knock. Where can he hide? She hurriedly hides him under the table and sits down to her distaff again. Another admirer makes his appearance, an army clerk in military dress. So far the pantomime had gone admirably. The gestures were perfectly appropriate. One could not help wondering as one looked at these impromptu actors. One could not help thinking how much power and talent in Russia are sometimes wasted in servitude and poverty. But the convict who acted the clerk had probably at some time been on some private or provincial stage, and he imagined that our performers, one and all, had no notion of acting and did not move on the stage as they ought to and he paced the stage as we are told the classic heroes used to in the past. He would take one long stride, and before moving the other leg, stop short, throw his head and whole body back, look haughtily around him, and take another stride. If such deportment is absurd in the classical drama, in an army clerk in a comic scene it is even more ridiculous. But our audience thought that probably it was as it ought to be, and took for granted the long strides of the lanky clerk without criticizing them. The clerk had hardly reached the middle of the stage before another knock was heard. The woman was in a flutter again. Where was she to put the clerk? Into a chest which stood conveniently open. The clerk creeps into the chest and she shuts the lid on him. This time it is a different sort of visitor, a lover too, but of a special kind. It is a Brahmin, and even dressed as one. There is an overwhelming burst of laughter from the audience. The Brahmin was acted by the convict Kushkin, and acted beautifully. He looked like a Brahmin. In pantomime he suggests the intensity of his feelings, he raises his hands to heaven, then lays them on his heart. But he has hardly begun to be sentimental when there is a loud knock at the door. From the sound one can tell it is the master of the house. The frightened wife is beside herself. The Brahmin rushes about like one possessed and implores her to conceal him. She hurriedly puts him behind the cupboard and, forgetting to open the door, rushes back to her work and goes on spinning, heedless of her husband's knocking. In her alarm she twiddles in her fingers an imaginary thread and turns an imaginary distaff, while the real one lies on the floor. 
Sorotkin acted her terror very cleverly and successfully. But the husband breaks open the door with his foot, and whip in hand approaches his wife. He has been on the watch and has seen it all, and he plainly shows her on his fingers that she has three men hidden, and then he looks for the stowaways. The one he finds first is the neighbor, and cuffing him he leads him out of the room. The terrified clerk, wanting to escape, puts his head out from under the lid and so betrays himself. The husband thrashes him with the whip, and this time the amorous clerk skips about in anything but a classic style. The Brahmin is left. The husband is a long while looking for him. He finds him in the corner behind the cupboard, bows to him politely, and drags him by the beard into the middle of the stage. The Brahmin tries to defend himself, shouts, Accursed man! Accursed man! The only words uttered in the pantomime. But the husband takes no notice and deals with him after his own fashion. The wife, seeing that her turn is coming next, flings down the flax and the distaff and runs out of the room. The spinning bench tips over on the floor. The convicts laugh. Ale tugs at my arm without looking at me and shouts to me, Look! The Brahmin! The Brahmin! Laughing so that he can hardly stand. The curtain falls. A second scene follows. But there is no need to describe them all. There were two or three more. They were all amusing and inimitably comic. If the convicts did not positively invent them, each of them put something of his own into them. Almost every one of the actors improvised something, so that the following evenings the same parts acted by the same actors were somewhat different. The last pantomime of a fantastic character concluded with a ballet. It was a funeral. The Brahmin, with numerous attendants, repeated various spells over the coffin, but nothing was of use. At last the strains of the setting sun are heard. The corpse comes to life, and all begin to dance with joy. The Brahmin dances with the resuscitated corpse, and dances in a peculiar Brahminical fashion. And so the theatricals were over till the next evening. The convicts dispersed merry and satisfied. They praised the actors. They thanked the sergeant. There were no sounds of quarreling. Everyone was unusually contented, even as it were happy, and fell asleep not as on other nights, but almost with a tranquil spirit. And why, one wonders? And yet it is not a fancy of my imagination. It's the truth, the reality. These poor people were only allowed to do as they liked, ever so little, to be merry like human beings, to spend one short hour not as though in prison, and they were morally transformed, if only for a few minutes. Now it is the middle of the night. I start and wake up. The old man is still praying on the stove and will pray there till dawn. Ale is sleeping quietly beside me. I remember that he was still laughing and talking to his brothers about the theatricals as he fell asleep, and unconsciously I look closer into his peaceful, childlike face. Little by little I recall everything. The previous day, the holidays, the whole of that month. I lift up my head in terror and look round at my sleeping companions by the dim, flickering light of the prison candle. I look at their poor faces, at their poor beds, at the hopeless poverty and destitution. I gaze at it, as though I wanted to convince myself that it is really true and not the continuation of a hideous dream. But it is true. I hear a moan. Someone drops his arm heavily, and there is a clank of chains. Another starts in his sleep and begins to speak, while the old man on the stove prays for all good Christians. 
and I hear the even cadence of his soft, prolonged, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. After all, I am not here forever, only for a few years, I think, and I lay my head on the pillow again. Breaking in This chapter's portrayal of the prison theatricals is another of the famous scenes of the book. The convicts are not wrong in assuming Dostoevsky to be an enthusiast for the theater, and the author is certainly not feigning his intense interest in the Russian folk drama that he is discovering here for the first time. It's that second play, Kedril, which is most noteworthy here, since it appears to be original with the Russian folk. When our narrator says that the character of Kedril is roughly like Leporello, he is referring to a character from Mozart's opera Don Giovanni. Don Giovanni is modeled after Don Juan, and Leporello is his servant. The play Kedril appears to preserve some of the Don Juan legend, with gluttony replacing libertinism as the core vice. The Kamarinsky is a famous Russian folk song. Mikhail Glinka composed an orchestral version of it in 1848, just a few years before Dostoevsky would have witnessed this performance. This particular episode appears to have made a significant impression on the author, as the Kamarinsky would play a significant role in his 1859 Siberian novella, The Village of Stepanchikovo. This chapter also marks the end of part one of the book. Typically, at a major stopping point like this one, I would want to pause and to take stock of the major plot lines we have encountered. As this work has no plot to speak of, here I would like to try something else. A roster of the convicts we have encountered so far, matching each one to his purported crime. This will give us a reminder of who exactly is populating this prison, and that, after all, is the primary substance of the book. Now, for many of the convicts, we simply don't know what their crimes are. We are given no indication, for instance, what brought Almatsov, the surly alabaster pounder, or the jocular Varlamov, to the prison, nor do we know the crime of the buffoon Skuratov, unless, that is, you can make more sense out of his clowning comments in Chapter 6 than I can. But we do know at least something about the crimes of several of them. Some of the crimes seem minor. Osip, the colossal but meek cook, is in for smuggling, and, as we have seen, is simply addicted to the craft. The exceptionally servile Sushilov was originally arrested for something minor, although we don't know what. But he is in for life because he meekly traded sentences with another convict for a ruble and a red shirt while on the road to Siberia. There are other figures who seem far too virtuous properly to belong in the prison camp, and are there more because of their deep loyalty to higher causes. Our elderly old believer, for instance, is an extraordinarily pious man, but his piety led him to burn down an orthodox church in defense of his faith. Similarly, we have figures who have been swept up in larger political movements. Dostoevsky and his unnamed companion, of course, are among their number, as are the Poles, such as M or B. But we also meet convicts from both sides of the war in the Caucasus, Akim Akimich is a fastidious, chaste man, and yet his lack of sense led him to shoot a traitorous chief without a trial before his whole command, and he still is unable to see the error of his action. On the flip side, we see Circassians who are just like the chief that Akim Akimich murdered. Nura, for instance, made raids against the Russians despite being a member of an allied tribe. The kind and gentle Ale, too, was unwittingly swept up in a raid on an Armenian merchant, and simply due to his loyalty to his elder brothers. 
In each of these cases, we are dealing with good people whose fealty to a cause, combined with either bad luck or a lack of sense, leads straight to Siberia. Similarly, military duty seems frequently to lead to prison. Akim Akimich, of course, was an officer, and in his case imprisonment is due to a lack of judgment. But several prisoners are there simply because of how miserable the life of a soldier was. The wretched fiddler who follows around the drunken revelers who are on a spree is imprisoned for the crime of desertion. Both Sorotkin and Petrov murdered their commanding officers. Sorotkin simply couldn't endure the life of a soldier and would do anything to get out of it. Petrov could handle the hardships of military life, but took exception to the bullying of his commanding colonel, and so killed him, and very nearly killed Major Eight Eyes of the prison camp as well. Luchka's case is a bit different, but he too was driven to kill by the authoritarian excesses of the warden of his prison. Baklushin also was a soldier at the time of his crime, although his crime has nothing to do with military duty. He killed an insufferable snob over a woman. In fact, when we look at the roster of murderers in the prison camp, we can understand why it is that Dostoevsky insists, towards the end of chapter 3, that murder comes in many different flavors. We can understand the murders by a Sorotkin or a Baklushin. And Dostoevsky has given us the tools to understand the murders by Akim Akimich and Petrov and Luchka. It is hard to believe that the silly old man Isai Fomich should be a murderer, and yet that was his crime and we have seen how easily decent people could be led to violence. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have our gentleman parricide, whose psychological makeup Dostoevsky finds unfathomable. And then we have the vodka smuggler Gazin, who is reputed to have murdered children for the thrill of it, and the terrible bandit Orlov, who could kill multiple times without the slightest pang of conscience. Curiously, however, despite his encounters with monsters like Gazin and Orlov, Dostoevsky's greatest repugnance isn't for these, but for a non-violent criminal, the gentleman known only as A. A's crime was to sell false information to the police authorities, accusing innocent people of crimes they did not commit. Dostoevsky could have a lengthy conversation with the bandit Orlov, but he could not endure the presence of the loathsome A. The fact that he should find A to be the most execrable convict of the prison camp is of interest, and I may return to this fact in the closing comments of this project. We are now halfway through the book. So far we have walked through the narrator Goryanchikov's first month or two of prison life. Part two is organized topically, beginning with a few chapters covering his experience in the prison hospital. We will turn there next. End of comments.